Uh, good morning. The Committee of the Whole of December 28, 2020 is hereby called to order. A pleasant good morning uh, to the people of the Verzans and Seasons. Greetings to all. We are here at the Fitz E. Lawetz Legislative Chambers on St. Croix, where today we'll consider and receive testimony on rezoning requests, major and minor coastal zone management permits, and matters involving the University of the Virgin Islands Research and Technology Park and the Virgin Islands Port Authority. At this time, I'd like to ask my colleagues and those that will be testifying virtually to make sure that you're turning your cell phones off or put them on silent, not to interrupt uh, today's proceedings and to ask the Madam Clerk to read today's agenda into the record uh, before we go to the roll call. The 33rd legislature will convene in a committee of the whole hearing to receive testimony on the following coastal zone permits, zoning requests and conveyance of real property from the Virgin Islands Port Authority to the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Minor Coastal Zone Management Permit Number CZT-46-19 W, Windham Blue Beards Beach Club. The subject permit allows for the installation of a new seawater intake line extending 200 feet offshore into 10 feet of water. The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre Le Oriol, L. Oriol, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Mr. Marlon Hebert, Director of the Coastal Zone Management Division, Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Amy Dempsey, Designee Bioimpact. Major Coastal Zone Management Permit Number CZX-21-17W, Leica Holding Corporation. The subject permit authorizes the continued use and occupancy of the marina, which consists of a bulkhead embayment with a small finger pier and boat ramp on the western end. The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre L. Oriol, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Mr. Marlon Hebert, Director, Coastal Zone Management Division, Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Ms. Antonella Sabatini, President, Leica Holding Corporation. And Ms. Gloria Vaglio Peel, Managing Director, Leica Holding Corporation. ZAC-20-3, a request that plot number 39A, Fredericksted, St. Croix, be rezoned from residential four, medium density, to business three, business scattered. Proposed use is a barber beauty shop, law office, retail and or event rental space. The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre L. Oreo, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Ms. Leah Laplace, Territorial Planner, Division of Comprehensive and Coastal Zone Planning, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Mr. Larry E. Miller and Mistress Virginia Simmons Miller, Permittees, ZAC-20-4, a request that plot number 1AEA, Estate Diamond, Queen Quarter, St. Croix, be rezoned from R2, residential low density one and two family, to B3, business scattered. The proposed use, car wash and convenience store. The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre L. Oreo, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Ms. Leah Laplace, Territorial Planner, Division of Comprehensive and Coastal Zone Planning, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Mr. Clarence Brown, Representative. ZAJ-20-3, a request that parcel number 5O, Estate Pastory, number 5, Cruz Bakewater, St. John, be rezoned from R2, residential low density 1 and 2 family, to C, commercial. Proposed use, a warehouse building to be used for automotive, automotive mechanical repairs, equipment, material storage, and two employee housing units. 
The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre L. Oriol, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Ms. Leah Laplace, Territorial Manor, Planner, Division of Comprehensive and Coastal Zone Planning, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, and Mr. Llewellyn Sewer, Representative ZAJ-20-5, a request that parcel number 14 remain the Estate Carolina, number one Coral Bay Quarter, St. John, be rezoned from R2, residential low density, one and two family, to B2, business secondary neighborhood. The proposed use an animal care center, kennels for dogs and cats, 20 and 19 respectively, veterinarian's office, classroom for outreach and uh, for outreach trainings meetings, one bedroom employee housing unit, children's playground, and walking trail. The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre L. Oriol, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Ms. Leah Laplace, Territorial Planner, Division of Comprehensive and Coastal Zone Planning, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Ms. Jessica Palmer, Director, Animal, Animal Care Center, St. John, Inc., Mr. Michael Milne, AIA, Barefoot Design Group, LLC, request for approval for disposition of real property by the Virgin Islands Port Authority to the Department of Planning and Natural Resources, parcel numbers E, F, and 163B, sub base number six, Southside Quarter, St. Thomas. The invited testifiers are the Honorable Jean-Pierre L. Oriol, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Carlton Dow, Executive Director, Virgin Islands Port Authority, and the proposed, proposed University of the Virgin Islands Research and Technological Park Tech Village Project and Associated Land Conveyance. The invited testifier, Mr. Peter Chapman, Executive Director, UVI Research and Technology Park. There ends the reading of the agenda. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Clerk. Colleagues, we do have eight items on today's agenda, and um, today is the first day of three or three day um, sessions. Of course, we have today the Committee of the Whole. Tomorrow, we'll be doing the special session called by the Governor of the Virgin Islands, Albert Byrne uh, Jr., and then we'll be doing our regular session on December 30th. So uh, we have uh, three days of uh, sessions that will be entertaining over the next several days. Uh, Madam Clerk, at this time, please call the roll. Senator Alicia Barnes. Present. Senator Barnes, present. Senator Oakland Benta. Senator Benta, absent. Senator Marvin A. Blyden. Present. Senator Blyden, present. Senator Allison de Gazan. Senator Degazan, absent. Senator Dwayne DeGraff. Senator DeGraff, absent. Senator Novell Francis. I'm here. Senator Francis, present. Senator Donna Fred Gregory. I'm here. Senator Fred Gregory, present. Senator Kenneth Gittens. Senator Gittens, absent. Senator Stedman Hodge. Senator Hodge, absent. Senator Hodge, absent. Here. Senator Myron Jackson. Senator Myron Jackson. He's present? Uh, He's present. present. Senator Hodge is also present and in the chambers. I am also present. I can't I can't see him. Okay, Senator Hodge, okay. present. Senator Hodge, present. Senator Myron Jackson. Senator Jackson, present. Jackson, present. Senator Javon James. Present. Senator James, present. Senator Stephen Payne. Present. Senator Payne, present. Senator, Payne, Senator present. Janelle Sorrell. <laughs> Senator Sorrell. 
Senator Sarol absent. Senator Atneil Bobby Thomas. Present, please. Senator Thomas, present. Senator Kurt VLA. Senator VLA, absent. Mr. President, we have nine present and six absent. Uh, thank you very much. We Madam, have. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. At this time, any correspondence to be read into the record? Yes, we do. You may proceed with reading of the correspondence. Dated December 28th, 2020. Dear President Francis, due to a previously scheduled commitment, I am unable to attend today's Monday, December 28th, 2020 Committee of the Whole Hearing to be held in the Fritz E. Lowetz Legislative Chambers on the island of St. Croix beginning at 10 a.m. I am respectfully re requesting my absence be recorded as excused. My sincere apologies for any inconvenience my absence may have caused. Thank you for your tolerance in this matter. Sincerely, Alison Degazan, PhD, Senator of the 33rd Legislature of the Virgin Islands. Thank you very much. Any other correspondence? No. We have, we, Mr. President, we have nine present, five absent, and one excused. Oh, very well. At this time, also um, record Senator Villalea as tardy, and um, he's making his way in. He's attending a funeral um, at this time. Okay. Um, and we'll await the other members to, to join us. Uh, today is, in fact, the funeral of a classmate of mine, of ours, uh, Mr. Anthony Dawson. And um, I just want to wish uh, that his family, wish his family well uh, during this difficult time of bereavement and also that may his soul rest in eternal peace. Uh, at this time, what we'll be doing is entertaining the first two items in the agenda, which is the minor coastal zone management permit number CZT-46-19W, dash dash Winham Blue Beards Beach Club. The subject permits allow for installation of a new seawater intake line extended 200 feet offshore into 10 feet of water, and also major coastal zone permit Number CZX-21-17W, dash dash uh, Lika Holden Cooperation. The subject permit authorizes the continued use and occupancy of the marina, which consists of a bulkhead embayment with a small finger pier and boat ramp on the western end. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd just like to go uh, to recognize uh, those individuals that will be testifying on this matter, uh, Commissioner J.P. Orio, or your representative. The DPNR representative. Good day, Senate President. Good day, Senate President of the President Junior, other members of the legislature, Mr. Sanders. Staff, members of the viewing and listening public. My name is Greg Richards, and I am the Assistant Director of the Division of Coastal Zone Management, Environment, Planning, and Natural Resources. Mr. Richards, you, you, you break it up. Are you breaking up? Can you get a little bit closer to your device? Sure. And you're representing the Commissioner? Would you like me to start that over? Uh, no, we're just acknowledging who's representing the commissioner. You're representing him on the coastal zone? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hart Marlon Hibbert? He is in transit. He's um, traveling. Okay. Uh, Miss Amy, uh, Amy Dempsey? Miss Amy Dempsey? Yes, good morning. I hope everyone's having a, a good post holiday Monday. All right, good morning, Ms. Demsey. And also, um, Antonella Sabatini. Hello, good morning, and uh, happy holidays. I'm here. Very well. And Ms. Gloria Vagilio Peel. 
Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invite, and we're pleased to be here this morning. Very well. Thank you. So those, those are the two um, matters that we'll be handling this particular block. At this time, we'll go to uh, DPNR for their testimony and these two items, and then we'll hear from the other um, testifiers. Mr. Richards. Good day, Senate President Nova Lee Francis Jr., other members of the 33rd Legislature of the U.S. Virgin Islands, legislative staff, and members of the viewing and listening public. My name is Gregory Richards, and I am the Assistant Director of Division of Coastal Zone Management in the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Today, I'm also joined by two team members, our legal counsel, Vanetta Norman, and major permit coordinator, Anita Nibbs. Today, we are present and seeking ratification of the following CZM permits. Major CZM permit number CZX-21-17W, issued to Leica Holding Corporation, allows for the continued use and occupancy of the marina, which consists of a bulkhead embayment with a small finger pier and boat ramp on the western end. There are two piers which extend from the northern mangroves. The most western pier is 671 square feet and L-shaped, while the eastern pier is 674 square feet and dog leg. There is also a ruin of a pier which extends off the south bulkhead to the east, whose piles extend 189.7 feet offshore. A rental fee of $5,515 for the first three years, with an increase beginning in the fourth year, has been negotiated with the permittee for the structures and water area covered under this, per under this permit occupying the submerged lands area has been charged pursuant to the provisions of Title 12 Virgin Islands Rules and Regs, subsection 910-5E. It is noted that the term of the, of the permit is for 20 years. Minor Coastal Zone, coastal zone Management Permit number CZT-4619W is issued to Winham Blue Bears Beach Club, allows for the installation of a new seawater intake line extending 200 feet offshore into 10 feet of water. The activity will, will occur at will occur on the south shore of St. Thomas Sea with a parcel 100 remainder, remainder estate, Frenchman's Bay, St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. An annual rental fee of $5,934 per year with increases beginning in the sixth year of the permit term has been negotiated with the permittee for the occupancy of the submerged lands covered under this permit has been charged pursuant to to the provisions of Title 12, Virgin Islands Rules and Regulations, subsection 910-5E. It is noted that the term of this permit is for 20 years. The committees of the Virgin Islands Coastal Zone Management Commission and the Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Natural Resources, respectively, have deemed the permits listed above, listed above meet the goals and policies of the VI Code Title 12, Chapter 12, and, in the, and the permits have been approved by the Governor of the Virgin Islands. Therefore, we respectfully request your ratification of, the, of these permits pursuant to Title 12, Virgin Islands Code, subsection 911E. Here ends my testimony, Senate President. Uh, thank you very much. Assistant Director Richards, at this time we'll go to uh, Ms. Amy Demsey uh, to speak to the Minor Coastal Zone Management Permit. Ms. Demsey, you have um, you have testimony? Uh, yes, sir. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Dempsey. I am president of BioImpact, and I am representing Wyndham Blueberry Speech this morning. And we are pleased to be here for the ratification Ma uh, one, one, one second, Ms. Demsey. The, do you have a prepared testimony? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Very well. I, you, may I, you may proceed. Um, and we are pleased to be here to, for the ratification and approval of the submerged land lease for the uh, reverse osmosis intake line. We were able to 
um, locate the line for it had no impact on any environmental resources. It is 100% in sand, and this intake line will be used for the production of potable water for the resort. And we respectfully re request your approval of this permit. Thank you very much. That ends my testimony. Very well, thank you. And this analysis was done when? We began the surveys for this um, about a year ago, and then uh, we also have resurveyed the line within the last uh, two months. We have gone back out to make sure that everything is clear. This was done immediately after the um, hurricanes of 2017 was when we started the work on this. Thank you. And um, if we could go to uh, Ms. Antonella Sabatini. Uh, hello, uh, yes, my name is Antonella Sabatini and I'm the president of Leica Holding Corporation. And the um, philosophy and the aim of our company has been since the beginning, since the, since the early 1980s as a um, project of preserving the environment and to put emphasis on environmental concerns and, and preservation of history and culture and education. So um, we've been noticing um, that uh, over the years, uh, especially after the hurricanes, a, a very good um, grow back of, of the different um, green areas, mangroves, and, uh, and all the uh, you know environmental uh, protected uh, species. They've been really growing very well in our property. Thank you. Oh, very well. And um, the managing director, uh, Ms. Vigilio Peel. Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Francis. Um, regarding our um, re-permitting of the property, uh, I just want to emphasize the way um, Amy Dempsey did from BioImpact in her report, that there's to be no additional expansion, no building. The existing infrastructure will continue to be upgraded and updated. Uh, through the use of better materials that are becoming more and more environmentally um, safe. Uh, as mentioned by both uh, Ms. Sabatini and Amy, uh, the challenges have been weather, hurricanes, uh, even the arrival of sargassum grass, where we've managed to do our cleaning. We were not impacted as much as the, um, the southeast shore of the island. And of course, this past year, the pandemic which has had its toll on all of us. And hence, we're very um, aware of the new way of meeting and we appreciate the legislature going forward with this virtual meeting. I guess I need to emphasize that there's going to be no change as far as the wetlands at Salt River Marina, no change with the re-permitting re as far as any visual uh, impact in the community, the immediate community. And the land and water use, as Ms. Sabatini said, will continue to be protected. This is a particular interest of mine. Um, we know that, as Amy pointed out in her report, there are seven protected coral species in the Virgin Islands. None of those are inside the Salt River Marina. But that doesn't mean that we don't keep an eye on the bay and the area outside. And I think it illustrates that teamwork has been remarkably um, helpful and important. I can't thank Coastal Zone Management enough and all the people there who have assisted and who have pointed us in the right direction with fish and wildlife, uh, protection of the various species, the mangroves and such. And we will continue that focus uh, most definitely uh, as this uh, with the re-permitting of Salt River Marina for the next 20 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Bajilio Peel, and at this time, um, Mr. Direct, Assistant Director Richards, do you have any um, depictions, any pictures, or anything that you could show of the area? Mm, unfortunately not, sir. No, I do not. Um, I 
actually what I would I would make that request of Amy Dempsey. She may. Ms. Dempsey, any photographs, a uh, depiction of the area that we're uh, considering? Yes, sir, I have that. Just give me one moment. Uh, let's take a two minutes recess while we get those um, photos up uh, so my colleagues and I could take a look at those. We'll stand in recess for two minutes.
Uh, we're out of recess. Uh, okay. Before we went to recess, we did ask uh, Ms. Amy Dempsey uh, if she had some pictorial view of the location. I'm seeing it up there. Um, Ms. Dempsey, if you could just explain oh, what we're looking at here. I'm, I'm sorry, I was having some technical difficulties. Let me see if I can get it to come back up. I'm, I'm not the most familiar person with, with Teams. Where is it? Open share tray. And change to application window. Application window. And it doesn't show anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, what we're looking at here is the is actually the survey map for you can see the area sure. in question in question. It wasn't true. Let me rotate this on the table left. And can you can everyone see this okay? Yes, thank yes. you, Amy. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this this is the survey map that's showing the area and what we're looking at in question. And this is in Salt River um, Marina. And just to, this is to give you an overview, and we are looking at the sections that are the submerged land section, which, which are shown in the shaded area. And, and so as you can it. see, there's the bulkhead, and and what you see in this area, these are the mangroves. That's very important. And, <laughs> okay, and then I'd like to show also, if I can I share another another picture here for you can that's see this is a nice I, way to that's what i'm going to do that's what i would love to, to look at this and yeah, so you could just wait them of, of that if i could ask, uh, ask those individuals that's again, not you could say testifying you at this time if you could just place a device and on this mute. is from google earth where you can get an idea <laughs> of where it is in salt river it gives you a little bit bigger picture and you can see I, I'm I, I, no, the I marina know, coming around so, and then so the, the mangroves I'm, 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 and the docks in question so. are the area extends offshore. This dock was damaged by, by his, you know, it, there's a finger pier coming off. But this shows you the area on St. Croix. And I can zoom out a little bit for you can see the location within Salt River. Very well, thank you. And is there any photos available for the um, the location over at the Wyndham Bluebeards Beach? Uh, yes, club? there is. Just give me a second. I have those up as well. Give me one moment, and I'll, I should have those up. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to those individuals that's not testifying at any given time, if you could just have your device remain on mute. Uh, because of course you're bleeding in um you know once the testifiers start testifying so please place your device on mute um if you're not testifying
while we wait for the photos to be brought up on the screen, I just want to um, advise those individuals that may have just tuned in that in fact the legislature is in session today for a committee of the whole. Uh, today is December 28th and of course at this block we're entertaining two uh, permits, a minor coastal zone uh, permit number CZT 46-19W and major coastal zone management permit CZX 21-17W. I see some photos up so um, if you could just explain. Ms. Dempsey? Or if DPNR could assist, feel free. Hi, Amy, you're muted. I have not figured out how to unmute myself and while I'm sharing. So just give me a second. Now I should be back into, here we go. Okay, The what we're looking at here um, is the RO line that will, will extend from below the, if there's the restaurant building that's there, it will extend across an area of uncolonized cobble that are loose cobbles and move around um, during storms. So they're not considered critical habitat. And then it extends out through sand, uncolonized sand. It has, um, saddle clamps that hold it into the sand, that way it won't move. And then it has a low velocity intake um, at the end where it will take in the water for the RO plant. And this is a, a low velocity impact for it, uh, intake for it does not impact um, small fish or, or larvae. And so it will have minimal impact. And then this um, will take in the water, which they will then um, make potable water for, for the resort. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Dempsey, for that presentation. Uh, before I open up the floor for a round of questions, um, which will be four minutes for my colleagues, I wanted to ask you, Assistant Director Richards, in respect to the the costs for the permits that you mentioned on the record, is that industry standard, or what was used to determine exactly what the fees or, or costs will be for the use of that um, that locations? Thank you, Senate President. Uh, the basis of the negotiation you have before you, particularly for the Winham Blue Bay Beach Club, is based on, it is industry standard. Um, it's based on the provision of, of Title 12 of subsection 910 and 911. Um, it's also based on the extraction of minerals, which is what is considered extracting minerals is, is pulling in seawater. Very well, thank you very much at this time. Uh, we'll open up the floor for questions uh, from my colleagues and we have a four minute round. Senator Fred Gregory, you're recognized for your four minutes. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning to the testifiers and good morning to the people of the United States Virgin Islands and happy holidays. Um, I believe that the two um, minor coastal zone permits that's before us, one is minor, one is major, are pretty straightforward. But I have a few questions. I'm going to start with the Winham Blue Bears Beach Club in um, Frenchman's Bay. That's my um, neighborhood, so I'm very interested in finding out um, a few things here. Um, what is your, what do you currently use? What is your current water supply? And that's for um, the Windham. Well, this is Amy Dempsey. Um, currently, they've been buying water. Um, they've been buying trucked water. Okay, so for the, how many, how long has that uh, resort or facility been there? Over 40 years? So they've been buying truck water for 40 years. 
No, no, ma'am. Um, no? They previously they previously had a reverse osmosis plant, okay. and they have slightly we we changed the location of the intake a little bit. We extended the intake out farther, and so previously they used a reverse osmosis plant. Okay. It was damaged during the storm, and they upgraded to a newer type of plant because what's happened now is that. Uh, they found that if they build a less efficient plant, that it actually um, it produces the, the reject water, which is what you call the brine that's left over after you extract the fresh water, actually can come out at a lower salinity, um, and it's better for the environment. So they have one of the new state-of-the-art plants, and okay, that's so, what so they let will me be ask using. You, the Amy, plant itself. Let me ask you, Amy. Um, so I know that the... The um, project was changed due to the high velocity intake issue that you mentioned earlier, which could negatively impact the small fish, et cetera, in the area. So how are you sure that the effect of this particular project will not be the same for the location you're seeking approval for? Um, it will actually be less because we're using, in, in the past, they did not have what it's called. It's wedge wire is who makes these screens, and they have an intake of less than 0.5 uh, foot per second. And uh, it's I, I'm very familiar with these intakes. They actually have one at Frenchman's Reef, and I can swim right all around it, and I can touch it. And you see, you know, and your hand doesn't get sucked against it. And also you'll see like little fish and stuff are actually, you know, you know, swimming all around it and not getting sucked into it. So using this type of intake is far superior and it's what we're putting into all the new intakes that are coming in so, or so as people have to about, replace intakes. Let's talk about um, the mitigation. Uh, will the project ensure that the barriers are in place to, in, to ensure that the water quality standards will not be violated? Yes, ma'am. How? They will be, um, it will be monitored during the intake, and this is gonna be a very, very low potential um, turbidity because the only M think things that are done that could even stir up the bottom are the, M the, the, the placement of the screw anchors and the screw anchors are placed by divers and the turbidity you have are basically from diver fins kicking up the bottom. And so it's very, very um, low impact. <laughs> I have one more question, Mr. Chair, if, if you would allow me. Thank you, um, Ms. Dempsey. Uh, this question that I have is for Leica Holding Corporation. I just have one question. Um, did you uh, seek? Did you recently have an update on the uh, updated environmental assessment done? This is for Ms. Peel, for Julia Peel. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Senator. This is Gloria Peel. Um, we have worked with Amy and we have worked with other agencies in keeping an eye on the surrounding environment. Most recently, we did um, go for some special permitting for the mangroves. Um, having been a long, long term, many decades residents of St. Croix, we know the importance of the mangroves and we don't want uh, any continued... Um, I'm not sure if you answered my question, though. I'm, I'm just asking yes. if you recently had an in updated environmental assessment done in the area. That's the question. Uh, to my knowledge, no. I'm not quite recent, not not since the hurricane. Why? But the why, why is not a consideration for such a um, major coastal zone management permit? I guess I have to ask DPNR that question. Why is that not a requirement? Assistant uh, Director Richards, you may respond to the Senator's inquiry. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? The question is why I asked um, Ms. Peel if there was a recent updated environmental assessment done, and the answer was no. So I'm asking DPNR, since this is a major coastal zone management permit, 
why isn't that a requirement for such a uh, major permitting uh, consideration? Excuse me, is this in addition to the bio-impact study that was done, which covered everything? Would that be in addition well, to that Well, that's the question. Study? The environmental assessment report is part of the bio-impact, correct? Yeah, I no? I think Ms. Demsey was trying not to... Please recognize Ms. Demsey. Um, oh. If I may. Go ahead, Assistant Director Rachel. I'm sorry, Ms. Demsey will come back to you. Yes, the environmental assessment report was done in 2016, which was approximately with the same time as the initial um, application. So that's before the, the storm. The application got stalled due to the hurricane, the, the events. So that's before the hurricanes? Yes. So DPNR didn't um, don't believe that it's a priority to have it done since the storms um, passed through the territory? Well, there were assessments um, since the hurricane done in that area. Nothing by bio-impact, but by, by DPNR itself. Um, and there are no major changes, no, no, nothing different from what is, is stated in the environmental assessment report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the leeway. You. Very welcome, Senator Fred Gregory. Uh, next, we'll go to Senator Thomas. You're recognized for your four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Caesar's greetings and happy Kwanzaa to all. I believe today we are observing Ujima, which is collective work, and that is something that we have been doing for the past two years. And the last three days are upon us, hopefully. Um, good morning to the professionals testifying before us here today. And my questions I am going to direct basically to bioimpact. And we're first going to discuss the intake, the water intake that uh, is being discussed. Now, you say it's about 200 feet out. Is it 10 feet in depth? Uh, Amy Dempsey, Bioimpact, it terminates in 10 foot of depth of water because we wanted to allow adequate um, uh, height over the intake because the intake itself sticks up about two foot off the bottom. I was looking at the, the aerial image that was displayed and that was some crystal clear water, 10 feet of depth. Um, this is an area where visitors to the resort will frequent as swimmers and snorkelers, et cetera, correct? That is correct. And actually, people will swim out into this area and look at it because what you have is anytime you put a structure out in the water, it accumulates, you know, fish and things like to come swim around it. So it'll be um, a nice area for people to come out and they'll see some fish. Most of the people who snorkel at Bluebeards go to the rocky headlines that are on either side because that that's where they can see coral. And that's where most people snorkel. But it is very possible people could swim out in this area. And that's another reason we put it at 10 foot of depth. That way, you know, nobody would actually accidentally kick it or anything swimming by. And as I said, it's a super low velocity intake. And, um, you know, Frenchman's Reef has one in and you can go up and, you know, touch it and it doesn't you know, there's no way you could get caught or hurt on it because it's such a low velocity intake. And that was my concern. Um, even though it's low velocity intake, even though, you know, you, you may think it's in, a, in an area where uh, it's not going to cause any danger to swimmers or snorkelers, divers, etc. Will any signage be placed around? And I, I, I know it sounds weird, but um, trust me, it's, I don't can't recall being in ten foot of water at all. So I'm just asking if any signage will be placed, just as an extra level of caution. Actually, sir, absolutely, because there will be a signage placed on the shore. Because what happens um, is that oftentimes, as you know, boats come around, and the last thing you want to happen is have a boat come and anchor on it and damage it so that there there will be signage on the shoreline that says that there is a um, seawater intake. One minute. Great, because 
it's it's all about uh, preventative measures to you know so the facility wouldn't have to incur costs if it gets damaged. And we could go quickly to uh, Leica Holdings because um, the, the peer that's being requested, uh, the I don't know if uh, a resumption of operation or whatever the term may be. What is the capacity of this facility right now as far as uh, what's allowed to dock up to it? Gloria, please. Morning. Time. Yes, good morning, uh, Senator Gregory. Uh, Gloria Valio Pio. Um, right now, we have approximately we uh, about 30 vessels that can come in of various sizes. We're extremely careful on the size of the vessel. Once again, to pass the channel with the mangroves, uh, the depth, the beam of the boat, that type of thing. Uh, there are a variety of boats. Some are sailboats uh, with motor. Some are sailboats without motor. And then we have some small uh, power boats. I'd also like to state that we do have a few guest slips that we reserve for government, both local and national. Um, this leads me to your statement, Senator Gregory, about collective work and um, the teams, and they're not just local, but National Fish and Wildlife has brought a special group in for water analysis and testing. They come and go quite freely. And I'm very recently pleased to announce that NOAA is installing tide um, gauges, uh, five points on St. Croix. One of those points will be in the St. Croix Marina, and they will be in and out with a small um, government vessel uh, to monitor that. That's a five-month program which kind of suits the, um, as, as uh, Mr. Richards mentioned, there are so many different agencies that keep coming in to assess, assess, assess locally, and then we have the national input from them. So I steered away from your original question about 30 vessels uh, that are inside the marina, uh, and then the visiting vessels that are primarily small government vessels. All right, thank you very much for that answer, uh, Director Peel and Ms. Dempsey. And uh, just to let uh, Director Peel know, though um, we are all good-looking people, I am not as good-looking as Senator Fred Gregory. This is Senator Thomas, just so, just so you know. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you very thank much, you. Senator Thomas. Uh, Senator DeGraff, you recognize for your four minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Season's greetings to one and all. Good morning to the viewing and listening audience. Good morning. Uh, I, I basically was wondering, in regards to the minor coastal zone, where the, uh, the pipe is out 10 feet of water, what would be the suction pressure for the intake? Um, Amy Dempsey, BioMPAC. The suction pressure is 0 0.5 Per, per second. So literally you can go put your hand on it and you don't really feel anything sucking in. It's very low velocity. It was designed to meet the, la the latest request of National Marine Fisheries. Okay, and, and, and at, at different times would the pressure uh, have to be adjusted or what would be the max to um, for the system? What would be the max for the pressure to be adjusted? Yeah. It, it can't be adjusted. It's just 0 0.5 foot okay. per second. You can't make it draw more or less. That's how the actual intake is designed. It's not, um, it's not adjustable. Okay, great, great. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to make sure on that. Uh, and in regards to the uh, Leica Holding Corporation, you said they had the, vi the environmental assessment done in 2016 prior to the hurricanes, and uh, what has changed uh, environmentally in the area that, that, that uh, if, if any, anything since, what has changed? Um, I'd like to address that. Um, Amy Dempsey, BioImpact. Uh, I did the assessment originally in 2016 uh, when the original renewal was done, and 
We do go into that area on a quarterly basis as part of a water sampling program. And so we've been in and out of there, you know, as recent as December. And there ha other than there being damage to the mangroves due to the hurricanes, which they have been recovering, um, there have been no um, alterations. They haven't done any construction on the on the facility or anything. And environmentally, the the everything is pretty much the same. It's the big difference is the hurricanes were the, did damage a lot of the mangroves along the shoreline, not so much in the heart of the marina, but those are recovering really well. Those that were damaged are doing really well, and we've got a lot of new mangrove growth in that area. Uh, thank you. And finally, the DPNR, uh, what or uh, when will the next environmental impact be scheduled to be done in that area? The only, the only assessment that I've uh, done um, afterward, there's no follow-up to environmental assessment report um, inspection. But DEP, Environmental Protection, they do quarterly sampling, which also consists of an assessment in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Graff. Uh, next, we'll go to Senator Haji, recognized for your four minutes. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to the viewing audience. Yeah, also, also the testifiers. Um, happy New Year. Happy holidays to, well, not year, happy holidays to everyone. Um, I only have one question as it relates to the um, material that's being used for the piping um, or for the system. How long would that material actually last um, under the water in terms of overall deterioration and would it impact the environment in any way? Um, this is a flexible P PVC type material and it's dark in color and it is, it's rated for 30 or more years. And that's good. This is what and everyone's any type using of, um, now. Would any type of um, corals, urchins, et cetera, um, attached to it? Absolutely. Anything you put out there that you get out in the water, something comes and tries to live on it. Okay, thank you. I really don't have anything else. Um, I'm glad that you've done your due diligence in terms of um, doing research on the environment and having those um, stakeholders in place. I know we do have our challenges um, and maybe um, we should consider always revisiting or um, doing an, an additional assessment based on the number of time when initial permits may be granted. Um, but we know that comes at a cost. So those are things to consider. But thank you for the time um, to the testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. And before we go on to the next um, senator, I just wanted to ask, how, how are we handling or processing public access uh, to these locations? And um, I can answer on um, Bluebeards. There is a designated public beach access and there are designated parking places. And it's also because there is the public restaurant there. Um, it's, you know, the public is definitely welcome. And at the other location? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, at LICA, this is Gloria Peel again, um, we are also open to the public, similar to what Amy said about the uh, St. Thomas property. We do have a restaurant. We have uh, facilities there. Um, we have some kayak companies that welcome their tours and visitors. And this is where, as Ms. Sabatini said earlier, we blend the educational with the historical and the cultural as they do their, um, their kayak tours in and out of the marina. So we welcome residents, we welcome visitors, and um, we are open. And of course, these are reasonable access. There's no real difficulty in b individuals being able to access these locations, correct? That is correct. It's, uh, we, we have a gate uh, that is open uh, all day long until 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and so it's very easy access coming in and leaving the property. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that. At this time, Senator Payne, you're recognized for your four minutes. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues, testifiers, listening and viewing audience. Blessed season greetings to all. Um, I'm not going to be too long this morning. Uh, let me start off with the direct appeal. Uh, the marina that you, um, did this marina provide how many slips? Uh, good Pino. morning. We, yes, we have approximately uh, 30 slips, not all of which are currently occupied. Okay, and has this changed over, uh, has this number changed over the years? Uh, no, it has not, uh, unless so we have less occupancy, um, because we do want more safety for our regular tenants, particularly during the hurricane season. So uh, unlike previous years where perhaps there were a few additional boats in, we try to keep the boat, we do keep the boats at minimal. So there's plenty of safe uh, area, safe anchorage during hurricane. Okay, uh, and what size vessels can you move in to support? Uh, we don't support anything longer than about 40 feet. Uh, and the draw on that is also important. Um, over time, obviously the, um, the basin there has become a little bit more shallow. So we do our own measurements there just to make sure that there's safety going in and out. We, we do have, we have had some uh, help uh, and information, not only from our local agencies, but from the Coast Guard, uh, who periodically since Maria and Irma have come in and have been extremely helpful with focus on the bay. We are not in charge of the bay, but certainly we keep an eye on that, and, uh, and the vessels anchored in the bay also abide by very good and strict rules from uh, DPNR. Okay, thank you for that. And, um, and from a business standpoint, uh, in what ways does um, marinas actually boost the economy? Okay, um, the economy. Well, as I said, we do have some tenants there. The tenants include the kayak uh, companies, that not only give tours, but they give lectures and such on the bioluminescent bay, uh, the environment, the culture, bringing in school groups, as well as um, other tourists and guests and house guests of residents uh, to the uh, marina. I, uh, we have a restaurant uh, that, of course, serves um, everyone on St. Croix if they wish to come. And I think that's the main, uh, main activity. Also, just walking paths, coming to a marina. There's something about Salt River Marina that's, it's not just a marina, it's like a stepping back in time uh, and just the ambience around you, the, the mangroves, the, the trees, the palms. We've invested a lot of money and uh, time and energy in uh, caring for the palm trees. So therefore, the more you care for something, the less loss you have during a storm. So uh, I think the attraction is just coming and, and seeing a piece of history, a piece of St. Croix, a piece of nature uh, that transports you to a very a very calm and, and inviting place. It sounds a little sentimental, but that's the way we feel about it. Thank you very much for your answers, Director Peel. And um, Ms. Dempsey, um, the primary byproduct of diesel is brine, which facilitates pump back out to the sea. This material sinks to the seafloor and wreaks havoc on ecosystems, creating oxygen levels and seriously spiking salt content. Um, isn't this going to negatively impact our aquatic ecosystem in that area? Uh, sir, what we have gone to, to use is, like I said, is a system that the discharge brine is 54 parts per thousand, which seawater is about 36 parts per thousand. It used to be that most ROs discharged about 76 to as much as 80% as brine. And so what has happened is we have gone to a lower salinity discharge. They are dumping it off of one of the rocky cliffs around the, around the point, and it's an area that is always impacted by wave action. So what will happen here is it, it will be discharged onto the surface where there's a lot of wave action. So it will be a very quick mixing and it should have 
no impact. And we also selected the, the best place for the discharge where there was minimal and where there were, there were no corals. There was just some algae in the area. And so the, based on the mixing zone, by the time it gets anywhere near where there's a coral, it's going to basically be diffused. So it is very important when you locate uh, brine discharges that you put them in an area where you have um, minimal corals. And it's really the best idea to discharge them where they discharge on the surface. That way, as you said, brine is heavier, so it tends to sink. But if you discharge it in an area where there's wave turbulence and it's on the surface, as you can imagine, as it sinks, as it gets mixed by the waves, it dilutes very quickly. And so that's what we selected in this location. Okay, now was there um, a small... Um, Okay, Mr. Perez, can I just follow, please? Yeah, you may conclude. Okay, okay so was there a small study conducted um, in the area to determine if um, the natural waves uh, in that area, is it going to impact the coral and the, the mangrove? But I mean, like, well, what guarantee is there that, 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 the, that the, the salt content, the excess salt content will be actually washed out to sea and not taken into yes. shore? Yes, sir. Thank Actually, you for that time, we Mr. Did, there we did. Yeah, we did um, flushing. Uh, basically, it's a mixing study, and there, like I said, there are no corals in the immediate area, and it will be. It 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 does not go out to sea, so to speak. It basically. Um, gets mixed up and, and diluted. It actually, the mixing zone in, uh, based on um, the, 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 the analysis is less than 20 feet and before it's back to ambient salinities. And due to that issue, it the, the nearest coral to the discharge was about 50 feet away. So it will not have any impact on those and there are no mangroves in this area. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for your answer. Thank you for the time, Mr. President. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Payne. Senator James, you recognize for your four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Good morning, testifiers, and happy holidays once again to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. For the Minor Coastal Zone Management Permit, CZT 4619W. Um, it was made mention that in the event of a major storm approaching, the permittee must remove the pipe to prevent breakage and becoming marine debris. So my question to DPNR, as far as enforcement and when we, if we are faced with these kind of issues, how does the department follow up with these kind of activities and make sure that it's in place? Well, actually, the department goes out and does their assessment um, post hurricane, post disaster. Um, as far as making sure that they do what they're supposed to do it and in removing such a pipeline, um, that's really it's on the entity to make sure that that is done, and it's, it's their property and their, their you know their expense, and it's something that they would want to protect themselves. Thank you, and um. My question is as far as manpower, when we do, are faced with like tropical storms and hurricanes and what have you, besides just this entity, do we always do these assessment? Is it? Oh yes, yes uh, we do, Senator. Okay, thank you. And it's made mention that it's a rental fee per year and it shall be charged for the intake ext extraction, seawater and submerged land area covered under this permit. Can you speak to what this fee goes towards and what's, what's beneficial to the department with this fee? How is it utilized? Well, this, the fees, um, like any other fee that we collect, the most fees that we collect within the department, they go to the reclamation fund. Thank you. And with the fee, because I was reading um, the, the, the document, and you say it's a regular fee, I understand that. But how do you come up with this fee? How is it brought into the equation as far as how you come up with this number? Is it all across the board? Is it based on a rate? We have different, sorry. We have different factors that we consider when we're doing the, the fees and based on what the application is. Maybe done on the, the value of the upland property, the linear fee of the product, 
of the of the item, um, the submerged land that it occupies, and again for the for the extraction of minerals. So those are four different factors, and also gross receipts in, in, in certain cases, the gross receipts, the gross receipt product of the entity. So in this case, it was done based on submerged land, linear feet, and extraction. Okay, thank you. And as far as the installation of this intake line, I'm not an engineer or subject matter expert, but what are some worst case scenarios that can go wrong with a, a project like this? Um, with this one, this is a very low impact project. Um, it's even less impact of installing more. It's a small sand screw that we uh, install. And again, like by in fact, like Amy Dempsey said, the most disturbance you would have is, is actually at the time that the installation is taking place by the divers and their pits. Okay, thank you so much. And for DPNR, for the major coastal zone permit that we have before us, it basically, speak, basically speaks to the continued use and occupancy of the marina. Or I should ask the, the, the owners, um, what plans they have in place to improve the property moving forward and to make this Time. place uh, more marketable and attractive as far as for locals and tourists? Um, please, Gloria. Thank you, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I had mentioned that we do have um, the uh, kayak tours uh, on the property. We have uh, Cane Bay diving on the property. We have a restaurant on the property and we have the environment. And I think what we all need to remember that we are in a national park area. So we try to emphasize that in bringing in small groups, children uh, at different times, just to learn about the marina, the boats, but also the surrounding environment. Uh, does this put a lot of money in the community at large? Perhaps not, but it does serve as education as we start to um, bring the next generation into, into active positions in our, in our local community here. So I think that um, as far as plans to improve, there's no expansion, but improvements will take place as far as um, the infrastructure that is already there. We have a number of open area uh, areas under roof where we can have more community events, lectures, um, slideshows, whatever we do. And we have brought in a number of environmental groups, particularly when it comes to turtles, mangroves. Uh, and now I'm proposing to NOAA that we do something with the, the, the tide um, uh, kind of project that's starting uh, this next week as they measure tides and collect their data. This is all with a brand new technology. So I think that's the interest of bringing community in, letting them know what we're doing, and I'll have to do a part by maybe releasing some press releases or doing this through uh, Mr. Richards at DPNR, Coastal Zone. I think all of that is a service to the community. So um, I think that uh, by continuing to monitor, um, and Mr. Richards uh, referred to the water analysis that's done both by the local agencies and now we have the national agencies coming in. Uh, also, the Coast Guard, we are waiting on them to deem this a nav navigable channel. And once we receive that, um, that, um, that uh, con confirmation from the Coast Guard, then buoys will be placed in the channel and it will become just a, a safer, wonderful entrance to a, um, a special landmark um, national park on St. Croix. Thank you for the answer. I've never been to this location, so I do look forward to visiting that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator James. Um, Madam Clerk, please recognize the presence of Senator Benter and Senator VLA here as well. Um, at this time, Senator Blyden, is he there? 
No? Okay. Um, Senator Barnes, you recognize for your four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to the listener, view, and audience. Good morning, colleagues and staff. Um, and good morning to the testifiers. I would like to focus my line of questions um, regarding the major CZM permit for um, the Salt River Bay properties. Um, that area is definitely one of significant ecological concern and sensitivity, cultural um, relevance, historical relevance, and sensitivity as well. So my first question goes to DPNR as it relates to the fee basis for calculating the 20-year lease. Did you take into consideration um, the cultural sensitivity, the historical and relevance of the area in terms of the fee basis? Um, good day, Assistant Director here. The, well, as we know, the environmental assessment report covers the cultural and the historic impacts. Um, into the fee basis itself, in recognition of the property losing a lot of their business, uh, again, due to the hurricane. And um, one of their major, one of the, the, the major tenants proposing to pull out. The fee basis right now is at 5,515 5, only for three years taking into consideration the blow that they took as a, as a result of Hurricane Maria. Okay, um, thank you for that. And to the representative of the corporation, in light of, as I said before, the cultural and ecological sensitivity of the area, um, have you had any discussions with the Department of Tourism in terms of marketing that particular area for tours? as one of the offerings um, of St. Croix? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Um, we have had um, tours uh, arranged through tourism uh, indirectly, because once again, we have the individual companies that conduct the, the, the uh, kayak tours or the diving and there have been contracts with cruise ship companies um, all handled through Department of Tourism. Okay, um, okay, let, let, if you can just, I don't want to interrupt you, but let me tell you my concern. My concern please. is that this particular area is of significant cultural, and I, I don't mean to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but significant cultural, ecological, and historical relevance and importance to the U.S. Virgin Islands, specifically St. Croix. So in terms of this long-term lease that you have, and I do understand that it's an economic um, enterprise for you in terms of the lease, but as a leader in this territory, my concern is that while this is not part of the territorial park system, are you under the joint management agreement between the National Park Service and the Department of Planning and Natural Resources? Um, I welcome your observations and your comments and your questions. And I, we had covered some of this in our uh, statement to the No, I'm just uh, asking, are time. you a part of, or is that particular area? Well, let me put the question to DPNR. DPNR, in, in the... Um, execution of this lease. Um, have you taken into consideration the National Park Service, the joint agreement with DPNR, and are there any requirements to ensure that there's a degree of sensitivity understanding the importance of this area? It's just, is this just being handled as a normal lease, a normal permit, not taking into consideration the sensitivity of the area? That's, that's the point I'm trying to get at. 
I agree with you. Um, the only consideration I was taking when, um, in regards to NPS, was their opinion or if they had any comment uh, uh, in accordance with their neighbors doing what they're doing, which is just a, um, a, um, they just they're continue for continued use. Okay, remember that there was legislation for a territorial park system and that there was a need for the government to acquire certain sensitive areas to be a part of this system. In the absence of that and short of that, does the department or does the tenant, excuse me, or the permittee have a vision for this area beyond the piecemeal type educational outreach or tourism marketing outreach component or would you agree that this is a sensitive area yes we do have a vision and we have covered this we included that in our application to dpnr in 2017 it was included also in a very public statement with the commission when there was a public hearing on this particular uh, re-permitting, and also in our most recent statement on December 13th, which uh, Ms. Sabatini alluded to. If you would permit me to read one section of that written statement to the Senate, it said um, the Salt uh, River Marina... Okay, uh, maybe on the chairman's uh, time, please. And I don't want to... Uh, on the chairman's time, please, if you would allow, because I do have um, a follow-up question, and I want to be able to get to my questions, if I would be allowed, Mr. Chairman. Well, okay, so let me ask this question then. For the long-term vision and development that you have for the site, and taking into consideration the environmental impacts and the ecological sensitivity, do you have a limit on the amount of businesses, let's say kayak tours and the like, that you would allow in the area? And are those activities factored into the overall environmental impacts? Um, yes, we, there are specifications and limitations on tours. Uh, this is handled through DPNR. The kayak companies have their permission through DPNR and Coastal Zone. While the tour leaves from the marina, it goes into the bay, sometimes at night, sometimes during the day. And there's very careful attention to the, uh, to the environment as well as the educational format. Every tour is not just going out and rowing in a kayak. The tour is about the environment, the water, the living habitats, the mangroves. It's a very, very educational tour that has been applauded by many. This was addressed also in a piece of correspondence recently to uh, the Honorable uh, Senator Novell E. Francis, Jr. And just a word on the history and preservation of culture. As a former professor, uh, that's where my heart lies as well. And we know that this is rich in history. It goes from prehistoric to Taino to Columbus and then into the colonial periods. And we have all remnants of this uh, in that area. And this is just rich in educational material, rich in culture. And that's why this ownership is taking very special steps to emphasize this. Our focus is not just running a business in good standing with the VI government. The focus is on preservation. And that would be uh, through education of the culture and the environment in that area. And I hope that this letter of December 13th will be entered into the record along with previous statements we've made in this regard in our application and at the public hearing. Thank you. If I may conclude, Thank Mr. You. Mr. Chairman. I think you, you're you may, you uh, Excuse me? Uh, no, excuse me. Hello. Hello. One second, one Hello. second, testifier. Senator Barnes, you have the, the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to conclude, I just need to find out from DPNR, um, as you move forward with the permitting of the kayak tours and the like, what is your, um, cr your permitting criteria and procedure in that regard? As far as the kayak tours, I mean, Basically, when they, if, when they apply for an upland operation or upland setup, and that's where we were coming. Um, as far as, you know, their lease, they, they, with, with us, it doesn't matter of proven legal interest. So they would have to have a lease with the, with the landlord, which would be like that. 
And I would add, I would add the relationship that, that DPNR does have with Leica. They allow for easy access, easy entry of our, with our uh, emergency response vessels if need be at that station. Okay, okay, thank you, DPNR. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for allowing me the time. I am um, concerned um, as it relates to um, the continued occupancy of this very important area, and I do believe that some further development at a greater degree of a comprehensive approach needs to be undertaken um, for this particular um, area on St. Croix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, testifiers, for your responses. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Barnes, uh, for your comments there. At this time, um, would was it, uh, Miss? Uh, you had something else to add uh, to, to this, Miss? Uh, uh, yeah, this is Antonella Sabatini. I'm sorry for the interruption. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank all the team um, of our team for the. Uh, awesome explanations and presentations about uh, our property. And I would like just to say very quickly, we are um, scientists, so we really love the environment and you know the high level um, involvement into the environmental issues. So we always take this into consideration. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Sabatini. Senator Benta, you recognize for your four minutes at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to the listener of you and audience, as well as colleagues and to the testifiers and those uh, business venturers. I want to thank you for being here with us this morning. I will start off by saying that historical preservation over the years, as we've had meetings from time to time, somewhere along the way in those meetings, so many discussions have been had where there are a lot of historical sites within the territory. And today we have pretty much a private sector, pretty much moving on rebranding in a sense, in a different format as far as uh, our historical sites into a tourism market. Mr. Chair, I don't know if there's anyone from the historical preservation testifying here today but I'll start off with DPNR. Uh, to DPNR, the Coastal Zone Management, how long have these permits been submitted? What was the turnaround time for the permits? So this permit was applied for in May of 2017. May 2017? Yes. And Remember, we took control of the time frame after it gets a government house. So, was a government house for how long? Uh, and there's a reason behind my madness of how is the, 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 the way we're going with the line of questioning, and nothing to the coastal zone management or anyone who is on the line. But this is for my edifices as well as my colleagues. So 2017, that's a, this application was submitted. It went to Government House. Do you have a time frame on that when you went there? Give me one second. And, and while you're searching to Ms. Demsey, in the submittal of the requested applications, were there correspondences ret retroactively that pretty much highlighted any issues, any concerns, or any requirements additionally that you would have to add into the permit? Um, not on, on Salt River, there were some questions about some old surveys that had to be um, found uh, because this is a renewal and uh, it's quite, you know, that marine has been there for quite some time. And that was really um, just looking for some of the older documents was the biggest issue on related to the Salt River Marina. And were there any public uh, forums held in reference to the rebranding of the site? Uh, there was a public hearing. And can you tell us when those hearings were held? Um, I will have to look, sir. It was back in, uh, I, I don't remember if it was before, I believe it was before the hurricane. So let me, let me check on that and I can find when the public notice was. Thank you for that. And at the same time, back to uh, coastal zone management, 
and of course, Ms. Demsey, you could jump in as well. The, the site, part of the site is used for Easter camping by a lot of the locals at times. Would there be an impact on the site, but they use part of that as well too. Uh, is there going to be a, a problem for them to continue to use some of the coastal zone line for their camping? Well, sir, I think that um, that that would be on the landlord of the property. Uh, Ms. Demsey? A lot of, the, the, a lot of the, the, the beach goers or the campers are not violating any of the CJ policies which the landlord would have to enforce upon them. Uh, Ms. Demsey? Um, yes, sir. I was just going to say the hearing was in um, uh, December of 2017. Time. And, and then the, uh, there would have been an executive session approximately 30 days, which would probably have been in January um, of that year. I could not pull up the um, – I just – I looked and saw when I made my PowerPoint for the hearing. So I know that was in December. And then the, the approval would have been shortly thereafter. And uh, – and this, the, the marina itself, there's a lot of people that use the bay there, um, and then a lot of people camp out on the, the point, which is often called, called Columbus Landing. And the, the, this marina has no impact on the people that camp at uh, Columbus Landing. Thank you. My time has been called. Uh, let's see if there's a follow-up. Thanks, to Mitchie. I know, well, I, I did have the time frame to the Coastal Zone Management as far as what was the time frame between the application to now we're having a hearing before the legislature or recommendation from the coastal zone management time frame between 2017 May 2017 to when it went to government house and when it left government house to come back uh, for review. Um, if I may, Assistant Director Richards here. We do know that the decision meeting took place in January 2018. And sometime after that, the, the, the actual document was produced, and approximately maybe three months after, it may have gone to government. And if I will add also to the question about campers, there's actually no camping taking place within the marina. The the process for the application is where it was also going to as far as 2017 to 2020, 20. Do you know what might have been the issue between that time that delayed this coming before this body? Uh, well, they came in. They applied in May 2017, then the hurricane hit us in September. So that caused a delay with all our processes, um, to include, of course, Laker. Are there other hotel projects that has met the same impact? We're now there also on a hold from 2017 to now, if you know? It's quite possible. Uh, right now, I don't have the information before me. But it's, right. it's quite possible. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, listen to my colleagues as they dig in a little deeper as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Benta. Senator Barnes, you recognize for your point of inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a point of inquiry to the um, Salt River Corporation. Um, what is your process for? the leases um, that you issue to your tenants. So what, what is the procedure? I know you have a restaurant on the site as well as the kayak tours. So how are persons to um, approach you in terms of operating at those sites? So what's the process? Um, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, they have to be um, licensed appropriately in the U.S. Virgin Islands. <clears throat> we do do some reviews. I will add, though, that um, some of the companies have been in the marina for 30 years. Anchor Dive is a major um, tenant um, for three decades. Marine biologists by trade and um, tour guides and educational experts um, in their free time. 
Um, we have criteria just the way the government does. You do your interviews, you check for um, references, you look at the past, you seek public opinion. And um, normally the reputation or the goodwill of the company is what drives any final agreement. So for your rest, if I, as I conclude, Ms. For the restaurant, um, how how do you get someone to operate that restaurant? What is what is the procedure? Uh, the restaurant is um, leased to a known chef who has run another restaurant on the island, who has been at Salt River Marina now since uh, just I think it was just after the hurricane. It's uh, it's all a little bit of a blur between hurricanes and pandemics. But Flyers Restaurant has been there, uh, and they came as knowledgeable, experienced individuals. And we really, um, just like when you interview for any job, the interviewer seeks the best candidate. So it's not a first come, first served. It's not just fill, fill, fill the restaurant, get somebody there. It's really finding uh, the right person for the park area that it is. Um, thank you um, for your response. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Barnes. At this time, the committee will stand in recess for two minutes. When we come back, we'll hear from Senator VLA and Senator Jackson. Committee stands in recess for two minutes.
Uh, we're out of recess. At this time, the chair will recognize Senator Vialet. You're recognized for your four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to the people of the Virgin Islands. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning to the testifiers. Um, like a holding corporation, I know that you are trying to have continued use and occupancy of two peers, but there's one peer that um, in a presentation that is ruined, which is a salt pier, a salt bulkhead. What is the plan for that particular structure in terms of repair, or is it going to remain as an eyesore? It will not remain as an eyesore. Uh, the pier was abandoned uh, quite a number of years ago. <clears throat> I think there was perhaps a permitting problem. Right now, <clears throat> we will um, make sure that uh, permits are put into place properly. We'll use the guidance of Mr. Richards at CZM, and we will make sure that we move it forward. So I will tell you this. We had that inspected prior to the storms and after the storms. Anything loose that was around there was removed. Anything that was dangerous, any nails and such, was also removed. And uh, with the help of the Coast Guard, when they came in and told me quite... Uh, that they were very proud to remove Maria boats. We told them they weren't there just to remove Maria boats, but all hurricane boats. With their incredible equipment they brought in, they had the means to go back as far as Hugo. And did they, and, did uh, they remove all? And, did they uh, remove they, all the out boats? Out of 27, I gave them the number. There were 27 submerged boats. They removed in total 23. And it was remarkable collaboration, again, with our local agencies. The okay, remaining so, hold three up, hold or four hold up, were taken hold up, up in pieces. Hold up so, one minute, Ms. Peel, because I'm trying to get some questions. I, I know that's good yeah. information, but I'm trying to get some other questions. Were you, yeah. did you occupy the Southern Pier yes. before? I have no knowledge that it was ever occupied because it was never completed, and the owners can contradict. Okay, so let me let me ask uh, Mr. Richards a question. Mr. Richards, is there a move to uh, remove what is left of the Southern Pier, the pylons, um, or is there a move to have somebody repair it? Well, whether or not it's going to be repaired will be on the on the um, on our tenant. Um, if it remains, they will be charged for occupying submerged land. So, as a hazard, no, it should be removed. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get. This. So, Aldriva is such a beautiful area, and to have ruins of a southern pier that have just been there for a large number of years um, is an eyesore and is not aesthetically suitable to that particular site if we're trying to. Uh, move that site forward as an attraction for locals and tourists. I think we, we really need to come up with plans as to how all of these destroyed piers on the island, either we uh, repair them or we remove them. In, in reference to um, the intake pipe, is that a new intake pipe? The old intake pipe, was it the same dimensions, 200 feet out, 10 feet of water? Um, no, sir, the Amy Dempsey bioimpact. No, sir, it was not. Um, it was. It did not extend out as far. Um, due to the hurricanes, there was actually a lot of sand movement in the bay. And so, because the original surveys we did for this were actually before the hurricane, and the original design only went back out as far as the, the old one was. But how much was, how much was the old one? How far about was the old a, one? About 100 feet. It was about 100 feet. And how much feet of we water? went back out and resurveyed, there was not enough water depth, and therefore, you know, in order to make it basically safer um, for both the intake and for swimmers, uh, just Fine. because you don't want somebody out there swimming and accidentally kicking something, uh, that uh, we went ahead and we could come out with a path where we could gain um, additional length without impacting any resources. So we did that and and um, changed it to 200 feet because actually the first application that went into CZM only had it going out 100 feet. And you're saying that the intake pipe is 20, 24 feet above and 10 feet of water? Explain the dimensions to me. Is it 10 feet of water um, or is it that the pipe is elevated, right? 
Yeah, the, pi the pipe is on the, lays on the seafloor all the way out to the intake location. And at the, then at the intake, the pipes, the pipe basically, it has a riser that sticks up about a foot. And then the intake filter itself is about a foot and about, I believe it's about nine inches in diameter. Okay, so, so it the, literally looks like a filter. That's what it looks like. So what is the real depth of the water there? The depth of the water at the intake location is 10 foot. And the pipe, of course, where it lays on the seafloor goes from zero feet all the way out to 10 feet. And what? the pipe itself is, you know, small diameter, uh, four inch pipe. Okay. So it's not... Um, so 200 it's feet of water, like it's, that's pretty shallow. 200 feet out, it's still 10 feet. Yeah, it's very, it's very shallow. That you actually, at the end of the point, off the end, you're still sitting at only about 15 foot of water. It's very shallow there. Okay. Um, the old pipe is the old pipe still in use right now? No, sir. It's not. The old pipe was actually damaged even before the hurricanes and they had a, had a temporary one in for a while afterwards and all the pieces of the old pipe were removed. So the old pipe has been completely removed? Absolutely, sir. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the last question, Lyca, I think my time was in call. The last question for Lyca Holden, you said the largest clan is gone, is that true? Uh, Senator Ville, uh, Gloria Peel again. Uh, the largest client is not gone yet. Okay, the largest uh, client is in the process of moving, but they haven't started their facility yet. So they're going to be there for the first three years of your renewal of this occupancy because the largest client is supposed to move um, in the area of Golden Rock and they have Correct. not started doing anything. Uh, we did approve that project, I think, in the 30 second of this legislature, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Richards, I know that was the reason or the basis for the first three years being reduced. But in fact, the first three years, the client will be there. Client will be there, but... Um, that way, sir. But obviously, with this pandemic, Anyone who's related to uh, building pleasure boats uh, for various resorts, such as they've done for St. Thomas, St. John, and other parts of the world, uh, have lost many contracts. And they might be there, but they also might be closed. I don't think you can say that. Um, that is such a wonderful operation. They have orders three and four years out. Not waiting for an order to come. They have orders three and four years out. And everyone in the industry know that there's going to be a time period when the pandemic is over and everything will resume to normal and it's gonna be the same activity. I think that, um, I mean, it is what it is because DPNR have already negotiated that particular amount, but I just wanna put on that it's not going to be because of the absence of a large client. The large client is there and I don't think that you have given the large client any reduction in lease or rental fees. Thank you so much. Oh, thank Chair. you. Thank you very much, Senator VLA. Uh, before we move on to Senator Jackson, I wanted to ask DPNR whether or not it is your testimony that uh, both of these uh, current leases, that they're actually uh, current and um, in good standing? Yes, they are, sir. In terms of the fees and payments? Yes, they are, sir. Very well, thank you. Um, at this time, Senator Jackson, you're recognized for your four minutes. Senator President, the majority leader is here, so please let him go ahead. Very well. Senator Blyden, you're recognized for your four minutes. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Good morning. To my colleagues, viewing and listening audience, and good morning, testifiers, and thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Richards, good morning. Let me ask you, um, when it comes to zoning requests, CZT-46-19W um, for Wendon Bay Blue Bears Beach Club, the 200 feet pipe, right, that extends seaward. Uh, the 10 feet of water that 
um, is spoken about that this pipe goes at 200 feet forward. Uh, are there any impact to the environment in that area, and what type of um, what type of area is it in terms of the the, the wave, etc., with the water? Is it still water? How how does that work? Can you explain that to me, please? Yes. Um. Good, good morning. Uh, Amy Dempsey, Bio Impact. Mr. Richards. The 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 pipe extends out to 200 feet. It goes over an area of uncolonized cobble and then into an area of sand. And there, it, there are no environmental resources in the footprint. And that area is well protected by the reef offshore. Mr. Richards, are you um, in, in agreement was, with that? Sir, I was actually going to refer that question to Amy Dempsey before she answered the question. Please. Please. I did not hear you, sir. I said, I was actually going to refer your question to Amy Dancy, but she, she beat me to it. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, let me go to um, the major coastal zone management permit, CZX-21-17-W um, for the marina. And it's a continued use and occupancy of the marina. Um, the small finger pier and boat ramp on the western end. What what exactly what what uh, difference um, in terms of the footprint is is um, being requested? I know it's just a, um, a continuation, but are there any improvements that's going to be done at the pier? At this time, the only repairs that have been done were hurricane repairs. There's no extension of any footprint whatsoever. Okay, very well. Well, Mr. President, um, thank you so much for the time. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Blyden. Senator Jackson, you're recognized for your four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, first of all, I'd like to wish the people of the territory uh, a blessed season. And also, uh, Abarigani, which is the third principle of the day, or Kwanzaa, which is collective work and responsibility. And that is what we are doing here. And we can learn from the principles of Kwanzaa. Uh, to the testifiers, good morning and uh, season's greetings to you. And I would like to start with the application for Salt River. Uh, and I, first of all, would like to commend you because unlike the Virgin Islands government uh, that has the responsibility of Salt River National Historic Landmark, and the National Park, the only time. joint time. How is that time? Uh, Mr. Chair, that can't be time. You may oh, proceed. It was for Senator you may Blight. proceed. All right. uh, the um, joint uh, ownership of a National Park Service and a territorial government is the only one that we know of under the American flag. And we have grossly neglected our responsibility as stewards of a cultural resource that it's embarrassing and a disgrace uh, that Salt River is kept in the condition that it is. So I want to put that on the record. So I want to commend you and your uh, program and the uh, work that you're doing in the promotion of the, the, the history of the place. Uh, I got a clearer picture that I understand that the restaurant is part of the inholdings of uh, this particular uh, area, and it is my understand is it my understanding that the land to which the restaurant sits on, in addition to the dock, is that before us before before us this morning, or it's just the docking facility? EPNR. 
It's just the marina. It's just the docking facility. It's just so the restaurant has nothing to do with this at this time, correct? What the us, land no. that the restaurant sits on, is that correct? Correct. All right, and then the marina is uh, where the uh, the boat builders that's included within the boundaries of this particular application. Is that correct? Okay, very good. So the principal that's res uh, responding to the um, application of the owner or the owner representative, uh, you made mention of the cultural heritage program that you have. Have you been working with the Department of Education in any aspects or the University of the Virgin Islands as it relates to the cultural resources uh, that you uh, celebrate and uh, use part of your uh, cultural heritage tourism product? Thank you. For, thank you for that question. Um, perhaps I should say we've worked with them indirectly. Uh, knowing many of the writers uh, who have published books recently from pirates to Tainos, teachers in the, uh, in the Department of Education uh, who have come to the property to organize either tours or lectures pre-pandemic, uh, we have worked with uh, numerous uh, teachers and writers, and uh, we will continue to do that. I think it's very important um, that when we talk about Salt River Marina, um, this is just a small part of Salt River. And Salt River encompasses the entire Columbus Landing and uh, much more in history. Uh, and I thank you for your commendation on what we've tried to do in that smaller space, the space that surrounds the submerged lands that we're here today to do the re permitting on. Um, but so yes, that, perhaps that, at your recommendation, we should formalize more direct contact with the Department of Education. Thank you. I, I, and I would encourage you to do so. I think every child should have the opportunity to go through that uh, a marine environment, understand the history, the Kayaks are close to canoes in their in their function and tie that to the history in addition to not the Historic Preservation Office of uh, Historic Preservation under the Department of Planning and Natural Resources and the National Park Service. And that during the summer, especially, that you integrate your uh, activities with the potential of educating our children of the importance of their cultural heritage. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I have no other question for you, but we, the Virgin Islands government have to do better. The sign that speaks to the Columbus or the Salt River, Columbus never landed there. He sent his men in, uh, is in a deplorable state. Uh, we haven't protected the site. We have allowed uh, additional uh, lots to be purchased that have had an impact on the um, National Historic Landmark. And I trust that in 2021 that we would move towards the improvements that are necessary and take our responsibilities serious. And that's to DPNR as well. Uh, the last um, application or the second application before us Ms. Dempsey, uh, what is the name of the bay? Because I know it's not Bluebeard's Beach. No, it, it used to be um, called Lime Tree Bay, uh, and it's part of the entire, the, the bigger large area is, is uh, Morning Star. As you well know, the Frenchman's Reef is located a little bit to the west on that bay. Okay, so clearly... You said it used to be. Now, the Wyndham Bluebeard's Beach Club is the name of the business. That is not the name of the bay. Is that correct? That is correct. And they no, have had the, the bay name. The, the resort has had multiple names. Right. So I, I clearly want to understand the name of the bay. The the installation is not at the Wimham Bluebeds Beach Club. The installation of the pipe is in what bay? 
I will get the exact name. I believe I believe it is part of the Morning Star Bay is what it is. Okay, and, and was, that's what um, the application should also state because here that's, we go that's correct. With, with name changing and then we talk about history and losing identity and here we have an application that doesn't have the correct name of the bay to which the pipeline is placed on. Thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator Jackson. At this time, that completes the round. And these uh, two uh, first items on today's agenda, and I'll allow for DPNR or actually for the um, other testifiers to just do a closing statement, and then we'll proceed with the other items on today's agenda. We don't take any um, votes in this particular committee, and at the appropriate time during regular session, we'll make a final decision on these matters. Uh, that's before us. So at this time, um, I'll allow for the testifiers to do a uh, closing. And we will start with you, Ms. Sabatini. Uh, I would like first to thank you, uh, all the presidents, all the senators, and, and, and every um, attendees of this meeting for very interesting insights and suggestions, and uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, the, for the whole Virgin Islands, uh, Salt River Marina will continue to improve uh, ever and ever in the future. And we as scientists and as uh, lovers of all this uh, natural, um, beautiful environments, we would like to continue in this in this route. And also, uh, we are very uh, proud of uh, Salt River Marina naturally being a, a, a natural uh, whole shelter as a for hurricane seasons. And everybody around the uh, Virgin Islands and throughout the Caribbean uh, knows about this. And we'd like to be uh, continuing to improve uh, to serve all the and St. Croix and Virgin Island and citizens and community at our best. Thank you and happy holidays to uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Sabatini, uh, Ms. Uh, Vigilio Peel. Valio Peel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, I certainly support everything that Ms. Sabatini just stated and uh, I will continue to emphasize as we go forward uh, the awareness of environmental concerns, the preservation of history and culture, and education. I think these are the three components that help make a business a good business and a business that will move forward into the next generation with more informed residents, community people, and citizens. Um, I think. I like the term collective work uh, as we celebrate Kwanzaa and the many other holidays in this particular time. It takes many agencies, many individuals, and the passion of many people to make something happen. And I think uh, as we join together with um, continuing communication and improved communication, I think that was pointed out, uh, we should be able to um, to have a, um, a better informed island and a better organized island that invites everyone to its shores. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Peel. Next, we'll go to Ms. Dempsey. I just want to thank everybody for your attention and the time you spent on this this morning. Um, we, you know, have tried to uh, to, to design a pipeline that's going to have the minimal impact in the marine environment and also the discharge. And the pipe is in Frenchman's Bay, which is what was stated in the application. I just didn't remember off the top of my head what that part of the bay was called. Um, but the larger bay is Frenchman's Bay. Morning Star Bay is where Frenchman's Reef has the Morning Star Resort. And this bay itself does not have a specific this embayment, the small plates, it doesn't have a, a very specific name. It's just part of, um, of uh, the overall Frenchman's Bay. And I just want to wish everybody a very blessed and safe new year. And hopefully uh, 2021 will go and be a, a better year than 2020 has been. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Dempsey. And next we'll go to um, Assistant Director Richards to close off uh, this particular round and these two first items on the agenda. Okay, well, 
first off, um, thank you, Senate President Nova Francis and the members of the 33rd Legislature for considering these permits today. And I'd also like to put on record that about the co-management of the park, the South River Park, we're actually co-managers of the eastern side of that bay and not the side where the the marina exists. But um, I agree with everything that you know, Senator Jackson was saying, and just want everyone to have a happy and safe holiday for the remainder. Thank you. Very well. Uh, thank you very much. And at this time, Madam Clerk, if you could call up the next two items on today's agenda, and um, those other testifiers for the first uh, two items uh, could be dismissed. Madam Clerk. Our next, our next two items, ZAC-20-3, a request that plot number 39A Street, Fredericksted, St. Croix be rezoned from R4 residential medium density to B3 business scattered. The proposed use is a barber and beauty shop, law office, retail, and or event rental space. And the, the, um, the second request is ZAC-20-4, a request that plot number 1AEA Estate Diamond Queen Quarter St. Croix be rezoned from R2 residential low density one and two family to B3 business scattered. And the proposed use is a car wash and convenience store. Uh, thank you very much at this time. Uh, Ms. Leah Laplace Matthews, you recognize for presentation and these uh, next two measures. Good afternoon, Senate President Francis. Um, I'd also like to recognize Assistant Commissioner Keith Richards. Good afternoon, members of the 33rd Legislature. My name is Leah Laplace Matthew, Territorial Planner with DPNR's Division of Comprehensive and Coastal Zone Planning. And representing the Commissioner is Assistant Commissioner Keith Richards. Very well, thank you. Uh, good morning. Assist good morning, Assistant everybody. Commissioner Richards, uh, good afternoon. How are you yes, doing? Good morning. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Yeah, very well. Are you presenting on behalf of the commissioner? Um, I'm here on behalf of the commissioner. Ms. Leah Laplace Machus will be representing the testimony on behalf of the department. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Ms. Um, Laplace Matthew, you recognize. Thank you, and good afternoon again to the members of the 33rd Legislature fellow testifiers, and the viewing and listening audience of the U.S. Virgin Islands. My name is Leah Laplace Matthew, and I'll be presenting the testimony on the two items, application number ZAC-20-3 and ZAC-20-4. Report on petition to amend official zoning map number SCZ-18, Application number ZAC-20-3, petition of Virginia Simmons Miller and Larry E. Miller requesting that plot number 39A, Prince Street, Fredericksted, St. Croix, be rezoned from R4, residential medium density, to B3, business scattered. Project profile. Owner, applicant. Virginia Simmons Miller and Larry E. Miller, as per deed of gift, dated September 11, 2006. Document number 20060005511. Plot number 39A, Prince Street, Fredericksted, consists of 2,960 square feet, as shown on measure brief folio. 250. The property is not in use 
but developed with a two-story building which has three rental spaces. Proposed use, a barber slash beauty shop, law office, retail and or event rental space. Surrounding uses, zoned. To the north is a vacant lot. To the east is a building that was used commercially. To the south is a vacant lot. To the west is a residence. The surrounding area is zoned R4 and B2 business secondary neighborhood. Infrastructure. Water needs will be supplied by public water lines and wastewater will be handed by public sewer lines. Public response. At DPNR's public hearing held October 6, 2020, one adjacent property owner expressed support of the petition, but was concerned with the use of the property for a barn. Analysis. During the department's public hearing, Mr. Miller testified he wishes to make the building available for his son's barber shop and a law firm in the short term. In the long term, it could also be available for retail, event rentals, or residential use if needed. The site is located along the southern edge of town near the Fredericksted Post Office and Seventh-day Adventist Church. The surrounding area contains properties that have historically been used for commercial and residential activity. The current R4 zoning, however, does not permit the applicant's proposed commercial uses. And the B3 zone would allow for commercial and residential use, while keeping similar development provisions with the R4 zoning district. The department is in favor of town properties having increased use opportunities to spur redevelopment in our towns. This rezoning provides a potential benefit to the community and may be a stimulus for the rehabilitation and or enhancement of surrounding town properties. Recommendation. The Department of Planning and Natural Resources recommends that plot number 39A Prince Street, Fredericksted, St. Croix, be rezoned from R4, residential medium density, to B3, business scattered. Signed by Keith Richards, Assistant Commissioner, dated October 27, 2020. The second report on petition to amend official zoning map, number SCZ-12, application number ZAC-20-4. Petition of Maurice Thomas and McGarvey Henry requesting that plot number 1 AEA Estate Diamond Queen Quarter St. Croix be rezoned from R2 Residential Low Density 192 Family to B3 Business Scattered. Project Profile Owner Applicant. The property owner is Maurice Thomas as per quit claim deed dated May 24, 2012. Document number 2012-002189. The application is being made by Maurice Thomas and McGarvey Henry. Plot number 1AEA Estate Diamond Queen Quarter consists of 1.271 acres as shown on drawing number 559. Current use. The property is not in use. However, it has the, re the remnants of a car wash. This use operated under 234 of the zoning law, non-conforming uses. Section 234H states, any non-conforming use of land or building which has ceased by discontinuance or abandonment for a period of one year shall thereafter conform to the provisions of this subchapter. The non-conforming use of the property ceased over a year ago, thus the applicant chose to seek alternative status, rezoning. Proposed use, car wash and convenience store. Surrounding uses, zoned. 
To the north is the Sanyaz Shopping Center. To the east is a gas station and strip mall. To the south is a defunct, grandfathered, non-conforming water company. To the west is another strip mall. The surrounding area is zoned R2, B2 Business Secondary Neighborhood, and B3. Infrastructure. Water needs will be supplied by public water lines and wastewater will be handled by public sewer lines. Public response. There has been no opposition to the proposed rezoning. Other than the applicant and his representative, no one else spoke in support of, questioned, or commented on the petition at DPNR's public hearing held October 2, 2020. Analysis. During the department's public hearing, the architect, Mr. Clarence Brown, testified the applicant wished to demolish and reconstruct, reconfigure the grandfathered car wash structure so that a new car wash can be built as well as a convenience store. The grandfathered car wash use ended over a year ago and a rezoning is being requested to allow the proposed uses along with conforming with the zoning of the surrounding area. As previously mentioned, Section 234H of the Zoning Code placed a discontinuance or abandonment period of one year that thereafter a property must conform to the provisions of the Zoning Code, which was adopted on October 1, 1972. This provision allowed for legally established uses to continue, even though the new zoning would not have allowed that use. The abandonment period allows for the eventual elimination of nonconformities. The requested B3 zoning was intended primarily to permit small neighborhood serving retail businesses within residential districts, usually a single store or small strip mall. It is recognized that the Christiansted Estate Diamond area has had 14 rezoning attempts with 12 granted for B2, B3, B4, or C commercial zoning. The department recognizes the change that has developed in this area over the years, which indicates that property owners were not inclined to use the area for residential purposes, but for commercial purposes. Thus, the department recommends approval of this rezoning request. Recommendation. The Department of Planning and Natural Resources recommends that plot number 1AEA, Estate Diamond, Queen Quarter St. Croix, be rezoned from R2, residential low density, one and two family, to B3, business scattered. Signed by Keith Richards, Assistant Commissioner, dated October 27, 2020. And this concludes the department's recommendation on the two petitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Laplace Matthew. At this time, um, we'll hear from Mr. Larry Miller or Ms. Virginia Simmons Miller. Do we have the Millers on the line? Very well, we'll come back to them. Uh, let's go to Mr. Llewellyn Sua, representative. No. I'm sorry, let's go to uh, Mr. Clarence Brown. Good morning. Um, good morning, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, um, my name is Clarence Brown. Um, I'm the managing principal for Design District Architects and Planners. And I'm here today representing um, Mr. Maurice Thomas and McGarvey Henry's interest in um, the zoning change, zoning map amendment um, for one AEA Estate Diamond. Um, as um, Ms. Laplace just stated, this property is an old car wash site um, in Sunny Isle. And the 
intended use here is for it to be used as a car wash um, as well. And so the expired grandfather clause um, has put um, the owner and the developer in a position where they're unable to um, continue using this as a car wash. And so we're here today um, to present our case for um, getting this property rezoned from R1 to B3. This, this property has been zoned R1 um, you know, in, in, in the 70s, um, despite being in operation as a car wash since the 60s. It's been owned by the Thomas family um, the entire time. And the previous um, car wash operator went out of business and the grandfather clause expired. Um, what we're seeking here today is um, essentially permission to get that car wash back up and running. What we intend to do is to knock down the existing structure and rebuild um, a brand new car wash with a small um, convenience store on site. These are one story buildings. Um, we're surrounded by commercial functions, uh, business functions. We have um, Sunny Isle Shopping Center to the north, um, a gas station, um, and other strip mall developments in, in that immediate area. I have sent pictures and a layout um, for you guys to see. I'm not sure um, if you're able to, to, to see that, but um, this is along Centerline Road and um, we believe that this is um, a fairly straightforward request and very much in keeping with the neighborhood. And, um, and we'd like to um, just put this case before you and we're here to answer any questions on, um, on what we're proposing to do here. Um, but um, this is a um, small uh, B3 um, scattered business um, proposal here, and we, we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Very well. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. At this time, um, media, can you show the photos, uh, depiction of these two sites? Uh, DPNR, Mr. Brown, are you able to share your screen with those photos? Yes, hold one second here. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we still seeing your photo right now. Are you guys able to see that? Yes. Okay. So what you're looking at here is a picture of the um, of the car wash from the Sunny Isle Shopping Center area and that Centerline Road um, running east to west in front of me here. There's a commercial building to the west and a strip mall to the east. Um, looking just east of this property, we have a strip mall and a gas station with Sunny Isle left of the screen. This is focusing more on the commercial property just west of um, the site. Then this is a depiction of what we intend to build. We have um, entrance and exit coming off of Centerline Road, an automatic car wash, um, a few detail stations, um, some vacuum stations, and a convenience store. Mm -hmm. 
Again, these are all one story structures. Very well, can you speak to the um, construction timeline? Um, do you wish to accomplish this task? It'll take us about four months to complete the design drawings and obtain all the permits that we need. And then um, we expect to start construction. Um, a, a lot of the components of the car wash will be shipped in from away. So there'll be some timeline to get that teed up um, and get that um, specialized um, equipment set up um, from um, some uh, experts from off island. But we expect about a year of construction and assembly once we have permits in hand. Very well. What about finances? Uh, th that is in place as well? Yes, that's in place. It'll be um, private financing. Very well. Thank you. At this time, um, we'll open up the floor uh, for a three minute round. As Senator Fred Gregory, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And of course, we are always in favor of small businesses and economic development throughout the territory. So I am pleased to support both of these um, rezoning requests. Uh, just going back to the question that the chair asked um, around the funding. This project is anticipated to cost about how much? And I'm speaking about the, the convenience zone, the car wash. About $800,000. And how many um, jobs should be created as a result of this project? About, about five permanent jobs. About five permanent jobs. Now I have a question for DPNR, because I know that there was a car wash here previously, but we are in fact um, approving or considering approving a rezoning. So do we have more of this in the territory, uh, Mr. Richards or Mrs. Laplace? How is DPNR assessing these types of properties so they could get in um, compliance. Uh, good, um, good afternoon, Senator Gregory, Fred Gregory. Um, this property, as Ms. LaPlaza indicated, is a pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, this property existed prior to 1972. I, I um, know, it was Keith, a Mr. Richards. The 60s. Mr. Richards, I don't want you to Sorry? run up my time. I'm aware of the question, but I'm asking you. Um, I note specifically what the issue is. Is DPNR conducting an assessment of similar issues uh, like this particular property? Um, the department has an inventory as yes, a pre-existing and conforming uses, and. Uh, that will be part of a um, rezoning of the entire territory, yes. So when that will happen? That's a good answer, um, Mr. Richards. Next. I'm sorry? It's scheduled for when? Next year. So when uh, DPNR comes back down to the legislature next year, we're not going to hear that it's something that you're working on. It's something that will be in play, correct? It will be proposals that will be draft proposals that will be before you. Okay, perfect. We look forward to seeing them. Um, let's go to the uh, the rezoning in uh, Fredericksville. Time. I don't really have any questions around it, to be honest with you. So I am going to um, to my time has been caused, but I don't really have any questions around it, other than um, the issue with with potential noise violations if in fact the property is to be used for um, events and rental space. Because I know that there was one concern that came around that issue. Are the property owners here? Mr. Brown, was it? Yes, the Millers, but I think Mr. Brown represented them. 
No, 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 no. Uh, the Millers uh, apparently were having difficulties. Um, so they didn't get on. So, no. So they're not on. But DPNR could perhaps answer or respond to your concerns. You could. DPNR? Because I know there's a barbershop, law office, retail, and or event rental space. So and or event rental space is a very broad concept. So I'm, I know that there are neighboring properties in the, in the, where this is slated to um, operate. So the question is around the noise uh, violations. The potential noise violation if it's going to be used as an event rental space. I'll have Mr. Plaz respond to that um, concern. Good afternoon again. Um, in terms of noise violation, they would have to follow the noise ordinance and any violation the surrounding area would just have to report it to the police. Um, let me just be clear. So what I'm trying to find out is it says event. It says event rental and I'm trying to establish is it a conference room concept or is it where you could have a a party a, a, a jam because that event um, is very broad and I know that there are neighboring properties in the area neighboring homes so um senator the the property being zoned b3 would allow for all types of um, business scattered um, development. Um, based on the request, mo the activities in the, at this property would be enclosed and should not create any noise or violate noise ordinances that would be a concern to adjacent property owners. My time has been called, so thank you for the time as a chair. But I know that that's not 100% true. If, it's the, if events will be taking place there with music and the like. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Fred Gregory. Senator Thomas, you recognize your three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And good afternoon to the professionals testifying before us here today. Um, quickly, let's run to the car wash. And Mr. Brown, uh, good afternoon, season's greetings. The quick question I have is, with the design of the new car wash area, you do not have any um, areas where the car owners can wash the car themselves? I'm, not, I'm asking. No. So the, the car owners won't be able to wash the car themselves on site. Um, however, okay, me, we do let me have... Just say this. That's okay. No, it's fine. Let, let me just say this, right? No. The best thing about a car wash especially those that allow others to wash the car themselves, is that the facility, the business, could make money when they own a home sleeping. That's just my thinking. I've, I've seen car washes in the territory, and those that are 24 hours, that they make money while the owner is home sleeping. I agree with the conveyor and the full service. That's it. That is excellent. But just an idea, just a suggestion Give that option because there are some guys, some of them guys with the pretty with the pretty cars, they want nobody touching their cars, but they would come and utilize the facility to have, you know, the sprayers, the vacuums, and be able to wash it itself. It's a form of therapy for, for them as well. Also, <clears throat> I'm looking at the vacuum spaces. You have 10 vacuum spaces? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I love the layout. I love the the planned flow of the traffic. I love how it's very well organized, including the convenience store. Um, my additional suggestion is simply um, see if that's something you could fit in because it allows, again, for the facility to make money after hours. That's just a suggestion. Um, as far as the other property in Fredericton, with the La Forme, the barbershop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just to kind of give some 2020 update to my colleague about noise, 
they had a big fete this weekend that they call a silent jam, where everybody was bacchanaling and everybody had on the light up headphones. So I could imagine the day will come where um, you're going to have major functions, including with my colleague playing his piano, his trumpet, but it's going to be plugged in and everybody will be listening via some kind of remote device and the, the, the noise will be kept to a minimum. I have the same concern as my colleague. I hope that whatever investment is done on that facility, it is not a distraction or a disturbance to the surrounding residents, businesses, or the, the area in general. I have no further questions. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Thomas. Senator DeGraff, you're recognized for your three minutes. Uh, let's move on to Senator Benta. You recognize for your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, to Mr. Brown and to the Millers, I want to say congratulations. I know that one of my colleagues had a question about whether there would be an impact as far as a noise ordinance, if depending on what the event may be. But I understand from the owner, it's pretty much as listed for barbershop and attorney's offices. And if someone want to have a uh, baby shower alike, but no bands. And of course, uh, with that, it's somewhat like a meeting space for a little, little get together or whatever have you. But I would say that the town of Frederick said for many uh, for decades, based on what we've seen, I want to thank the Millers for their visionary direction as far as reinvigorating that district with such in instrumental and worthy expenditures they're spending in those facilities together, or that facility together. Thank you, as beautiful as it is right now. There is a bar right in front of him, and there's, uh, I would go back to the street over at, back in the uh, 60s, uh, Mr. Pickering had his barbershop on the other street, as well as a uh, uh, residence on the top floor. To Mr. Brown uh, and your partner, I want to say congratulations to you as well. I am, in fact, in support of both measures here. Uh, we'll vote appropriately when the time uh, is before us when we get into the session. For your vision as well, because, you know, we've seen our own being a part of the development of growth. Rather than talking, we're doing. Sometimes it's not easy. And as I look at some of these permits, I see uh, the, um, the Millers go back to 2006. Uh, and I'll ask a question offline, why it's so long? Maybe there's a reason for that. I don't know how long it was to Mr. Brown, but uh, to DPNR, I know you're doing your best, and hopefully we get, get up to, to, to get a lot of those who applied over the years up to speed, unless the DPNR want to put something on the record uh, as to the time frame for the allotment of these permits to be approved. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that we really have to see you really get, and, and, and you, are, you guys are working hard, I see it. And I thank God I was able to visit some of the areas and see what you got to go through to get it where it's supposed to. No, not the delay from your side, but I know exactly where it's coming from. Uh, and at the same time, when you do your presentation, to put it on the record, what has been some of the hiccups getting there so that we can have an understanding, because I sent out the investigative, investigative reminders to find out what may have been some of the delays. And for these two projects, uh, my hat's off to DPNR as well and to both. Business venturers, your home, you're putting it back into where you live, you're uh, employing, but it's five, what it's six, you're employing. You're bringing a piece of the rock back home where people can have something to say, they have somewhere to go to be gainfully employed. And I'm looking at the private sector more so for us to get where we need to get to. My time will be called. I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, timekeeper. <laughs> In the nick of time. Thank you very much, Senator Benta. Uh, Senator Payne, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you for the time, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I don't really have any questions for the Millers. I just would like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues and just to let you know that um, event rental spaces that host jams tend to actually create issues for businesses that are actually tied to it especially after hours. So if um, it, it, it's your mindset to have uh, businesses 
operating uh, like a law office right next to some place where the whole jam and stuff. Um, and they, you, you, you may run into some issues, especially after hours, if the places, the event places are actually slated for to hold events where people tend to actually drink loud music, maybe even smoke and get a little loud and rowdy. Just, just something to keep in mind. Uh, Mr. Brown, your car wash is slated to be 100% self-automated? Not 100%. Um, there's, there's a conveyor um, that, that, that will be automated, but there are other services that will require. Um, we have a detail station, three detail stations that would allow um, for people to get their cars detailed and that's not automated and other services associated with, um, you know, an advanced level of detailing on, on site as well as the convenience store, which is an automated but will be run like a typical convenience store. Okay. And between both um, stores, how many employees you plan to actually hire? Right now, we're looking at about five, um, but that, that, that could go up, so. That could go up? Okay. Um, one last question, because um, I see you're kind of young in age and stuff, and I, you want to win over my vote? Show me that you're going to do something for young people. So let me ask you, let me kind of put you on the spot. Are you, are you open to hosting, let's say, school funding, uh, ho a school hosting a funding, a fundraising event, a car wash once in a while, at your facility as a means of giving back to the community? You open to that idea? Well, let me be clear. I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm the architect representing the developer. Um, so I'm not going to spend his money here today, um, but I'm sure he would be open to it. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely raise that idea by him. Oh, okay. Well, um, since you are here, Today and then it's in Canada in the hot seat, and you actually um, you, you, you gave me a pretty decent answer with that. And since you are going to reach out, you know, have your word. I still have you on record as having your word that you can reach out to him. Um, you're going to definitely have my support at the time, okay? Um, Mr. Pritchett, thank, thank you. you very much for the time. I have no further questions. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Payne. Senator James, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, testifiers. Mr. Brown. My question regarding the car wash, can you explain to me what kind of system will be in place when it comes to the handling of the drainage and runoff water that the car wash will be producing as a byproduct? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think um, the previous car wash ran into similar issues um, regarding the drainage. So um, we actually, um, we're really buckling down on getting the civil engineering on the site um, right. We do have multiple drainage options um, where we could tie into public work systems um, for stormwater runoff. But we also will be having an on-site reclamation system that will allow us to reuse 30 to 50% of the water that the um, car wash generates. And so that's something that we're taking very seriously. Thank you, I'm glad to hear that. And DPNR, can you weigh in on the discussion regarding your recommendations to the, the owners who are looking to get into this business regarding the drainage and runoff water system? DPNR? Did the department make any right. recommendations? Good. Uh, Good, morning. Good afternoon, Senator James. Uh, when it comes to the proper drainage on a project like this, um, we would work with the um, owner to ensure that the proper um, drainage system is approved during the permitting process. So I'm asking... But that uh, is a process that, he would, that they will go through during the permitting stage. Okay, so no assessment has been done as yet. That will be happening at a later time, is what you're saying? Correct, because a rezoning is just a potential. They're tell, um, the owner is telling us what their intent is, but there's no official plans before the department for, um, for permitting. Um, what they have provided are concepts of what they intend to do. 
Understood. Thank you. Uh, I used to work in a wastewater syst system facility in the refinery at one point, and I know the importance of handling our drainage and runoff water, and I'm just happy to hear from Mr. Brown that there will be something in place to deal with some of the issues that that property had in the past regarding um, drainage and runoff water. So I'm happy to know that. I, I do support this project because um, I remember as a young boy growing up, that was a hot spot for washing your car back in the days. All the fancy buggies used to go there, and all the, the nice, stylish vehicles used to be there. And for the years, it has been an eyesore. I'm just happy to know that Sony Els is moving one step closer to being revitalized, and more businesses will be coming into that location. As, as far as the millers, I had the opportunity to visit that property. I received a call to my office regarding some of the issues that they were facing. I'm just happy to know that moving forward that they are moving Time. in the right step. I have little to no questions regarding this property or this project and rezoning. I just hope that VIPD will work hand in hand with the business owners in the town of Fredericksted to install camera systems and to make Fredericksted a safer place for individuals who are looking to get into business like the Millers. So I do stand in support of these two permits, and I know we're not taking action today, but thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Uh, thank you very much, Senator James. The Chair will recognize Senator VLA. You recognize for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am going to support um, both of these rezone, and I'm looking at the property for Larry and Virginia Miller, and they did a real good job of passing the property a couple of times. I didn't even know uh, who was actually the owner of that particular property, but they have done a wonderful job, and this is what we want to occur in our tongues, on the tongue of Fredericksen, the tongue of Christiansen, where we have um, some business development with residential on the top. So I am definitely going to support this. I'm also going to support Mr. Maurice Thomas rezoning. I must say that I was quite shocked to see that um, that property property that has been a business for so many years wasn't actually zoned. I was like, what, what are we doing? It, it must have been zoned uh, business because it's been in operation as a business for over 30 years. So that shows that DPNR, despite the fact that there is a grandfather clause, um, there is a need for us to make sure that properties that actually have a business that have existed for X amount of years, that we're able to do the appropriate rezoning. Uh, the question that I have, if a property is not rezoned, then that states that the owner is paying property tax as a re on a residential basis, Mr. Richards? Uh, Good afternoon, um, Senator Vele. The properties are assessed based on the use. So that property is being assessed as a business and, and was being assessed as such during the time of operations. And you're sure about that? And I'm, I'm not talking um, about a property alone. I'm talking about just properties throughout the Virgin Islands that are zoned residential and are actually running a business for X amount of years. How are we, how do we know for sure that those properties are paying the commercial rate for property tax and not the residential? So the, the Lieutenant Governor's office who assesses those, um, those, those taxes, they update their, their, um, their files regularly and they actually do on-site inspections to determine the type of activities that the property is being used for, and the property taxes are typically assessed based on the use of the property, not the zoning. So have the Office of the Lieutenant Governor sent DPNR a listing of properties that are being utilized for commercial but a zone residential? Um, the department has access to the lieutenant governor's database Time. so we we check the we check their files um as as needed okay when you find out that there is a business being operated on a residential property what's the what, what happens next 
Well, I, I think it normally happens in the reverse uh, because we don't assess property taxes. So the lieutenant governor, if they find that there's some kind of peculiarity with the use of the property or if there's an issue, um, they would alert us to that concern. How many times have you been alerted? Um, so maybe I'm not um, aware of any. Okay, let, let me see what uh, I'm just trying to. But maybe Miss, maybe Miss Laplace might be aware because she handles that directly. No, let me see what I'm trying to get to. There's a need for everything that is being done in the Virgin Islands to fall under the purview of established laws. And if we know that um, in order to operate a business, it has to be zoned in a particular manner and it was grandfathered in, then we have to come up with a plan as to how we're going to make sure that um, those zoning are changed. And we have to come up with a plan to make sure that the appropriate rate is being charged by the office of the lieutenant governor. I mean, it, 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 it's all over that, that you, you, you see this occurring. And at some point, you know, we are going to, to have to correct it. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Vele, and I, I think you're correct. There is some loopholes that individuals continue to fall through, and that's why even the effort, and I've been a strong advocate and supporter of the street addressing, uh, for example, so that those loopholes could be closed and that we could really have a, 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 um, a comprehensive system in place that check and balance itself. Uh, but yes, there are some instances where uh, perhaps, you know, um, you know, the property may be zoned a particular area, the charge may be a particular way, you know, and I think there is an effort on the government's uh, side to really close those loopholes and address it comprehensively, but that's still a work in progress, right? You know, so I don't know that um, we have uh, been able to close all of those loops as we continue to do the street addressing and some of those issues that confronts us, um, but it's, it's a work in progress. Um, at this time, We'll go to Senator Barnes. You recognize for your three minutes. Senator Blyden. Senator Blyden, I'm sorry. Senator Blyden, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I, I'm supporting both of these zoning requests. Um, those for the Miller, the one for the Millers, and Mr. Thomas and Henry, in which Mr. Brown is representing today. Um, I'm happy to see that the Miller saw it fit to invest and create a business in which many individuals will be using and use it on a regular basis. A barbershop and beauty salon cannot never go wrong, ever. And a barbershop is there for the sun, so um, I think that's a good thing. Also, that's in the short term, and for the long term, they said they would basically um, say they can have um, space available, available for retail and rentals and all residential youth, so that's use. So I'm thinking, you know, in a short term and long term, and to assure that no matter what, they can have their business be successful, and I want to applaud them for that. Also, when it comes to the car wash for Mr. Thomas, um, I know there was a talk car wash there before that have been sitting idle for some time, and car washes are very um, popular here in the Virgin Islands, and many folks use these car washes. I was just wondering why, you know, um, the car wash was closed for some time. That's just um, something I was wondering. But nonetheless, I want to wish both of them well in their investment, and I look forward to them basically being successful and uh, basically contributing to the economy of the Virgin Islands. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for the time. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Blyden, and thank you for your support there. Uh, next, we'll go to Senator Barnes. You recognize for your three minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm in support of both of these um, rezoning applications, and I want to commend both of Mr. and Mrs. Miller and Mr. Thomas um, for their applications. But I have a question for DPNR. Um, how long was their inactivity at the car wash site? Um, I think Ms. Laplace, if you could respond to that question, please. How long was their inactivity at the car wash site? Good afternoon. We do not have the exact number of years. It's 
greater than the one year period um, prescribed by law. Okay, but are you aware? Are you aware of Act Number eighty two zero zero? Um, it was Bill Number thirty three dash zero zero four zero. It was passed by the thirty third legislature on September nineteenth, September sixteenth, rather, twenty nineteen and signed into law by Governor Bryan on October 6th. And in section two of this act, it changed the one year um, um, inactivity to three years via amendment number 33-388. And I moved that amendment and it was supported by all of the members of the 33rd legislature and we advise DPNR of this particular amendment as well, because we found that after the storms, a lot of persons dealing with the insurance settlement and the like were faced with inactivity in these pre-existing non-conforming areas and then would then have to come for a full rezoning because of the one year inactivity. So we change it to three years. So I'm wondering if DPNR is not um, enforcing this particular law? Did you forget or are you unaware? DPNR? Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner. I mean, Senator Barnes. Um, um, we, I'm not sure, but I, I was unaware of that particular amendment and that new provision, or it may have gone under the radar as it, re as it relates to a project of uh, a proposal that's before us. Um, okay, so let me give so you this act number it, 8200. Yes. And it is section two. Title 29, chapter three, subchapter one, section 234H of the Virgin Islands Code is amended by striking one year and in certain three years in its place. So for the non-conforming okay. use in a period of activity, it was moved from one year to three years. And that was to assist our residents who were trying to recommence activities at their pre-existing non-conforming location. So I would ask that DPNR um, enforce this particular section to ensure that our residents have the uh, relief that so many of them may need in this particular instance. It may not apply to this particular application, but where it does apply, it is important that we enforce it. And, and yes, uh, Senator Barnes, we will assess and review that. Um, I think one peculiarity would be that if a property owner wants to expand the uses, um, the pre-existing non-conforming use that it currently exists only allows them to put, put back what was there before. Absolutely. Um, and in a case like this. Yes, we are in agreement with that. This was just to provide some degree of relief in instances where they wanted to recommence the exact same activity, not to expand yes. Yes. the usage. Okay? Yes, Senator. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, thank Senator. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Barnes. Uh, Senator Jackson, you're recognized for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to the testifiers in this block. And before I go on, I see that the Assistant Commissioner Richards has, uh, is joined us and I want to express my condolences to you and, and your family and the passing of your beloved brother, which had been done before, but personally I'm doing it publicly since you have joined us today. Uh, the you know, two applications that before us, I, I really don't have any objection why I should not uh, support these particular measures. I just would like to see the one on St. John uh, really incorporate the best practices of aesthetics. Uh, I do not believe that 
industrial properties built in this territory uh, are usually those aesthetic requirements in the territory are so lacking that uh, it doesn't have to look industrial. And I trust that they will take uh, some care and pride in doing the necessary landscaping, screening where necessary, and uh, enhancing the property because it's in an area of St. John that really a beautiful area and it shouldn't just be uh, transformed into this industrial looking uh, plot. And Mr. Richards, you want to speak to that? Um, oh, DPM good afternoon, uh, Senator Jackson, um, and, and thank you again for for um, your your support in the passing of my brother. Um, yes, yeah, so the department too is concerned about uh, the aesthetics that surround the development of properties, especially business, commercial, industrial, and to the greatest extent possible during the permitting process, we um, attempt to ensure that any development um, considers adjacent um, property owners, considers the aesthetic uh, values, consider the um, what the residents and business and and and, and uh, businesses as well as their patrons view when they. Um, participate in the business's um, activities. Um, in regards to the property on St. John, we will, uh, the proposed property off of Centerline Road, we will be um, ensuring that any final permits for that site will address the aesthetics as they are um, contiguous uh, and major re residential um, developments in the surrounding area. Okay, very well. And then uh, in St. Croix, I want to commend the developer. I'm familiar with the Hi. area and the proposed uh, drawings that were presented would be much in, a, a much improvement uh, on that, again, commercial strip that likewise could use enhancements and uh, that we could bring them up to standards uh, 21st, stand, 21st century standards, so I look forward to supporting these measures when the appropriate time comes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Jackson. I, too, will be supporting both of these measures, and I want to commend DPNR for doing their due diligence and moving these projects forward and sending them forth to the legislature for consideration. It speaks to economic activities, jobs and certainly funding to the government coffers. I have had the opportunity to watch uh, and looked at both of these uh, infrastructure, the car wash, of course, over the years. Um, as a, a young man utilizing that car wash many times, um, certainly to wash vehicles, going over to Sunny Isles and shining up your vehicles and profiling a bit, um, you know, during the, the days back then. And um, certainly have your boom box in your car and your blast and your tweeters and, and you know what I mean, looking good in your vehicle. And um, that, for some reason, the car wash just, just kind of died and, and nothing happened there for a number of years. So it'll be good to see some e economic activities occurring in that particular area once again. Also, that building in Fredericksted, you know, navigating um, to work. When, I, when we were down at the Fredericksted legislature, I often pass that particular building and kind of wonder, you know, what will be the final outcome. I'm certainly happy to see uh, the final outcome of the building uh, had been under construction for quite some time, and you could just see the improvement over a period of time as they continue to develop it. And I, I think that is an excellent use of the property, and the final outcome is certainly commendable. Um, so I want to thank the uh, Virginia Miller and Larry Miller for um, you know, building out that uh, particular structure, and then you know making sure that they also allow for some economic activities. Truth be told. We would like to see a lot more of these buildings in our towns, in both Christianstead and Fredericksted, um, equally be built out and um, allow for economic activities or residential areas back in our towns. So I'm hoping that we could certainly see that in the future. But at the appropriate time, um, I will be voting in the affirmative for both of these measures. And again, I want to commend.
compliment and, and thank all of these stakeholders uh, for moving these projects forward and looking forward to the favorable consideration by the full body in the very near future in both of these measures. Let's conclude this particular round. And at this time, I'll go to um, DPNR as well as Mr. Clarence Brown. Let's go to Clarence Brown, first of all, to give a closing, and then I'll come to DPNR. Yes, good afternoon. So thanks again um, for the opportunity to um, discuss um, this, this zoning change um, for one AEA um, Estate Diamond. Um, we, we expect this to be a real benefit to the community um, as we're essentially um, rehabbing our old property that's in a very visible location and we expect it to have a really good impact on, on that strip on St. Croix. And um, just want to thank um, everyone for this opportunity to um, make our case for this rezoning and wishing everyone a, a um, excellent season and a happy new year. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. And we could go to um, Ms. Laplace Matthew and then uh, the Assistant Commissioner for closing on this particular um, two zoning. Good afternoon again, and um, just wanted to thank, thank you for allowing DPNR to place its comments on record. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matthew. And um, Assistant Commissioner Richards? Yes, and good afternoon. I'd like to um, thank the body for the opportunity to provide um, our recommendations on these two rezoning applications. Um, both projects are consistent with uh, our zoning and development um, policies and practices, um, especially in Fredericksted, um, where a number of senators ha have indicated um, this type of mixed-use development are the type of developments that we would promote, and we believe that there are sufficient uh, laws in place to ensure that properties like this uh, have positive impact on the town area. And um, in this particular case, we're talking about one building and the opportunities that will exist inside the building, we believe would be of uh, positive benefit to the community. So once again, we thank the body for the opportunity to provide our recommendations on these two rezonings. Very well, um, thank you. And this concludes that particular uh, block. And now we'll move on to the next items on today's agenda. And that will be number five and six. Madam Clerk, please read those items into the agenda. ZAJ-20-3, a request that parcel number 5-0, Estate Pass 3, number 5, Cruz Bay Quarter, St. John, be rezoned from R2, residential low density 1 and 2 family, to C, commercial. The proposed use, the warehouse building to be used for automotive mechanical repairs, equipment, material storage, and two employee housing units. ZAJ-20-5, a request that parcel number 14, remainder, Estate Carolina, number one, Coral Bakewater, St. John, be rezoned from R2, residential low density one and two family, to B2, business, secondary neighborhood. The proposed use? An animal care center, kennels for dogs and cats, 20 and 19 respectively, veterinarian's office, classroom for outreach, trainings and meetings, one bedroom employee housing unit, children's playground and walking trail. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. Let me just go to the um, virtual representation and make sure everyone is there. Uh, Mr. Llewellyn Sua, represented. Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good, Good afternoon. Morning. Good afternoon. Welcome. And the... Alif is there. He's going to be the one who's going to be 
going. What's, what's, Khalid. what's that name? Khalid. Mr. Khalil. Khalil Henley. Khalil Henley. Very well. And, um, and also uh, we have uh, Jessica Palmer. I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And also Michael Milney. I'm here. Very well. Okay, so DPNR, um, Assistant Commissioner Richards and Ms. Lydia Laplace Matthew, you recognize for presentation and um, those two zoning requests, rezoning requests. Good afternoon again. Um, I'll be presenting the report on petition to amend official zoning map number SJZ 2. Application number ZAJ-20-3. Petition of Virgin Developers LLC, authorized agent Aisha Robert, requesting that parcel number 5-0, Estate Pastry, number 5, Cruz Bakewater, St. John, be rezoned from R2, residential low density, one and two family, to C, commercial. Project profile. Owner, applicant. Virgin Developers, LLC, as per warranty deed, dated May 5, 2016. Document number 2016-002971. Aisha Roberts was granted power of attorney. Parcel number 5-0, Estate Pastry, consists of 1.23 acres as shown on drawing number F9-3977-T80. Current use. The property is not in use. However, a retaining wall is under construction. Proposed use. A warehouse building to be used for automotive mechanical repairs, equipment slash material storage, and two employee housing units. Surrounding uses, zones. To the north is Central Line Road, a church, and residences. To the east, south, and west is undeveloped land. The surrounding area is zoned R2. Infrastructure. Water needs will be supplied by cistern and wastewater will be handled by a sewage treatment system. Public response. There has been no opposition to the proposed rezoning. After DPNR's public hearing held September 29, 2020, two emails were submitted by adjacent property owners who expressed the following questions, concerns. One, will more construction be needed to level property for building of warehouse? No. The current leveled will be the major extent of the excavation phase. Two, there has been disregard for neighbors with impact of the past construction noise on the residential area. Two, refrigerated trucks have been running 24 hours. Four, Will warehouse noise muffle or amplify the AC refrigeration noise? Warehouse will muffle noise and eliminate the need for refrigerated trucks on site. Analysis. During the department's public hearing, the project manager, Mr. Khalil Henley, testified the applicant wishes to develop within 12 months a warehouse building containing two bays and two employee housing units. One bay will be used for general warehouse storage purposes, and the second bay will be used as an automotive mechanical space with associated office. The employee housing units would be two bedrooms each with, with laundry facilities on site. The requested C commercial zoning was intended for light industrial slash manufacturing uses to be located away from the central business districts that cater to pedestrians, tourists, and does not permit residential use. It permits over 200 uses 
some recognized as potential detriments to dominantly residential neighborhoods. The estate pastory area has had eight rezoning attempts with three granted and one of those for non-residential purposes, B2 zoning. The B2 was granted in 1988 to a property approximately 1,000 feet away. The number of attempts does not indicate the area is changing from primarily residential. Thus, the department is not inclined to recommend a rezoning. It is determined that use variances would allow for the requested uses. However, limited by the development provisions of the current R2 zoning. Example, maximum of two dwelling units, maximum lot occupancy of 30%, maximum height of two stories, and minimum setbacks of 15 feet in the front and 10 feet on all other sites. Recommendation. The Department of Planning and Natural Resources recommends that parcel number 5-O Estate Pastry, number 5 Cruz Bay Quarter St. John, be granted use variances to allow for automobiles and motorcycles, motor tune-up and repair work, mechanical, and warehouse and storage services, general, with the following conditions. One. No mechanical or other types of repairs shall occur outside of the warehouse building. And two, a buffer of opaque fencing, wall, or green hedges approximately seven feet to eight feet high shall be installed to address impacts to adjacent residentially zoned properties that may be developed in the future. Signed by Keith Richards, Assistant Commissioner, Dated October 27, 2020. Second report on petition to amend official zoning map number SJZ-3. Application number ZAJ-20-5. Petition of Animal Care Center of St. John, Inc. Requesting that parcel number 14 remainder, Estate Carolina, number one Cora Bay Quarter, St. John, be rezoned from R2, residential low density, one and two family, to B2, business secondary neighborhood. Project profile, owner slash applicant. Animal Care Center of St. John, Inc., as per warranty deed dated February 23, 2017. Document number 2017, 001980. Parcel number 14, remainder estate Carolina, consists of 2.309 acres as shown on drawing number D9 6941 T001. Current use the property is vacant. Proposed use an animal care center, kennels for dogs and cats. 20 and 19 respectively, veterinarian's office, classroom for outreach slash trainings slash meetings, one bedroom employee housing unit, children's playground and walking trail. Surrounding uses, zones. To the north is undeveloped property. To the east is the Moravian church property proposed for a marina. To the south is Pickles Restaurant. To the west is commercially developed property, former gas station, now a market. The surrounding area is zoned R2, B2, and W1 Waterfront Pleasure. Infrastructure. Water needs will be supplied by cistern and wastewater will be handled by an aerobic treatment unit. Public response. At DPNR's public hearing held October 2, 2020, 56 individuals attended and 26 registered their support for the application. 72 emails slash letters were also received prior to and subsequent to the public hearing. 27 in opposition to the application, 38 in support, five expressing concerns, 
a support petition with over 500 signatures, 150 plus were residents, and an opposition petition from 18 property owners. The following were expressed as reasons for opposition and concerns with the application. One, noise from barking dogs. Some individuals requested the addition of specific noise abatement requirements slash sound mitigation slash shielding slash screening with high natural screens such as bamboo, trees, hedges, and or vines on fences. Two, high concentration of wildlife in areas that could trigger dogs barking. Three, barrier walls can only reduce noise level if they are tall enough to break line of sight from origin to receiver. Concrete is known for poor acoustic performance. Its rigidity causes noise to increase upon impact. Four, will architects guarantee noise not disturb villa renters? Architect and shelter to provide bond to cover relocation costs if noise not contained? Five, location is a high priority issue. Will there be any recourse mitigation if promises of a soundproof kennel is not realized? Six, land in question is at base of a natural amphitheater slash theater shaped semicircle, which projects sounds upward and bounces them back and forth over valley walls. Seven, has the sound survey been done? Request acoustical engineer or other expert do an estimate of area believed will be affected due to topography and winds. Eight, impact of barking on residents and tourist quality of life, mental well-being, health. Noise pollution causes stress and other adverse health effects. Elevated environmental noise can cause hearing impairment, hypertension, heart disease, and sleep disturbances. Nine, survival of nearby businesses with presence of barking dogs slash negative economic impacts. Impact of dog smells on Pickles Restaurant and patrons. 10, will this impact the summer's end marina, Caliche Point on Bordeaux Mountain, Villas? 11, more than 25 vacation rentals will be affected. 12, Coral Bay community's main draw for residents and vacationers is it is peaceful slash quiet. 13, negative impact on hospitality industry, which is already struggling, could hurt economy of this area and diminish property values. 14, noise abatement plans seem unrealistic slash unattainable. The plans as they exist do not address the issue of noise in a significant way. 15, waste disposal. 16, site is in a floodplain, zones A and AE, building in floodplain in time of sea level rise and climate change. 17, increased health risk from an impaired body of water. 18, environmental impacts. 19, would proposal improve or worsen current feral cat population in Coral Bay? 20. Majority of those in favor do not live in Coral Bay Valley, so not concerned with noise. Do not realize how many people will be affected. 21. Music played at Pickles could be heard up the hill. 22. No way proposed location and its kennels would not disturb the peace. 23, is it worth discussing land swap in another location? 24, will there be windows in kennels? Will they be closed, air conditioned? 25, lots of better places for an outside dog kennel. 26, will outdoor dog run have a roof? 27, once rezoned, no way to stop Influence project. 
28. St. John is not best place to raise dogs. Not supportive of larger operations in proposed location. 29. Why requested B2 when does not allow dog kennels? Why not commercial, industrial, or variants? 30. Backup electrical power plan? 31. Would property owner agree to no further subdivision to retain open space? The following were expressed as reasons for support and response to the concerns above. One, the animal care center's request is critical to the future of animal control, mentoring husbandry to use, and developing means of becoming financially self-supporting in the future. Two, the Animal Care Center, ACC, has worked with the Department of Agriculture to manage slash control feral and abused animals of St. John. Three, ACC is only entity responsible for the feral and abused animals on St. John. Four, ACC's primary feral cat program includes feeding stations and trapping of cats for neutering. Five, ACC was responsible for air evacuation prior to and after the 2017 storms. Six, location well suited for proposed usage. Seven, Coral Bay location no more noisy than general traffic and surrounding, sorry, seven, Cruise Bay location no more noisy than general traffic and surrounding businesses. Eight, property large enough to mitigate noise and sanitary issues. Nine, shelters and boarding kennels have mitigated sounds of barking dogs worldwide. Technology exists, is available and widespread. 10, not a great amount of land zoned for business or commercial uses on St. John. 11, another area suggested but it's difficult to find another comparable property on St. John at same price. Little land of this type on St. John and even less with relatively level terrain. 12, current zoning would allow significant residential development, a source of significant noise. 13, noise can be mitigated. ACC proposes both perimeter walls with sound absorbing materials and landscape buffering to further mitigate slash absorb noise. 14, dogs shall be kept inside at night. 15, ACC currently self-sufficient on solar power and continue to do same to provide air conditioning to indoor areas. 16, B2 suggested since adjacent parcels have same zoning and the zone does allow animals, hospitals, and clinics. Surrounding parcels are used commercially. 17, ACC plans no further subdivision. Analysis. During the department's public hearing, Mr. Michael Milner, Mr. Ryan Moore, and Ms. Jessica Palmer testified on behalf of the Animal Care Center of St. John, Inc. The proposed use will be developed in one phase, taking less than a year, and consisting of one building with a maximum of two stories, developed on the highest point of the property due to flooding. Regarding the environmental concerns, the Animal Care Center, ACC, would have to meet the various permitting agencies' requirements and standards for environmental health and safety prior to commencing construction, namely coastal zone management, environmental protection, and building permits, floodplain management. Federal flood insurance is required for all buildings in mapped flood zones shown on FEMA maps if they are financed by federally backed loans or mortgages. All elevations to the building should be met to avoid future events related to flooding. Most of the site will be undeveloped for stormwater retention. A playground slash walking trail could go in the undeveloped area so as not to disturb stormwater retention. 
The applicant petitioned for the rezoning as there has been an increased need for their services, especially in the Coral Bay area. They plan to move from their current undersized facility to a more updated facility, closer to where many of the animals come from. Design-wise, the kennels will be indoors and dogs will be spaced with walls in the middle of kennels, so no interaction and thus agitation slash noise would not occur between dogs. The dogs would be inside from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. A certified company will be hired that specializes in soundproofing shelters and an employee will live on site to immediately address any disturbances. At a minimum, indoor noise will be mitigated with use of wall insulated panels and installation of rubber panels on walls, floor, roof, and deck. Outdoor noise will be minimized by filling in the concrete front walls with sand and adding noise buffers, such as a perimeter wall. The department recognizes the importance of the petition and, and believes a balance with the surrounding residences and vacation rentals can be found. The department is not inclined to recommend a rezoning, but rather use variances with conditions that can be fulfilled with the acquisition of coastal zone and building permits. Recommendation. The Department of Planning and Natural Resources recommends that parcel number 14, Remainder Estate, Carolina, number one, Coral Bay Quarter, St. John, be granted use variances to allow for animals, boarding kennels, clinic office, hospital veterinary, shelter pound, and playgrounds with the following conditions. One, noise survey shall be conducted prior to the builder permit application submission to determine the area that may be impacted by noise. Two, noise proof building walls and ceilings shall be designed and developed based on results of noise survey. Three, no outdoor kennels allowed. Signed by Keith Richards, Assistant Commissioner, dated December 3, 2020. And that concludes the department's testimony on those two petitions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Leah Laplace Matthew. At this time, uh, we'll hear from uh, the representative, Mr. Llewellyn Asua, or your representative, you recognize. Uh, morning, my name is Khalil Henley. I'll be presenting on behalf of Virgin Developers. Let's, let's get to your first name again, please. My name is Khalil Henley. Khalil. I'll, be re I'll be presenting on behalf of Virgin Developers and issue requests that parcel 5, that show pass street, number 5, Cruz Bay Quarter, St. John B. Rezone from R2. Residential low density one and two family to C commercial. Very well. You recognize for your testimony at this time. I have a presentation. Very well. Okay. Okay. Um, the lot is located. The lot is located on Saint John to the far bottom. You can see there's a dot that shows the location. In the middle, there is a. In the middle, there's a conceptual design plan. Uh, up to the top left-hand side, there's a, a conceptual rendering of how the building is supposed to look. Um, the location, the location of the lot is, um, I don't know if anybody know where the, the old bus stop is in Pastry, in the Pastry area. There's an old bus stop. Uh, the lot is like right there on the south side of it. Um, current property and surroundings. On the north side of the property, there's a center line road. And across the street, there's a, a, a small church. On the west side of the property, there's barren land. On the south side of the property, there's barren land. On the east side of the property, there's untouched land as well. Uh, there's a church approximately 40 feet away from from the property on the north side. 
Board of Developers, LSC is requesting that parcel five that show pass street number five, Cruiseway Quarter, St. John, USVI be rezoned from R2 low density to, to C commercial. The purpose of this request is to allow for construction of a warehouse building for equipment and material storage. The property estate fire that show pass street, St. John, has excavation currently in process for a retaining wall for the parking area. There are two main rental units for overseas mechanic, mechanical operators. The property was on touch land. We are proposing rezoning to construct a warehouse and a living quarter. The dwellings will be 1,500 square feet with amenities. There are two home sites per phase. This will be a multi-phase development warehouse building and living quarter. There are no guts on or through the property. There are no endangered plants or animals on this property. There will be 15 proposed parking spaces along the, the loading area. The size of the lot is an acre and, and two thirds. The dwelling units will be incorporated within the building. There are no cultural, historical resources found on the property. Here's a, here's a, here's a, um, a drone shot of the property in question. This, this view is facing, facing west. View here is facing, facing north side or center line road. This, this, this drone shot would take. You, you're starting to break up, Mr. Henley. You're starting to break up. This, um, this, 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 this zone, in, this zone view is taken during the first phase of the excavation. Mr. Henley, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. You guys can see the drone shot? Yes. OK, all right. This view shows a clearer view of the front side showing the road. And um, right now, the bus stop is being built back by Mr. Sewell. So that's the extent of the um, an estimation during the the proposed property pass three five dash O Cruise Bay Quarter St. John USVI. The property number is 3060040610000. It's being sought before to compose a warehouse rental property. This project timeline is estimated at 12 months with a $250,000 budget. There will be two buildings, two stories, 24 foot high. The building will be at least 24 feet high. And this project will will only need one phase to complete. There will be five employees working from the hours at eight to five. That concludes my presentation. Very well, thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Henley. Anyone else will be testifying um, in regards to that particular request? If not, we'll move on to Ms. Jessica Palmer or Mr. Michael Maleni. Good afternoon. This is Michael Milne from Barefoot Design on behalf of the Animal Care Center. Uh, don't seem to be able to get my camera to work. So I will uh, try to work without it. 
Um, we have um, a proposal for an animal care center. Uh, I'm probably getting some feedback. Um, that uh, proposes to have uh, kennels for cats and dogs um, at that area, a uh, classroom area, and a small residence apartment uh, for a caretaker that would stay overnight. The property is located in Coral Bay. Um, I don't know if you've, let me see if I can bring up the. Mr. Milne, we will need your camera on um, while you testify. Um, look at in Coral Bay property is 14 dash remainder. Uh, it is uh, north of Pickles, Ms. if anyone Mr. knows Milne, that area. Mr. Milne, we will need your camera on. Uh, we have the Raven um, Church property, a Raven Church property to the north. Mr. Milne. Um, and then commercial property uh, that had gas stations and a, um, a market area, uh, zone B2. The intent is to build a small building, mostly Mr. Milne. Uh, one story, small section is two story. With a we parking need, area we'll need your in camera the on. corner of the property. Majority of the property would be undeveloped um, and be right used now. for playground and uh, walking and recreational facilities. We've coordinated with the... Um, yeah, we will need to stand in recess. Um, we have to have his camera on and, and he will have to be attentive. I, I don't think he can hear you because he's using two different um, screens. That's, that's not going to work. Been some misunderstanding the, the committee will stand in recess for two minutes. Until we can straighten that out.
we're out of recess. Uh, we go back to Mr. Milne. Um, at this time, you're recognized for your continued testimony. Mr. Milne, you are in, you're obviously on mute because um, I can see your lips moving, but I can't hear. Can you on? hear me now? All right. Good. All right. Um, I apologize for my inexperience uh, with teams. Um, ACC, the Animal Care Center of St. John, is a com uh, community-based group of volunteers and staff that have been serving St. John for many years, um, helping uh, dogs and cats and animals that uh, um, don't or cannot speak for themselves and, and need our help. Uh, there are no killed shelter. They find homes for every pet, either on St. John, St. Thomas, or in the States. Uh, they have been supported by the community for many years and um, are finally ready to be able to move out of the very small building that they have uh, into better facilities that um, uh, reflect their dedication to the, the, their purpose. Uh, the existing building is on a very small piece of land with uh, a very small building and open kennels um, in the middle of downtown Cruise Bay and uh, adjacent to uh, a, a little school. And the activity around them um, and the access to the dogs does create barking, and I know that's a great concern for the neighbors and the neighborhood. Um, and that's one of the reasons that this post project has indoor kennels so that the sound won't uh, carry. And I think that's missed in the discussions and, and uh, concerns by uh, people that have written to the uh, legislature about this project. Um, we've already met with acoustical engineers to uh, further reduce their, and re, um, uh, deflect the sound uh, indoors. And uh, the dogs are going to be kept inside during the night. And great care has been taken to um, make sure that these things happen. Um, the property is a, a 2.3 acres um, adjacent to a Pickles uh, in downtown Coral Bay. It's uh, joined by multiple properties that are already B, B2 um, and being used by commercial. I don't think there's any adjoining property that's uh, residential, uh, that's being used residentially. The first floor is uh, for reception, uh, the vet's offices, staff, and uh, for uh, the dog kennels. And then upstairs, we have uh, the cat kennels and uh, an apartment for uh, a staff person to be on site all time. It's a self-supporting uh, building. Solar panels uh, take care of energy needs. Uh, water is collected from the roof and stored in cisterns. Wastewater is treated by an aerobic treatment system on site. We only need electrical and communications uh, to bring the utilities. Uh, the uh, project has been coordinated with Coral Bay Community Council and their stormwater specialists. Uh, we have proposed to keep the majority of the site undeveloped and um, able to assist with stormwater dissipation. We have a goal for putting a playground and a walking trail on the property to bring the community to the center and hope to find uh, cats and dogs a new home. Uh, the majority of the dogs and cats that are uh, found and, and brought to the center are from Coral Bay already. So uh, for years, we've been bringing Coral Bay cats and dogs to Cruise Bay to care for them. We hope to correct these things. Uh, there has been a number of concerns, and um, I think we've addressed those in responses to uh, DPNR and zoning office. And there is also a, a great deal of support for the project uh, by the people that know the uh, ACC and, and care for the animals and dedicated their time and efforts and donations to the project. I know time is short, so I'm going to take questions or if Jessica wants to add anything to that. Yeah. Really? Am I unmuting you? Sure, I can go ahead. Yes, you recognize it. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Palmer. All right. Uh, happy holidays, and I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Uh, I'd like to thank the legislature as a whole 
for providing the time for this hearing and the commitment for gathering during these times. Um, I am Jessica Palmer. I'm the current board president of the Animal Care Center. Uh, I have been a volunteer for at least 10 years with the Animal Care Center. I'm also a veterinary technician um, within the community and um, I help out at the shelter as well. Um, I've been working with Ryan, our manager. He has been there through this entire decade. Uh, he's our longest running employee. He does a great job juggling daily shelter care, community issues, abandoned animals, transports, um, all with the help of this team. And I hope with our experience, you'll be a little confident in the fact that we're a well-rounded group um, with the capability of creating a new shelter a community deserves. Um, we come to you today requesting support for the opportunity to continue to grow and um, hope you guys can help us out. Uh, we started over 20 years ago by a few friends who were helping to help some abandoned animals and now we've grown to a rescue that saves hundreds of animals a year. Um, since 2012, we've helped rescue over 800 dogs and 600 cats in St. John. Our feral cat program has trapped 1,200 free roaming cats and had them spayed and neutered to help cut down on the overpopulation. Um, also, with many of our residents, they're just thankful that they can get out and exercise in this time um, without having to worry about being chased down the road with packs of dogs. Um, it's pretty non-existent in St. John now that we've been here. Um, after the storms, we were a stable resource for the community's needs. Uh, we helped save the lives of lots of animals. We helped owners um, with food, medication, veterinary. Um, we were faced with a massive amount of animals in need of shelter um, because the people didn't have any shelter. So um, my husband and I and Dr. Maria Catlett and Dr. Laura Palmentary took shelter um, for Hurricane Maria in the clinic with over 100 animals in the small um, canines, cats, and critters. Uh, the majority of these animals were for the animal care center, but they were already overflowing. Um, we assisted in the days after by transporting 200 animals stateside, uh, arranging kennels, health certificates, vaccines, um, along with rehoming and reuniting with owners was not a simple task, much less in the aftermath of two storms. Um, we now take part in multiple transports to try to get ahead of that um, issue before storm season arises. And a larger shelter within our community would definitely help um, get those types of things together. Uh, we want more space for community engagement. We have a really, really small shelter right now. We can't have you know, kids come in and, and learn about animal husbandry and training and um, volunteer. It's it's really hard in the tight spaces that we have right now. Um, we're requesting a rezoning or variance of the property. Um, right now, as Michael said, it's surrounded by other businesses and not many residential homes or against the property itself. Um, we've got a contract with the Virgin Islands government through the Department of Agriculture that we've held for a few years now. Um, our services are vital. There's no one to take care of any abandoned animals or um, animals that are neglected um, within the government. They hire us to do so. Um, our tiny shelter exists on government leased land as well. So we pay rent to the government, um, but we're also responsible for all the repairs and the structure is close to probably 30, 40 years old and it's falling apart and we just are in constant need to repair it. The kennels are all outside. Um, they're all made out of con concrete blocks and they're all open to the community. We, within 50 feet, we've got a church, a library, apartments, um, which none of have ever complained of noise in the past, uh, but we definitely would like to be away from um, that in the future and kind of have our own space. Um, 
we've got the help of Michael and um, consultants to help us design a space that will be all indoors um, so we can control the noise, which happens to only really happen at feeding times in the morning and dinner time at night. So um, we hope to have the animals in during those times and only have them out for exercise and play and enrichment um, in, in outdoor spaces and runs. Um, between the hours of five and nine, we'll have them all tucked in uh, with a animal shelter employee living on site to take care of any problems that come up. Um, we've reached out to many consulting firms and we're, we're definitely on top of trying to mitigate our noise um, within the building. Uh, the drawings and plans submitted along with other supporting information is a testament to the fact that the intention is to be an asset to the community, not only with the work we do, but outreach education. Um, because of the in-depth research we have done to construct a property community conscious facility, we feel confident in saying that the only way you know where every in Coral Bay is by the sign and not by barking dogs. So just take a moment to consider the community as a whole in your decision. And thank you for your time and consideration. Very well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Palmer. Um, DPNR, are you have any additional photos uh, to be shown at this time um, in regards to any of the projects uh, being discussed here? At Hi, good afternoon. This is Leah Laplace Matthew. I'll pull up um, what we have on the file. Please give me a moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm about to show a photo of the property. And then I'm gonna open the conceptual. So this shows the location of the property in Coral Bay. This is the site plan. This is the building and the parking, and this is the undeveloped portion. Um, this is the layout of the main floor. And this is the layout of the second floor. And this is the exterior layout. Very well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Laplace Matthew. At this time, I'll open up the floor. Um, I know that there was an individual that wanted to testify, um, I think maybe in opposition uh, to this particular project. Uh, however, they're having some difficulties in being able to get on. So at this time, I'll be opening up the floor to my colleagues and um, for three minutes, 
And Senator Fred Gregory, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to the testifiers. I'm going to start with the <clears throat> Virgin Developers. Do you have the available resources to build out this project, and what is the cost of this overall project? The overall cost of this project is 350000 And how many jobs is this project slated to? At least like five. Five jobs. Okay. Um, DPNR. I, I note that the um, <clears throat> the applicants are requested a commercial zoning. And I also note that there were no um, oppositions to the proposed rezoning. Uh, the property, the surrounding property, were the, uh, the surrounding undeveloped property, were those uh, landowners contacted with regards to this project? <clears throat> DPNR, my time is running. Can you, can you repeat the question? I, I wasn't I'm not sure what the question was. The question is, there is several other surrounding properties where this um, land is being redeveloped or developed. Were those property owners contacted with regards to this uh, petition? Yes, but I'll let Ms. Laplace Matthew respond to that. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Yes, all properties within a 150 foot radius were notified. Okay, so what, what is this? Um, the property said that it is, um, is not in use, but a retaining wall is being built. But there were some concerns that came in after the public hearing that spoke about a <clears throat> refrigerated truck running in the air for 24 hours and um, past construction noise in the residential area. So I'm trying to understand, is there a refrigerated truck currently parked on that property that's running, that's creating uh, issues for the neighboring, um, the neighbors, based on the report that I have here from DPNR? Okay, um, Mr. Chair, I believe that's the property at State Pastory. Um, uh, Mr. Sewer, can you respond to that, the, the yeah. owner? Yeah, there's Hi. no refrigerated truck running 24 hours. Is there a refrigerated have... truck? No. So we, have had, we have had refrigerated trucks maybe run for, you know, half a day or something like that. And that was about it. And then the noise they was talking about was while he was doing construction, it was a hammering, busting the big stones out of the racks. That was a concern then, but no, it's not. We okay, so let's go that. back to the refrigerated trucks because I asked you if you have refrigerated trucks and you said no, but then you referenced and said that they do run for a couple of hours. So which one is it? Well, we have had them in and out in the past running, but not for 24 hours like that, but they have come in, say, the night. What is the then, purpose of the refrigerated yeah, trucks? Say that again? So why are you running refrigerated trucks on a particular property? <clears throat> what happened is uh, we bring them from St. Thomas to the, for the, we transfer them over from St. Thomas, and then we bring it there, and then the next day we take it to the customers. Oh, so it's a whole an area for the for, for your badge operations. Yeah, um, yeah. So are you still doing that? Because clearly it's a issue with the um, neighbors. Well, we we doing that until we get the building put up, so we could have we could plug in the reforts. Okay, so I am confused. 
Uh, let me be clear. Let me make sure that I understand because <coughs> you are you are moving to build out a. Um, I, 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 I'm not seeing it here right now. Uh, a storage area, yeah. and, a, and a, is it a mechanic shop as well? Well, they're gonna be a place where we're gonna store parts for the ferries and stuff like that. Okay, so are you going to be fixing? Well, you can't really fix your ferries there. So you're storing your parts there. Yeah, we're storing parts there. So give me the clear purpose of um, this particular request. What 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 are you? What business are you gonna be conducting there? Well, we're gonna be conducting. We're gonna put our ferry operation business there where we're going to have like spare parts and stuff like that, you know, on our trucks. One or two trucks we're going to have park up in the area. And then we're going to have the warehouse. So when we bring these reforts to St. John, we're going to be able to plug them in and you will not hear any noise. Right now, we don't have the capability to plug them in. Okay, so and once... Some once you have the capability to pro plug them in, the noise will no longer be an issue. That's correct? That's correct. There will not be no noise. We'll be running at WAPA. And are you satisfied with DPNR's um, recommendation for a uh, use variance? Yeah. OK. So what was the reason why you wanted to be commercial, a straight commercial, when um, there are a number of um, <coughs> residential is a, is a residential neighborhood, basically. Why? Uh, that's, we, do, we, wanted, we want to comply. That's why. Okay, so you submitted it not being necessary, so clear as to the differences. No problem. Um, I am all for small businesses, as you know. Um, so any economic development opportunities that we have in the Virgin Islands, I'm all for that. But we also have to make sure that the individuals living in the surrounding areas, they are also um, living, living comfortably in their homes that they've paid for. So we need to make sure that that, you know, us saying yes to this does not impact their um, quality of life. All right, let's go to the Animal Center. So you, you, you are solid and not impacting their quality of life, correct? That's correct. All right. Animal Center. Um, I, I just had one concern. Well, I have a lot of concerns because there's a number of um, opponents around this particular um, rezoning. But let me ask you, you said that you're going to have the animals indoors. Your kennels will be indoors? That is correct. This is Michael Milne from Barefoot. Hello? 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 I, I can answer for him. Um, this is Jessica Palmer. Yes, that's correct. They'll be inside. They'll be inside all day? No. Um, they'll be inside. Uh, then they will have exercise and playtime in our outdoor run area individually, or as you know, one or two dogs. And then um, our employees walk the dogs at least a mile a day, twice a day, um, because the exercise leads to tired dogs, which leads to happy dogs. And then they'll, uh, as they're all rotated around, they'll they'll be um, inside and outside during the day between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And uh, DPNR, based on a number of concerns that were expressed around this particular uh, rezoning, um, are you satisfied with the responsive or the mitigating measures to address the concerns? <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. Senator, yes, we are. Um, we believe the um, the standards that we've set for development would address the concerns that the surrounding neighbors and the residents of the community have to this um, type of development. And we believe that if if developed 
with the standards that we have put forward that um, they, 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 this type of development can coexist with the, rest, with the rest of the community. And how many people actually attended the, um, the meeting, the rezoning meeting? Your time has been called, Senator. So, so, so this was a virtual meeting, and I'll have Ms. Laplace respond to Ms. Laplace. Matthew respond to that. All right, good afternoon. So 56 individuals attended. Okay. My time has been called. I apologize, Mr. Chair, because I didn't hear time. Thank you for your responses. Thank you very much, Senator Fred Gregory. Senator Thomas, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to let you know that uh, Public Affairs is doing a great job because I heard time from all the way in St. Thomas. Anyhow, um, moving forward, uh, the Animal Care Center must be doing something, right? Because they have received the support of the Coral Bay Community Council, who don't really support nothing, but they're supporting this kennel. Um, Kudos to the developers, the planners, and the care centers for what they do as they are doing things well. But let me go to pass three for the, to the Love City Car Ferries um, project. Um, a very, very full, detailed explanation of, of your drawings. And uh, either Mr. Henley or Mr. Sewer. I see you have like four or five bay doors on the facility. These are for housing and charging uh, items like the refrigerated um, trailers. That's what you said before? I just want to be clear. Yeah. That's what they for, they okay. for housing. That's correct. Excellent. And, and what this does is take the noise complaint that was mentioned before and it's moving in indoors for that consideration to, to ensure that we minimize uh, any, any hindrance, any noise pollution to our neighbors in the, in the general area. Um, yeah. I know, Mr. Sewer, you have um, Love City Car Ferries. My question is, do you or are you in contact with anyone else with any property um, more seaward or closer to an area where you would be able to easier service and store your supplies and parts, etc.? For right now, this is the only place we got available for right now. Excellent. Now, let me ask you, the the drawing takes up how much uh, acreage on the property? And the second part of that question is, what's the total acreage to that property? Um, Mr. Khalid will have to tell you the exact amount. Of 30 seconds. The total acreage for the property is 1.23 acres. And, and the uh, facility takes up how for, much? For the building is 7,120 square feet. Uh, my question is, um, in the letter submitted by Mr. Sewer, he's saying storage. And I know storage is, is uh, much needed on St. John, just like pretty much everywhere else. I was wondering if there are future plans where the remainder Time. of the property could be um, developed to where you have uh, facilities where people could rent storage units or anything like that. Just a quick question to Mr. Sure. Yeah, that, that's the ultimate goal, you know, but right now we like to start with the first phase of it and then move forward, you know, in the future. Excellent. Well, I, I, I love the plans, Mr. Sua. I, I hope that uh, you are able to develop this professionally designed and well thought out plan to serve your business and the community. And I hope you also receive success as you move forward with other plans developing the storage units or whatever. My time has been called. Thank you very much for the time, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Thomas. As I discussed earlier, there was an individual that had contacted us 
in regards to testifying, and I think maybe as opposition to the Animal Center uh, proposal, at this time I'll allow for that person to speak for uh, three minutes to put the testimony on the record so that he could also be queried uh, from my colleagues as we continue to deliberate on this particular request. So, uh, Mr. William Tiss, uh, you're recognized for your testimony at this time. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Thomas. I apologize if my video feed is uh, not working. So if I might proceed uh, just with the audio. Um, I'm sorry, no, we require for you to at least um, have your camera on um, while testifying. Sure. sure. Um, All right, I, I believe I am now on video. Very well, you may proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have been a resident of the Coral Bay area uh, for 11 years. Uh, my home is at 45 Carolina. It's the first house on Route 108, and it is in reasonably close proximity to the proposed animal care center. Uh, when we are not on property, we have been renting out the property via Airbnb, and it has been quite successful in allowing me to maintain the home and uh, pay the mortgage, et cetera. Most of the reviews we get, which are all positive, we have a 5.0 rating. Uh, we probably have between 50 and 100 uh, uh, comments from guests most of them say we love Coral Bay because it's quiet, it's peaceful, it's a departure from the busyness of Cruise Bay. And I know from my time there that all sound carries up that value, that valley very, very well. And to have the proposed animal care center with the number of potential dogs barking, especially late at night, I believe that would very negatively affect uh, my ability to rent that property going forward. And as much respect as I have for the animal care center, because both of my dogs were rescue dogs and I love them, uh, I just feel like this is, this is not a, a wise move in terms of the neighborhood, in terms of restaurants and bars being able to uh, be open at night without having that distraction and having guests. Once I have a few negative comments on Airbnb, I can never recover that. And, and uh, once that's gone, I have no ability to rent. So that's, I appreciate your taking the time to listen to me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tiss. Um, we'll resume the line of question at this time. Uh, Senator DeGraff, are you there? Uh, Senator Benta, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to go to the, the Mr. Tess, I think, and to the members of the, the kennel, as far as the infraction that Mr. Tess is referring to, have you guys met? Have there been a discussion to see what can be the impasse for this, if possible? Well, we, we did have our DPNR meeting, and, and we are aware of all the concerns of the community. Um, basically, what we're doing right now is just uh, an initial phase in our, our building of the shelter. So we really just need to get our um, get our things together. The property is completely ransacked from both of the storms. We bought it prior to the storms. It was ransacked. Um, we can barely access it. There's there were huge trees. They're everywhere. Um, so in order to even get in there and do any type of environmental surveys or any type of work, this is our first step. So um, Good. Well, thank you for that. We're, yes, we're, we're applying for this and, um, and, and yeah, we're, we're aware of the concerns. And as far as Ms. Mr. Tist, um, you know, our animals, they're, they're, they're gonna sleep at night. We tire them out during the day. We'll have an employee on site and um, at, to take care of any issues that come, come up. And to the, the animal shelter, where, where, these animals, where do you collect them from? How far apart? Um, mm -hmm. 
call uh, the area from one end of the there. island to the other. But um, a, a majority of them do come from Coral Bay, where you can find barking dogs that bark all night long. And I think this is what um, uh, a lot of the community is concerned about that will our dogs will do. But these dogs are dogs that we get calls about. We go out, they're tied up way too tight to a tree with no water. They're hungry. You know, they're not happy. Okay, I wanna thank you for what you do. I really do. I really appreciate that. Turn them loose. If the, for you to turn them loose right now, I, I guess they'll create more of a, a issue in the area. Uh, Mr. Tess, uh, I'm an open-minded person, and I am looking at it in another way as well. I'm looking at, I've, I've seen several shelters throughout the mainland and how they're structured. Uh, Mr. Chief, I may? And what I've seen is if I'm looking at the plans correctly, this looks like a state-of-the-art facility as well. And I uh, understand the acreage is two miles in between, two acres, or acreage is two acres in between each other, I would think. Uh, to DPNR, what would be the remedy for this impasse between both uh, Mr. Tess and the facility for the animal shelter? Sorry. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Benta. Good afternoon. Um, so after we conducted our public hearing and we heard from the um, community members that support the project and those that oppose the project, we believe that the, um, <clears throat> the recommendation that we have given um, saw it as a good middle ground. Um, there are standards that the animal shelter will have to meet if the project is to be fully permitted, including coastal zone management, building permits, environmental health. And uh, so if all those conditions are met, we believe, again, that the animal shelter can coexist with the community. Uh, so that is the balance that we are trying to strike as it relates to uh, the proposed development. And as you are aware, St. John, overall is challenged by land, um, two thirds of the land being under the um, National Park Service. And so this is a challenge all the way around, uh, but we believe that this site can be developed with the conditions to support the, the um, what the animal shelter meets and, and what the animal shelter provides for the community at the same time coexist with the rest of the, the development in the area. Yeah, thank you for that, Mr. Richards. And as far as to the, the, oh, the host of the animal shelter or the well care of, of those three animals who've been abandoned in most instances, what would be the mechanism for the waste? Is it by sewer or discarding uh, otherwise? Are you using a sewer system? Uh, we're going to have a, a treatment facility a treatment for facility. it. Okay, thank you. And I do hope that with DPNR, with Mr. Tess, and of course, members of the Animal Shelter, that for the committee of a well, session, that we know more or less whether or not there's been an impasse along the way. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Benta. Uh, Senator, how do you recognize for your three minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, greetings to the testifiers. Um, Ms. Palmer, I'd like to share with you that I am an animal lover. I actually grew up with um, dogs, German shepherds, uh, were the first um, dogs that we had in our home. Um, actually house trained them as well. Um, did a very good job. I just visited my mom, and my mom has a pit bull in Orlando that's actually house trained. And when that animal wants to um, go outside or handle its business, it'll come to you and actually bark, you know, and let you know it's time to go out. Um, but at the same time, even for myself, living here in the territory, we definitely have challenges, um, challenges on the government side with spot zoning, um, especially with recreating businesses and entities in our residential areas. Um, understand that the property is already paid for and purchased. Um, but just for the area in general, and I've been in Coral Bay on, a, on numerous occasions, um, 
it's going to be a challenge. Um, and this is something that we're going to have to ultimately make a decision on. Um, so the question that I have is, did you at any time consider trying to build a facility on agricultural land versus, or purchase property on, or lease governmental land, agriculture versus uh, residential? Uh, right now, we are on government property, smack dab in the um, middle of Cruz Bay. Um, and uh, so we're, we're renting that land for $500, uh, I believe, something around 500 a month. Um, and with the facility itself being uh, our responsibility. Uh, but as far as agricultural land goes, this is about as close as it gets here on St. John. It's flat. Um, we looked at other properties, which were a lot closer to neighborhoods, um, and it doesn't exist here anymore. There's just not much left. Yes, I know there's one location where, where there's a very small plot that's designated as agricultural, and uh, some of the, I think, on that same era in St. John, on an annual basis, the Coral Bay Community Council usually has a fair in that general area. But um, I really don't have any more questions to ask, um, but um, the intent is definitely good. Um, but there's going to be a number of challenges, especially when we consider um, just the overall infrastructure and the territory not having a um, land and water use plan. Okay, well, thank you for the time, and thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Hyde. The Senator Chair will recognize Senator Payne. You recognize Senator for three Payne. minutes. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me arrange the record time is short. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Sewer, if I may start with y'all, they are definitely staunch business owners who have operated businesses on St. John for more than 20 plus years. They provide gainful employment for many young persons um, annually and not just with entry level positions in their respective companies. They own and operate Love City Car Ferries, a ferry company that has been providing reliable service moving commerce and people safe between St. John and St. Thomas for years. They've assisted with moving water personnel, stateside linemen and companies, National Guard, trash haulers, FEMA personnel, and many other companies after the hurricanes. And these guys run seven days a week. They actually need a place to call home where they can store valuable materials that they need to function on a daily basis. They'll finally, they'll do this, um, rezoning will actually give them a home to tune up and work on their tractors and other machines and store parts for their barges. If a barge or ferry company does not have a place to store parts, they have to wait until a part breaks, take the barge off of the schedule, order the part, wait for the part to come, and then change it out. This costs the companies thousands of dollars. But if they have a home on the area where they can store parts that routinely break, they can be up and running in a matter of a day or two. They are also working on creating um, a retaining wall made out of stonework. And they are also going to work on placing palm trees and trees with hedges that create, um, that additionally going to beautify the entire area and add to the aesthetics of the area. So I'm asking my colleagues at the appropriate time to please support Mr. and Mrs. Sua. Now on to the dark situation or the kennel situation on St. John. Ms. Palmer, well before I get to Ms. Palmer, um, and I must say this, I find it kind of strange that the Colorado Community Council supports this endeavor. There was another situation recently in Johns Valley with dogs that it totally opposed. We've even brought bills before the community before the, to, 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 to pr protect children that they have opposed. So I'm like really shocked that they actually are in support of this. But for almost about a year to date, I've been attempting to mediate a situation in Johns Valley relative to barking dogs at a residence. 
I was able to make contact with the property owner who had 16 dogs on the property. The owner stated that the dog used to bark at times and donkeys and they entered the property and are passed okay. close to the property. Mr. President, Mr. Chair, please. The you neighbors reported on some days, thank you. The, the neighbors reported on some days the dogs bark what seemed to be more than 10 hours nonstop. I even reached out to the animal shelter and the vets on St. John who were extremely helpful in checking on the health of the dogs while adopting several of the animals. So I know how important this is to them. The individual who he, he has four remaining dogs, but the resident, the neighbors, still complain about the dog, but about the dogs barking. I also received a whole bunch of emails from Corey residents who reside in the area who have stated that they love animals and they love what the animal shelter does. However, they do not believe this is an ideal location for an animal shelter. And we can all agree that dogs bark, whether they are happy, excited, they see cars, birds, donkeys, or people. You really can't stop dogs from barking. And I don't believe that the animal shelter wants to build a facility where it is completely soundproof and where the dogs never go outside. So, Ms. Pommel, may I ask you, it is your intentions to have this facility completely soundproof where the dogs never come outside, so this way they don't have a chance to bark and disturb the neighborhoods? No, definitely not. Um, you know, they, we wouldn't want to be stuck inside the entire time. So um, if you're ever in town watching the dogs going for a walk, um, they're not really barking at anybody. They're just happy to be out. They they take that, that moment to, to enjoy. And, um, you know, it, it, we keep our dogs well-fed, well-exercised. Of course they'll bark. They bark when they're happy. But um, it's not going to be a, a, a constant bark of a, a suffering animal in need, which I think um, is is what tends to to um, where these complaints come from, where they where they come from. So I, okay. you know, I definitely are. They're not going to be inside twenty four seven. Okay, and lastly, um, how familiar are you with that area that you're proposing to, that you're proposing to build animal shelter in? Would you say that it is a relatively quiet and serene area? I, I don't believe it's quiet and serene all the time. Where you've got Island Oasis, they they play their music. Um, they we also got um, Aqua Bistro who plays their music. Skinny Lakes, um, all of which are, are pretty close proximity. Um, so you've got nighttime noise coming coming around, and then uh, during the day, um, the major trucks that are coming down that road slamming on their air brakes and uh, construction throughout Coral Bay, because that'll never stop. Um, you know, it's it's not a completely quiet area. Okay, and lastly, um, if you lived in that area, a quiet area, and your neighbor wanted to build uh, a fowl coop and raise roosters, um, and it was a quiet area, would you oppose something like that? Thank you for the time, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Payne. Uh, next, we'll go to Senator Viale. You recognize your three minutes. Mr. President, I don't think she got a chance to answer the question. Ms. Palmer, you had a response uh, for the senator? Sure. Go ahead. You may proceed. Sure. Sorry. Um, As well, yeah. I, I live <laughs> near multiple um, <laughs> coops full of roosters on this island uh, my 10 years. Um, a lot of the time, you just get used to it, and it blends in with the back. But uh, you know, a, a, a chicken coop uh, with with chicken wire on, you know, surrounded by uh, you know particle board and things. How they're usually built here? That's a little different than what we're trying to build. We're trying to build something um, with a lot more, uh, you know, stateside shelter research uh, with big animals that are. Uh, you know, big, large numbers of animals that we're trying to to find some shelter for. Senator Viela, you're recognized for your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. St. John has limited Jan. land, and um, we have had the opportunity to discuss a number of business propositions for St. John. 
And um, these two are needed. I know that we need an animal shelter in that particular area, and uh, Mr. Sue is trying to expand his capacity to store. Um, my issue is knowing that you have limited land, knowing that you have residential areas that are nearby, are you planning to do everything possible to respect the rights of the citizens or the residents that live in those particular areas? Mr. Sue, what's starting with you? Are you going to make sure that you do everything possible to respect the rights of the residents in that particular area and don't make your site become um, literally littered with, with, with trucks that are no longer operable? Are you going to do everything possible to maintain that area? Yeah, man, I'm going to make it like a first class. It's going to be a first class facility. Okay, and, and there won't be any actual mechanic work going on there? No, no, not really like mechanic, mechanical work. We'll be probably put a truck in the warehouse, service it up, and you know, not like abandoned vehicles and oh, trucks and that. stuff like that. Well, but, but that is mechanic work, right? Um, maintenance, you know, changing oil, not no big, big, big thing. Okay, you're going to make sure that you are able to maintain the present condition of the area. Because I'm looking right across, I looked at the map, and there are a number of homes across. And um, I, too, would not like a mechanic shop to come in my neighborhood or, or um, for the value. It's not going to be a mechanic shop for the public, you know. It's going to be just for our maintenance, our trucks, as all. Okay. Um, animal Shelter, you're going to do your best also to respect the rights of the residents and the individuals that live in the surrounding area in reference to noise, etc. And I'm not talking about the dogs walking outside because they have to walk outside. But in terms of the overnight storage, that the facility will be, will be constructed in such a way that it would minimize the noise. 30 seconds. Absolutely. That'll be part of our, our top priority. And, um, you know, half of the reason we want a larger shelter as well is community outreach. So we want to be part of the Coral Bay community and we want to get part of the St. John community as a whole in into animal care. So it, it helps in the long run, um, you know, and people have a resource if they need something um you know if they're running out of dog food we can donate dog food we can get them veterinary care um this facility is about a lot more than just uh mm -hmm. moving our shelter and do you presently have a facility in cruiseway we do it's right next to the library <laughs> and is it a a shelter also that you have dogs that stay there overnight Yes, absolutely. They're um, out in outdoor kennels um, made out of cinder blocks and uh, fenced in area, have, and the cats are in a small, less than a thousand square foot building. Have you had any complaints? I can't recall any. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Viele. Senator Barnes, you recognize for. Senator Blyden, you're recognized for your three minutes. It's okay. Thank you so much for the time. Good afternoon to the testifiers, and thank you so much for your testimonies. Ms. Palmer, um, I want to um, basically say um, kudos to you and your organization for what you do in terms of um, the abandoned animals in St. John. Uh, is, is applaudable for that. Um, the drying shows that that's a state-of-the-art building for these animals. Um, but me personally, I do not believe that the right location for such a project. Um, I know that when they were trying to build Calabash Boom, Corby Council opposed it. When they were trying to do summer end for several years, they opposed it. I was surprised, honestly, to see that they are, they are um, actually on board with this, which is good for them. Uh, I, I believe that when it comes to animals and, and dogs in particular, I want to say that I myself am an animal lover. Um, there have been so many 
different um com basically opposition in terms of um all of the different um folks that came forward and put their disapproval in writing. Well let me ask um, Mr. Richards, um assistant commissioner, good afternoon. Let me ask you a question because in one of the um your comments you said a noise survey should shall be conducted prior to the building permit application submission to determine the area that may be impacted by the noise. But my question is, um, this zoning request needs to be approved and will be approved or disapproved in short order. So how will that have any bearing on what they should or should not do based on their obligation? Because if it's passed, for instance, they don't have to do anything based on what you're saying. So how does that work, Assistant Commissioner? Or how will that work? Good afternoon. This is Leila Plast Matthew. Um, I have to speak on behalf of the commissioner. His laptop died. So no the insertion of that condition would ensure that any weakness in their conceptual plans would be caught because they are proposing an already noise mitigating indoor kennel. 30 so seconds. it'll be very important to have that condition attached if there's an approval. Thank you for that. I only have 30 seconds. Um, Virgin Developers, Mr. Sewer, congratulations. Um, I've known you for some time in, in the type of work you have been doing and continue to do on behalf of the residents of St. John and your family. Um, let me ask quickly, though, um, in terms of the aesthetics, the, I know you put a, a serious rack retaining wall Time. Um, with that wall, you're putting like palm trees, hedges, etc., to actually upgrade that area in terms of the look. Yes, that's that's what we're doing right now. Actually, we we already start planting palm trees and hedges and build stone wall and stuff like that. And we refer, I redid the the bus stop where I had to, the old bus stop. Uh, you know, I built it out a stone now and I'm beautifying the place. That's one of my main thing is to really beautify the place and a lot of the residents and everybody is happy and you know we don't have no problems and there's no even no, I, I, I personally think it would be a i personally think it would be an upgrade as a matter of fact one, one based on what i've seen and what you're planning to do and finally your um warehouse whereas you're going to be bringing your um equipment to to tune up what have you um in terms of Right now, where where do you service your equipment right now as we speak? Well, we are serviced by another property right now and sometime by the same property where we are right now, too. Because, you know, land in St. John is very limited, you know? I understand. And what the condition on those areas? Well, the condition is good. We keep them clean, you know, stuff like that. Okay, thank you so much. And I wish you the best in your um, endeavor. And thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank, uh, thank, you, you. thank you very much, Senator Blyden. Is Senator Jackson there? No. Senator Barnes, no. you recognize for your th three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to the testifiers. Uh, my, first of all, I would like to commend both of the applicants. I do have some concerns with the kennel, and I'll get to that. But in DPNR, um, Ms. Laplace, I know that the assistant commissioner indicated, as well as the commissioner when he has testified before us, that you are in the process of finalizing the amendments to the zoning code which would be sent down um, to, I, I'm assuming now, the 34th legislature for adoption. My question is, when you are approving or recommending approval via a variance or a rezoning, are you taking into consideration what will be proposed with the new zoning amendments? Good afternoon. Yes, Senator Barnes. Okay, so to the extent of um, just in terms of conformity, you're indicating now that this kennel will be consistent with allowable 
usages or uses um, within that specific area when those amendments are proposed, when the proposed amendments are sent down to the legislature? Yes, Senator. Okay. Now, you also referenced that a noise study um, will be required prior to or as part of the building permit process. What is that? What does that entail? And do we have um, persons certified in the territory to um, develop or conduct that noise study? I... I'm not aware of anyone certified in the territory, but it would be um, like an acoustical engineer who would do the study. Um, they've already designed the, the building to be a noise um, mitigating indoor kennel. So the study would be simply to identify if there's any weaknesses in their proposal to ensure that that's covered and neighbors' concerns are addressed. So in the past, you've, I'm sure this has been a requirement um, in previous applications. And so is there an established criteria for this study? That's the question. What is to determine that the study has integrity? What is the protocol? Well, we've actually not had this type of application before. So this would be the first. So then this requirement for the noise study is somewhat open-ended if, in fact, we may not have the technical expertise and or even a criteria to determine what an acceptable noise study looks like as it relates to this specific development. Time. Correct? So, correct, yes. So okay. this would be basically the first time so it'd be setting the standard for future. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may conclude. And, and that's my concern in terms of the requirement sounds great on paper, but when we come to now practical application, I am not certain that that's a, a, a requirement that the applicant will be able to fulfill or the department would be able to enforce. So that um, is cause for pause. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, testifiers, for your responses. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Barnes. Senator Jackson, you're recognized for your three minutes. Chair, and good afternoon to the testifiers. Uh, from the District of St. Thomas, St. John, Island of St. John. Uh, it would seem that the two requests are pretty much uh, non-controversial and pose no great issue. Uh, uh, as I stated before, uh, when I jumped the gun on mentioning the St. John application, I am concerned with the aesthetic quality of developments in the territory. Case in point, uh, the Smith Bay, at the Smith Bay, the, um, it's gonna come to me in a second. Uh, the corridor um, down from Cassie Hill. So that would be, yeah, you know, starting from the bottom to going to our hotels. Um, that particular area. So these are recent applications to the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. We have abandoned cars uh, for maybe wreckers. We have churches uh, that, you know, are not properly set back with parking accommodations or parking lots. With There's no vegetation introduction. It just begins to look like a third world, and I hate to use this term third world country, but I mean, we, we're moving more and more in that direction. So when I ask with consideration in the aesthetics, I'm not sure that DPNR is doing its due diligence in this regard, and of course the land and water use plan that, that ain't coming in this legislation that, kick, that can kick down to the next 
the um, next one, so I trust that it would happen and then. And we just seem to be repeating the same thing over and over again. So here's a classic case. We had a case in St. Thomas of a zoning change. Uh, then they put in a, um, a mechanic, a diesel mechanic uh, operation uh, into the garage. It was supposed to be a garage. Then it ended up being something else. Then the residents came complaining. And they put the legislature in a real bind. The, rec the recommendations from DPNR is yes, approve it. After the fact, but after people bought their real estate, their lifetime homes, to look down and hear the noise and the, the thing. I have somebody have a dog up by me, and every morning the dog decide he gonna play with he 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 pan. He, he dog food pan, and you would be surprised how much noise that creates. And okay. that's just one dog. So I am not sure uh, how these mix, these conflicts, uh, and the department has said that they have given it thought and they have made their recommendations. And with limited land mass in St. Th Thomas and St. John, we find we're going to have these conflicts and I trust that we will do the right thing and that these projects will be designed for the needs and also to minimize the impact of the development and their uses. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Jackson. Um, if you could just put three minutes on the clock real quickly for me, I'll try to weigh in on these two particular issues. Uh, point of information, Senator Vieli. Hold my, hold so, my time. Thank you so much, Mr. Cheer. I, I, I cringe every time I hear people refer to my beautiful Virgin Islands as third world. Third world means a country that lacks basic human necessities like access to water, shelter, or food for its citizen. It includes a country that has high mortality rates. We need to stop referring to the Virgin Islands as any third world because of issues or specific issues that we need to solve as a people of the Virgin Islands. I'm very offended whenever I hear that statement being made. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you very much, Senator VLA. I, three minutes on the clock for me, please. I supported about both of these measures. And, um, you know, I, I'm just having some difficulties in which I can envision what a indoor animal center or shelter would look like. Um, obviously, I own four Rottweilers at my house, and at, at times, obviously, there's a number of reasons why they start to sound off. Um, it could be a siren that's going that they start to howl. Um, there's sometimes if they see Jumbi, you hear them make noise. Um, there's all kind of reason why um, you know dogs have a tendency to to carry on. So I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to address the issues and. You know, the typical shelter is really a, a, even a, a outdoor when you put the cinder blocks as well as the chain link. Um, that's what I've seen at all of the other animal shelters I've gone to, and I've gone to many of them. So I don't, I'm not sure that we'll be able to accomplish that. Uh, but I support the fact that, you know, DPNR is willing to um, put in place some conditions, you know, whether or not the animal center will be able to adhere to those conditions is what's troubling to me. I think that there is some opportunities for, um, for both to coexist. However, we have to be mindful of re residents that have spent a lot of money on their homes and then have to endure a dog's barking. One dog is bad enough, but when you have them mul uh, multiplied by 10, 15 dogs at any given time, I believe that that's somewhat uncontrollable by any stretch of the imagination. So you know, whatever we could do to address that particular concern, it's something that we need to do. I'm a strong advocate um, for the animal shelter right here um, on St. Croix. And um, you know, I want to make sure that we're always taking care of our animals in the best way possible. Uh, so you know, having a, a shelter because obviously if they don't have a facility that they could go to and be provided with the necessary care, then they become nuisance on our street, they become stray animals, and they could be a, a lot more um, detrimental if we're not able to, to address that. 
Also, the topography in some of um, where we live, uh, if you live in the mountains, in the hill, in the valley, or whatever, again, the sound travel have a tendency to travel more than, than others. So I'm hoping that in DPNR's consideration, as well as the animal shelters, uh, deliberation in, in having an a, a animal center, that in fact they'll take all of those opposition under consideration because it is reasonable and it's understood and, um, and really possible for individuals to, to be impacted by um, dogs barking, especially in the wee hours of the morning, um, you know, becomes a problem. Uh, the other measure that's before us, I intend to support. All I ask is that, you know, whatever conditions have been set and what you have agreed Time. to, that you adhere to that. A lot of times we start out with these um, simple projects and then they spiral out to control and, you know, they're not developing the, in the way and the forms and the policy that um, have been um, agreed upon, so I'm asking that at least there'll be some due consideration by the um, the proponents to make sure that they're able to adhere to whatever DPNR have established, and for DPNR to also to police to make sure that individuals are adhering to those uh, measures. Uh, this concludes uh, this particular round, and what I'll do is allow for a 30 minute, a 30 second wrap up. Point of information. Uh, a 30 second wrap up by each of the. Um, Proponents, point Senator Jackson, please. you recognize your point of information. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't want to deliberate this, but I, I don't like to be misrepresented. And I said I don't like using the word third world, and third world is the underdeveloped nations of the world, especially those with widespread poverty and minority groups within a nation, our predominant culture. What I'm saying is that the landscape of the Virgin Islands is beginning to look and characterize Virgin Islanders themselves as defining their landscape in those terms. And we as legislators and as policymakers have a responsibility, as my colleagues stated, to address those issues. So I meant no offense by using the term, but it's very evident that this is the predominant characteristic that is becoming very prominent in the Virgin Islands. Tack up shack. Um, garbage all over the place, like it's not being collected, and we could go on and on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, th thank you very much, Senator Jackson. At this time, um, uh, Mr. Henley, 30-second uh, wrap-up. Hi, good afternoon. I'd like to say thanks, everyone, uh, on this request for parcel fire that should pass through to, re to be rezoned from R to low density to C. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Sua, you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I would like to thank all of you guys for giving us a chance to make this proposal and, you know, we appreciate everything. And I guarantee you all that I'm going to make the place nice, which I already start making the place Real nice. So, you know, I can I understand your guys' concern too. So, you don't have a problem with that. Very well. Thank you for that. Mr. Tiss? Uh, Senator, thank you for allowing me to speak. And if the Animal Care Center is indeed uh, going to go forward, I will respect that decision and I will donate to that animal center and do everything I can to be a good neighbor. Thank you. Very well, thank you very much. Spirit of cooperation, wonderful. Um, Ms. Palmer? Hi, thank you. Yes, so what I would like to say in closing is we spent about probably a year trying to find an area where we would not bother anyone because we do know we are an animal shelter and we're a building full of animals. So um, we didn't go about this off the whim. Um, and our area that we bought is one of the only commercial, is one of the only residential parcels left in the small area there. Um, just wanted to remind you guys that the kennels will be inside and um, to return the favor to Mr. Tist and we'll be a good neighbor to you as well if this goes through. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Very well, thank you, Mr. Melny.
Very well, he off for Ms. Leah Laplace Matthew or um, Assistant Commissioner Richards. Good afternoon again. And just like to say thank you for allowing um, DPNR to place its recommendations on the record and restating the importance of the conditions that um, we deliberated and analyzed and feel would allow for these uses to coexist with their neighbors. And with the noise study, um, you know, once it's conducted, we'll be able to analyze it against our noise ordinance to ensure that there's no violations. And um, we thank you again. Very well. Uh, thank you very much. At this time, um, those that have concluded, they are free to be dismissed. At this time, Madam Clerk, please call up the number seven item on the agenda with the Virgin Isles Port Authority um, project. Request for approval for disposition, position of the real property by the Virgin Islands Port Authority to the Department of Planning and Natural Resources, parcel numbers EF and 163B, subbase number six, Southside Quarter, St. Thomas. Invited testifier, Honorable John Pierre Oriel, Commissioner, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, Carlton Dow, Executive Director, Virgin Islands Port Authority. Proposed University of the Virgin no, Islands. No, no, we just doing the one. Oh, just the one. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. At this time, um, I guess Assistant Commissioner Richards, you representing uh, the. Commissioner uh, J.P. Orio in, in this particular measure. Assistant Commissioner Richards. Oh, he went out. It's Leah Laplace, Matthew, is, are you representing the commission on this one? Good afternoon. No, the commissioner is here. He'll be presented. Okay. Commissioner J.P. Orio, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. How are you doing? All right. And um, is Executive Director Carlton Dow on the line, or is Mr. Damien Cartwright representing him? Uh, good afternoon, Senator. This is uh, Damien Carter. I'll be representing Executive Director Dow today. Very well. Uh, thank you both for your patience. Uh, Commissioner, you're recognized for your testimony at this time. Um, good afternoon, Senator. Uh, don't have anything formal um, to, to present at this time other than um, this is something that we've been discussing now for a uh, number of visits by the department down to the legislature in terms of the long-term future of the department. Um, we have been seeking a permanent home in order to offset or reduce some of our operating costs. Uh, we were paying a good chunk in rental fees over the years at a number of different locations that DPNR has been housed at. Um, in uh, 2018, we saw an opportunity. Um, we started to go down the path to making that opportunity a reality. Uh, and um, in working with the VI Port Authority for, um, you know, what is more commonly known as the uh, old WAPA building or Parcel F sub base, um, we see an opportunity here to take a structure that is, in fact, a historic structure. Um, and convert it like its sister building just across the tennis courts into functional office spaces for the department and the government of the Virgin Islands. Um, the building in all three stories would afford us approximately the same square footage, so about 26 to 27,000 square feet, um, like we were at the airport facility before that damage took place as a result of Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And um, so we are here now to, to make this a reality and have that property transferred to the department in order for us to now realize our long-term goal of having permanent office spaces in the St. Thomas District 
um, that belongs to the central government. Thank you for the time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. We're here from um, Executive Director, uh, Assistant Executive Director, Mr. Cartwright, momentarily. But how is, can you speak to how is DPNR involved in, in this um, transition of, or transforming of this land from uh, Virgin Islands Port Authority to DPNR? So the, the goal of this, while the Department of Property and Procurement is who is the agency that represents the ownership of the land for the central government, um, the entity that's going to benefit from the use of the building is in fact going to be DPNR. And so um, the transfer of the property is coming to us in lieu of um, past due submerged land rental fees to the department, and we're doing it as an offset uh, uh, for, for both departments um, uh, offsetting debt to one another. And that's with the understanding that, that um, property and procurement being the custodian will also be engaged in this transaction. That is correct. Very well. Um, at this time, we'll hear from Mr. Cartwright, the Assistant Director. Cartwright? Yes, good afternoon, Honorable Senator Nova Lee Francis, President of the 33rd Legislature of the Virgin Islands. All senators present, legislative staff, and the listening and viewing audience. My name is Damian Cartwright. I'm the Assistant Executive Director and Director of Engineering for the Virgin Islands Port Authority, here and after referred to as VIPA. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony regarding the Port Authority's request for legislative approval to dispose of real property to the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Planning and natural resources here and after referred to as DPNR. I am presenting this testimony on behalf of Viper Executive Director Carlton Dow, who fully supports this measure, but unfortunately is unable to testify today due to a prior commitment. The property we seek to dispose of is located at parcels number E, F, and 163-B, subbase number six, south side quarter, St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. According to an appraisal of the property conducted in September 2019, the main parcel is the former Water and Power Authority WAPA building that consists of a three-story structure on 34,537.15 square foot of land zoned for waterfront use. The building is a total of 27,675 square feet and is unoccupied except for one small section on the main floor that is leased by the American Legion Post 90 at the southeastern end of the building. Based on the appraisal, the total value of the property is $911,760. Both Viper and DPNR owe each other substantial outstanding fees. Viper owes DPNR approximately $1,000,000 $1,831,262.47 for outstanding submerged land fees and interest, which include amounts due as of September 30, 2020. DPNR owes Viper a total of $643,755.81 as of September 1, 2017 for outstanding rent and fees owed per the lease agreement executed between Viper and DPNR for office space on the second floor of the Cyril E. King Airport Terminal, SICA. Both Viper and DPNR have reviewed the amounts owed and agree on the final balances due to each respective agency. Viper and DPNR have reached an agreement to resolve the outstanding amounts due via a transfer of real property from Viper to DPNR. The administrative offices of DPNR were destroyed in 2017 during two Category 5 hurricanes that severely damaged the Sika terminal. Viper is the legal owner of parcels number E, F, and 163-B, subbase number 6, south side quarter, and has offered the property to DPNR in exchange for submerged land fees owed to the agency. Viper's Board of Governors 
authorized Executive Director Carlton Dow to enter into an agreement with DPNR at its meeting held on July 22, 2020. FIFA and DPNR subsequently executed a settlement agreement on September 5, 2020. For the agreement, BIPA agrees to transfer and quiet claim the real properties known as parcels number E, parcel F, and parcel 163-B, sub-base at number 6 Southside Quarter, St. Thomas VI, to the USVI Department of Property and Procurement on behalf of DPNR. This transfer and quiet claim will only be effective upon the approval of the legislature of the U.S. Virgin Islands. If the transfer is approved by the legislature, DPNR will credit the value of the real property to Viper's account for outstanding submerged land fees and interest. Viper's account will be deemed paid in full as of the date of the final approval is granted by the governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Per the agreement, Viper will still be responsible for all fees and interest incurred after October 1, 2020. Upon the remission of the outstanding submerged land fees and interest by DPNR, Viper will remit the full amount of outstanding rent and interest to the account of DPNR and the account will be deemed paid in full. The transfer of this property is beneficial to both agencies. It resolves long-standing outstanding debts owed between the two government agencies. It also will provide a permanent business complex for DPNR's administrative offices allowing them to eventually move out of the Charles Turnbull Library, where they have been temporarily operating since the storms in 2017. The businesses located in Crown Bay will benefit from having a long-term government agency located in the district. This is also an ideal arrangement for the Port Authority, which owns the Crown Bay Center and the Austin Bay Monsanto Marine Terminal located directly across from the property as well as other businesses in Crown Bay. Having permanent long-term tenants in the area conforms with Viper's 10 to 20 year master plan to revitalize the Crown Bay district. We plan to build venues and attractions in the area that will appeal to both locals and visitors. The employees of DPNR will provide a steady stream of customers for stores, restaurants, and other attractions that identify residents as their target market. President Francis, I thank you again for the opportunity to present the details regarding the requested property transfer between the Virgin Islands Port Authority and the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. This concludes my testimony and I am willing to answer any questions concerning this matter. Thank you. Oh, very well, thank you very much, um, Assistant Executive Director. Uh, Damien Cartwright. At this time, uh, we'll open up the floor for a round, uh, and I'll do a, a three-minute round. Senator for Gregory, recognize. Senator for Gregory is recognized. My time is running. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And of course, I have a number of questions around this particular issue. Um, I, I, I don't even know if this matter is probably before the legislature at this time, but outside of that, I have a number of questions. DPNR, let me ask you very quickly. I note that in the testimony, there is some $643,000 that's owed. Um, the legislature, we move um, appropriations annually to DPNR. Um, is your any rent included in the appropriations that we move, that we pass on an annual basis? That's one. Yes, Senator. The, the, the debt would be for the rental at the. Uh, I'm just asking about appropriations. The, yes. Just asking about appropriations. Um, so you have not been. What is your annual rent to the Port right Authority? Right now, nothing. Annual rent to the Virgin Islands Port Authority? Zero. What is your rental agreement to the Port Authority? What is your Madam Chair, I, I mean, Senator, I'm not sure if you're hearing me. We do not have any rent to the Port Authority. We do not occupy any space from them. Um, so your previous, so previously, you um, you had a rent of you whatever that rent you were paying to the airport. There's an outstanding amount of six hundred and forty-three thousand, six hundred and forty-five thousand dollars, and annually the legislature appropriates 
I don't know how much that goes towards your rent. So in fact, based on the appropriation levels, DPNR was not paying their rent because um, the Virgin Islands Port Authority has an outstanding debt for submerged land fees. Now, I am aware that these submerged land fees go back to like 38 years old, okay? Some of them, yes, I, I'm, I'm aware, 38 years old. And my issue with this request is the fact that even your creditors, after seven years, did not remove your debt. So if we have two government entities that can't come to some um, amicable solution, and now there is some transfer of, land, of the property over to the GVI, the question that I have for you is, do you have funding to build out this, um, this building? Because I note specifically that the Virgin Islands Port Authority says it's a non-performing asset, and the cost to repair the building and prepare, for it, prepare it for commercial rental use is significant and not commercially, commercially reasonable for Viper at this time. So seconds. where's the funding coming from? Thank you, Senator. So there is a $1.5 million appropriation that has been rolled over since fiscal year 19 in the executive budget. Uh, in addition to that, DPNR secured about $1.2 million from the National Park Service because the property is, in fact, a historic building. And so we have secured a little over $2.5, $2.7 million. Okay. The estimate right now is about a little over $3 million. Okay, so once this property is transferred, this property falls under the central government um, insurance, right? Correct? Yes. So Time. what prevents, and this is for... This is for the Virgin Islands Port Authority, uh, Mr. Cartwright. In your negotiations with the uh, Department of Planning and Natural Resources, what prevented you from negotiating a long-term relationship where uh, uh, the Department of Planning and Natural Resources would not be required to pay you any rent until all of the um, funding that they utilize to do the build out and the outstanding amount is covered and then we can start, we can reset. And I asked this question and I really want an answer. I asked the question because I know that once DPNR owns this building, it falls under the government of the Virgin Islands' um, insurance um, policy. And that insurance policy is never, never able to cover all of the damages that, um, that the territory experiences during uh, natural disasters. However, the Virgin Islands Port Authority is in a way better position to repair that building under their insurance, um, their insurance policy. They can increase their insurance policy or whatever while working out these issues with DPNR. We are having a transfer because a government is owed a debt. A, one, ent one government entity is owing another government entity. How does that sound? How does that sound? All right. Um, thank you for the question, Senator Fred Gregory. Um, in the early discussions, that option did come up, but I think uh, one of the uh, caveats that was tied to the decision that was taken was the fact that I believe the federal funding um, that was being utilized by DPNR, um, if I'm not mistaken, if I recall correctly, um, those monies um, would, would not be available under a long-term lease scenario. I think they wanted to have title to the property before those monies could be invested, um, fee simple. But I just want to say that the Port Authority uh, really Damian, had, no appetite, had no appetite to really um, take, on, take on the repair of that facility because it is historic. Um, it is a significantly wooden structure. Um, there is a significant amount of mold in that particular structure. So right now, given our priorities, um, being able to rehab that facility um, is currently not a top priority for the Port Authority. And having a governmental agency like DPNR come into that um, space basically fits into our long-term strategic plan because it brings 100-plus professional employees on a permanent basis, on a daily basis, into the Crown Bay District. That you use Alma time, Damien. You What's use Alma time. 
I, I am not in favor of this um, proposal. I think that two government entities, and because I, I know my time has been called, two government entities should be able to work this out, and that argument around the federal funds is not a valid argument. Um, there is an appropriation from the, from the Virgin Islands government, and I'm certain that there can be some agreements between the Department of Property and Procurement, the, um, the, the Virgin Islands Port Authority, and this issue where we are having discussions about submerged land fees that's old from since Alexander Farrelly was governor, I think is unacceptable. We should not be having those types of discussions until now. DPNR is inflexible. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Fred Gregory. Uh, next, we'll go to Senator Thomas. You're recognized for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to the professionals testifying before us here today. Um, this could be a great model of how things should move forward. It could be, but it's, it's lacking representation because this transfer should not be from semi-autonomous to government entity. I, I think we have partners missing, OMB, uh, property and procurement. We, we have people missing in the discussion. Even when it comes to the funds owed from one entity to the next, that's just not, I really don't think it, it's a handshake or, or deal that's done across a pool table. I really think this is, should be handled um, in, in a definitely a proper manner. But like the assistant director mentioned, it ha there are a lot of positives for having DPNR centrally located in one building down in Port Authority. You're going to have government employees right across the street would be able to support those businesses and a lot of the entities in the Crown Bay Marina. So they can work well together. We just have to make sure things are done. But what's, what's very important to me is uh, currently um, occupying space in the building uh, you have one, which is the American Legion, and two, we have uh, the St. Thomas All-Star Steel Orchestra. And Mr. Cartwright, uh, Assistant Director Cartwright, in your testimony, I heard no mention of the steel band. So you're telling me that they have zero lease or anything official with the Port Authority? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. The only active lease we have in that facility is American Legion, and that lease currently expires on March 31st, 2021. Did you ever know of a, any kind of arrangement with the All-Star Steel Orchestra and the Port Authority? Um, I would have to check with property management. I personally am not aware of that, but I'm not saying that there wasn't some concession or arrangement there, but I'm personally not aware of that. Okay, thank you for that. And Commissioner uh, Oriol, I know, as mentioned, it, it's a great idea to have all of your department housed in a singular area, for the most part. Better management, car savings, all of that will, will, will do well. But that cannot happen unless... Um, American Legion and the Steel Orchestra are both removed from the facility. Do you have a plan which accommodates these two fine entities, one being an organization for the most part that, that um, has membership of one retired minute. military personnel, and the next one, a community entity, cultural entity like the Steel Orchestra? So thank you for the question, Senator. So we've actually had two or three meetings with the American Legion Hall regarding their presence on, on the facility. Um, in addition to the main building that we know of, there is a small building about 2,000 square feet on parcel F that is also included as part of this transfer. And so inside of that building, the occupants like the American Legion Hall, and, and today was the first that I'm hearing about the St. Thomas All-Stars, but we've pledged to make space and room and accommodations for the American Legion Hall in that small annex building. We can see what we can do for the St. Thomas All-Stars as well. Um, you know, we were, our intention for the use of that building was really for our larger public hearing type spaces and maybe some training rooms 
um, for training opportunities, we were going to leave it as very a very open floor plan. Uh, in our discussions with the American Legion, we have an idea for what it is they meet for. Um, you know, just need some some uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah, you may continue. And and so we have had meetings with them to uh, to address what their needs would be, um, and and we can accommodate that. So. Um, with respect to the steel pan, I'm, I'm sure a lot of it has to deal with storage and, and placing of equipment. Um, it, again, we can take a look and see how we may or may not be able to uh, to be able to accommodate that. Well, Commissioner, I really, and if I may, Mr. Chair, as I close, Commissioner, I really appreciate you uh, committing to consider the St. Thomas All Stars. Uh, probably the last remaining adult steel orchestra in the Virgin Islands. We, we, we should make some kind of concession for them. The American Legion, I believe, in their lease, a former senator um, had a negotiation where I believe they were getting a dollar per year for their lease. Again, American Legion, uh, these individuals, that, that organization survives basically on dues and from government funding. I am hoping that we could do the same for the steel orchestra, where we could find a facility for them to house their, their equipment and an area to practice for the same cost as this entity as well. A cultural icon in the territory, uh, an outlet that like no other in the territory Need, we need to maintain the band. We need to maintain housing them properly, securely, and affording them some place to practice as well. Thank you very much for the, your answers, gentlemen, Commissioner and Assistant Director. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Thomas. Senator DeGraff is there. Uh, Senator Bento, you recognize. So you have three minutes. Please recognize the mic of Senator Benta. One, two, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Oriol and uh, Mr. Cartwright, the building we are speaking about, well, let's go to DPNR. You plan to demolish and start over or just repair? Mr. Oriol. Uh, Senator, we are going to demolish the interior of the structure. Um, bring it back to its bones. It's it's actually a very sturdy naval barrack facility, um, and uh, for the first two floors, and then the third floor is a wooden structure. But um, there, the bones in, in it are are pretty solid. And but we're demoing the interior. And are you planning to have tenants once you become the landlord? Probably not. It's not currently in our current layout. For the main uh, for the main building, we will be using all of that space as we consolidate a number of the different divisions into one building. My my my, my plea is for the American Legion, if you will. Uh, they've been there engraved in that facility for probably even maybe older than some of us to a certain degree, maybe. But at the end of the day, they're pretty much a landmark, and the displacement of that that well-deserved entity will be something that we need to really focus on as well. I'm really concerned, though, that the intergovernment exchange, rather than starting from the, from the ground up with a brand new facility, what, three point, three point something million dollars, I'm understanding you have? Why, why not venture we have that? A, mm. yes, we sir. have about 2.7, right. and the estimated amount that is, um, that, that we are getting preliminarily right now is about 3.2 to 3.3. And... I don't want to get into the construction phase. I could go into a steel frame outlet into concrete and expansion for weight and so forth and structure to show that it would be cheaper if you do go by your way of a steel building going forward. At $2.7 million for a retrofit of a building that's doing it twice at the same time. So you tear it up to then refurbish it. Now let's talk about the mold issue that existed in the building that go back away. Not just today, but what away. The mitigation for that, you have a plan, respectively. I know you're shelling the inside, but the guts or the structure of it, you plan, what sort of cleaning plans you will have for mitigating that? 
Sure. So uh, again, for the mold issue, there is going to be, uh, you know, the removal of all the sheetrock and and those non-structural dividers. All of that demo is is what we are planning to do. Uh, we want to lay it out to what's most beneficial for our department, and and not necessarily that didn't necessarily align with how it was previously done. Okay. And uh, in addition to that, we have had an environmental. Um, uh, an environmental uh, uh, report that was done just last month. Um, we have gotten what the results are in terms of what we need to mitigate. A lot of that will be mitigated through the demoing when we remove, let's say, the old uh, uh, vinyl uh, tiles and, and uh, those types of things. So we, we will probably be there, there are two aspects now that the architectural and engineering firms say that we need to confirm on the interior of some of the structures before we can f finish the build out. And so that's the portion that we're now going out for additional contractors to, to, to have um, those unknowns uh, realized at this time. And the mitigation, and, uh, the mitigation for the cleaning What's the plan into getting to removing of the black mold out of those buildings, if necessary? Once, you, once you've got it, you still have the wood structure. What's the cleaning mechanism you're going to use to really get into the, the layers and the line of the joints to clean those, those, that, that, those bacteria out of there? Sure. So uh, again, I think that for the, for the pieces that are wooden, uh, then they're to be replaced. Then we remove those, and anything that's still remaining on the base layer of the structure will be cleaned. Um, you know, there are several environmental companies, whether it be Environmental Concepts is the main one in St. Thomas. That's who we went with um, to do some of the work. But there, there are um, the preliminary investigation work. Um, so whatever is necessary to meet our even, you know, as DPNR is the standard for demolition and, and, and um, the regulatory agency for the removal of those things, those plans have to be submitted and in accordance with whatever the EPA requirements are for us to move forward. For the employees. Um, sir, Mr. Chair, sir, sir, Chair, Senator, if I could add to that discussion. Yes. You okay, may, yes. thank you. Um, one thing I want to point out also is that that facility is actually deemed historic. So we, so one of the challenges is, yes, I mean, when you look at the cost, um, it might be cheaper to come in with a brand new structure, demolish that existing structure. But because it is deemed historic, that presents certain unique challenges um, that we have to kind of proceed in this direction in terms of trying our utmost best to rehab that facility as opposed to demolishing the structure and starting anew. For Depending on since you'll be the landlord, the employees, I just wanted to keep in mind that we've done, been down this road before with our employees in, in edifices where eventually many people, because Hi. of refurbishing, have became ill as a result. Just to keep in mind going forward, yes, it's a historical. It's not going to be wind-based. It's going to be air-conditioned. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't want to the time. But for you guys to really focus on that for me, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Benta. Senator Gittins, you're recognized for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to all. Good afternoon, uh, sir. I apologize for my tardiness, but uh, uh, based on the last discussion that we're having, uh, I wouldn't have any qualms of uh, supporting this uh, land transfer. Uh, and speaking to those measures discussed earlier, I had an opportunity to listen to most of the uh, discussions. And I just want to say that, you know, we all know that small businesses uh, certainly contributes to local economies greatly and bring a sense of growth and, and innovation to our small knit communities. Uh, therefore, I wouldn't have a heartburn in, in supporting 
those measures as well. I'm happy, too, that the uh, one for the Millers in Fredericksted uh, has finally come before us, and they're able to see uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not an oncoming train. At the same time, I want to put DPNR on notice the, to get your backs strong. As the 34th legislature commence, we're going to be having uh, some serious conversations, and I urge you all to do some uh, in-depth research on the possible creation of a uh, city planning office. I repeatedly say that, you know, these zonings have no business in the legislature. And I am still firm on that belief and do believe that the Virgin Islands do lack an office of the city planner. That's why we have this headache with all these gas stations popping up here and there all over the place within feet of each other. Uh, also, in closing, Commissioner Oriel, I also want to put you and uh, Dr. Cole on notice that I'll be uh, through whomever the chair is for that uh, committee of responsibility that we need to get a handle on these snakes on St. Croix. I had a personal experience the other day, and it was quite frightening. I have spent 20 plus years in law enforcement and been in the depth of serious incidents that you wouldn't believe and never got scared as I was that night that I saw that beast on the floor near the Fleming Circle in Frederick said uh, in the Lagrange area. So I ask that you all get your information together so that we can uh, have a proper discussion uh, so that this community could know where we're going with regards to these unwanted uh, species in our community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't even expect to take up the whole time, but thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Gittins. Yeah, that snake issue is definitely one that needs some attention. Senator James, you recognized for your three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chair, good afternoon, testifiers. It was made mention that the building was severely damaged due to a fire in 2012. So my question, whatever happened to the insurance proceeds for that building? Can anyone speak to that? Well, I guess that would rest. Senator, thanks for the question. I guess that would rest with the Port Authority as was our facility. I can't speak to exactly um, what happened with those proceeds. I know um, the decision was made not to invest monies to restore that facility, um, to my knowledge. But again, 20, 2012 actually predates me, um, my tenureship at the Port Authority. Um, but that's something that I could probably research and get back to you on. Please do, because since 2012, it's just been sitting there. And it was determined that it should not move forward with our building. And moving forward, now we're saying we want to move forward with the building. So I'm, I'm very interested in learning what happened with those insurance proceeds. Well, my question, though, once we do the swap, will the building now belongs to the individuals you're swapping it with? Uh, yes. So, they would so in essence, it would be property and procurement technically as they um, take ownership of all of the central government's properties, to my knowledge. And obviously, DPNR would be the beneficiary of that. Awesome. I'm happy to know that they will be settling this outstanding balance that have been here for quite some time, but who came up with this brilliant idea and how long have you guys been in negotiations to reach to, to this? 
Um, I guess, Senator, it, it first came up in 2018 uh, when the department was evaluating areas for a future office building. Um, it was after there was it was really boiling down to two locations. Uh, Senator Benta mentioned, you know, creating something new from scratch with the steel frame. Um, we actually looked at the old submarine repair building that's right next door to the Niski Center as one of the options. Um, the cost was going to be around two and a half million dollars, but significantly less space than what the WAPA building afforded us. And so in August of 2018, former Commissioner Henry uh, asked former Executive Director Mapp uh, if they would be willing to consider it. Um, and they said, yes, they would be willing to consider it. And then in January of last year, uh, I sent a request to uh, Damien when he was the acting Executive Director for us to sit down and, and start to to hammer out some of the details and see whether or not this would be possible. Thank you so much for the explanation. So just to, get, to make it clear, they will not be considered as tenants, they'll be considered as property owners once this is initiated by this body, right? Can you repeat right. the question for me, please, Senator? I'm saying that once there's a swap with this, for this building, they will no longer be, they will not be considered tenants, they'll be considered owners, of course, under property and procurement, correct? That correct. is correct. Okay, thank you. Now, my question is, it was made mention that it's, in a, it's a historic building, so as far as being able to maintain the building, can you speak to what plans the department or agency has in place to make sure that they can keep up with the upkeep of the building? Uh, it'll be our normal, like your, your common maintenance on the, on the structure. I mean, it's, it's a solid, you know, it's a solid concrete building foundationally. Uh, it does have um, some additional, um, you know, wooden exterior and, and as such, um, but that will just be your normal maintenance to keep the upkeep. A lot of it is the aesthetic, making sure that the uh, the integrity and the windows are kept, um, you know, making sure that the 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 hip is the the roofing and everything follows with the historic structure, um, and we don't really plan. Part part of the reason why this building works for us is because, you know, we get to save a building that would have otherwise been considered for demolition as opposed to keeping it the actual building, not just commemorating it with something else. Thank you. And um, Mr. Cartwright, I know you made mention that you will follow up, but I'm really interested in finding out what happened with the insurance proceeds back in 2012. And I hope at some point the Virgin Islands government can be able to maximize the use of land and property that we have that falls under the jurisdiction of property and procurement. We have a lot of buildings and locations here in the territory that is just sitting there for years. And I'm happy to know that we are bringing life to some of these properties, but I really feel that we can do so much better with our, with our assets. And I think when I recently went online for property and procurement, they have a lot of listings online. I'm very interested in finding out how the department is going about advertising and promoting these, these, these buildings and hopefully with COVID-19 they can work out some, some better deals because we're in a position where we definitely need extra funding and we could be able to move this territory forward and maximize the use of our buildings in this government. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you very much, Senator James. Senator VLA, you recognize you have three minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, Commissioner Oriol, you're requesting approval for the disposition of this property? Uh, I'm requesting actually approval for the acquisition by the central government. It's the Port Authority who is requesting the disposition. Okay, so in 
the language that needs to be developed by this body, it needs to be clear that this property would become, it would fall under property and procurement and then would be utilized by the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Yes, that's sir. correct. And I believe in, I, I believe I saw a draft deed that indicated such. A, a quick claim deed, but a quick claim deed I think is to DPNR and not to PNP. Uh, but okay. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, Senator, it should be to PNP, and I believe my testimony specifically spoke to the transfer going to PNP um, for the utilization by DPNR, but the actual transfer is to property and procurement. Okay. I, I think the president have a copy of the quit claim deal, so he, he would be able to um, put on the record as to who is it going to. Uh, secondly, do, does is there a need for language that states that? the transfer of this property satisfies the outstanding amount owed by the Port Authority to DPNR in the amount of 1.8 million and satisfies the amount that DPNR owns of also Viper in the amount of 643,000, et cetera. Is there a need for us to specify exactly what the disposition of the property um, is going to settle? In, in reference to what exists between both entities? So, it, so Senator, I could say that for DPNR, um, this was something that, that we had stated to the Port Authority, that our settlement agreement, which is a separate document, deals with the terms of that settlement, and that the deed should, in fact, just be the deed for the property. Okay, so um, you, you have a settlement... The, the, you have a settlement we agreement. We do have a settlement. We have it drafted. Uh, it will be executed pending the outcome of the decision or the deter determination uh, of the, the legislature. Uh, because, the, the again, the process for the Port Authority to dispose of land requires the approval of the governor and the legislature. So do we need to language um, upon 30 days after passage of this particular act, a settlement agreement should be entered into by DPNR and, and um, Viper that deals with all outstanding amounts? Uh, I mean, you can. I, I would say it's not mandatory because, again, this is the process that, that both the Port Authority and DPNR agreed to. Uh, we did not want to have any of the members of the board or myself signing uh, the settlements without having the approval for the actual transfer okay. of the property. So right now, all that we have in terms of the settlement is a gentleman agreement between both parties. Well, it's also, yes. I mean, it's it's a it's a agreement to be executed. It has been voted on uh, by the Port Authority Board as of the, I believe, their seconds. September board meeting. And so there is a record of this is the process that we are following at this time. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that uh, we protect the rights of the government and that um, if we're supposed to pass this particular uh, measure, uh, that move and follow, you know that these two amongst are not disputed any longer and we're moving on from October 1st. Time. And that is I, it. I think... That, um, Senator, I think this, the suggestion that you made wouldn't hurt. Um, definitely, even though it's separate and apart, it's tied to the transfer of that real estate. So since it's two separate entities, I think it would make sense to probably, like you said, add that contingent on the execution of the settlement agreement to resolve all outstanding balances, um, something to that nature. I don't think that would hurt. And what... Okay, I, I, I think that, that that is it for me. Oh, thank you very no, much. I, I was trying to remember the last question. I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I just lost it for a minute. Are you going to be able to become current from that October 1st on your submerged land fees to Viper? Yes, um, that's our plan, is to maintain and be in good standing moving on. Um, as you know, it was very difficult for us to cover this average, given the fact that it went back so many years. 
Um, but I think now that we've been able to true up everything based on this um, agreement moving forward, our intent is to main maintain um, our accounts in good standing with DPNR. Okay, and the last question I did um, thank my DPNR former commissioner for sending me the first page of the quick claim deed. Um, it is to the Virgin Islands Department of Property and Procurement Correct. on behalf of DPNR. Is a signatory, is Mr. Thomas' sign signature on that? Or anybody from DPNR? No. Yes, Senator. I believe it should be it should be Senator uh, Commissioner Thomas. I mean, he and I have spoken on this. Yeah. But I, I can't sign on behalf of the government for the property. It right. should be Senator, I mean, Commissioner Thomas. Right, I'm Max saying the individuals I have it to Yeah, it's actually the governor of the Virgin Islands on behalf of the executive branch, and then, of course, um, me as the Senate president on the behalf of the legislature is a signatory um, that's required on, on the indenture. Okay, thank you so much. I'm glad that we're able to get this debt behind us and you guys can clear the books and we can move forward. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Viele. Senator DeGraff, you're recognized for your three minutes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers. Commissioner Oriol, you know, my, my main, I, I don't know if anyone else had a chance to speak about it, the American Legion and the steel pan that occupy the building. Are we still on for American Legion going to the smalls, what, what the smalls uh, electro, electronics building it was? Is that still a go? Yes, I, I don't know what it was previously used for, but that that's the, that's the location uh, that we will be offering. So it'll be more space than they had. Again, it's not, they don't need it permanently every day. And so in that annex building is is what we're prepared to do. Okay, and, and uh, w w when you say that they, they don't need it permanently every, every day, they, they have an auxiliary that provides lunch for veterans during the week. That's correct. Will they still be able to provide that service in that building? I, I have no objections to that, Senator. Okay, okay, and, and will, will you have to be the entity you're building it out before you, I guess, do a lease with the American Legion? Um, you know, it, it, I guess it depends on the nature of, of how far we're going. We know we're going to want to make improvements, especially when it comes to our audiovisual, since we are going to use it to do, like, public hearings and such. Um, but if they're, you know, if if the need to use it by the American Legion sooner rather than later comes into play. Um, you know, again, our, our thing was to enter into some memorandum of agreement or understanding with them for the use of the building. Um, and, and we will be also guided by property and procurement uh, in that respect as well. Okay, what, what is the cost of the WAPA building as it is now, the estimated value of that building? Um, that was a part of my uh, testimony, but it's roughly 911000 based on the appraised value. Okay. And that's and does uh, the parking lot know, come and, as a part of it? Land and building. Uh, say again? That includes, you know, land and building. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, does the outside parking lot come with the building? Yes, sir. Okay, so that's good. parcel uh, parcel F has parking spaces directly in front. There's also um, parcel 163B is parking area, and parcel F is another small parcel off to the to the uh, south side or eastern side of the building as well. Okay, thank you, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Senator DeGraff, Senator Benton, you recognize your point of inquiry? Sure, Riel, uh, you're inheriting a building that has other, other factions in it as well. You know that they, there's a segment of nurses that also uses a section of it as well? Retired nurses? No, Senator, I did not. Right, so you, you're inheriting something, and Ms. Cartwright, are you familiar that, there, that nurses also use, retired nurses, there's an organization that uses a portion of the building downstairs? Um, not to my knowledge, Senator. Um, the only lease 
that I'm aware of is with American Legion. Right, so you have two you got to look Port at. Authority. A very prominent organization of volunteers as, as well as servicemen that come in, in the com camaraderie of the utilization of the property that we can't really put them on the side. So I just need you guys to just have that in mind uh, when it comes to those entities. And of course, I heard a previous senator spoke about a steel ban. The young, and we have our retirees, and we have our servicemen. Uh, Well-deserved entities. Something for you guys to look at, please. I mean, I'm lame duck right now. We have the 34th coming in, but you guys are still there to make sure, if you can, it's a plea, really, to keep those individuals in, uh, in, in your hearts and your minds as well, based on the service they provide to the community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Benta. Um, Senator Barnes, you recognize. Uh, Senator Blyden, you are recognized for your three minutes. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon again to the testifiers, and thank you so much for your testimonies. I know that when it comes to DPNR, your responsibility is great. You have a large responsibility, and since the hurricanes, you know you have lost your home. And based on, can you turn on the mic? I have an echo, please. But based on um, the testimony and. <laughs> Based on the testimony and all that's occurring here with this this um, trade, I think it's a very good idea. Um, it makes sense. And I believe that the old upper building is a great place for DPNR to, to run the operations from. There's plenty of parking, and it's three different floors. And I'm happy that uh, they're going to um, allow the Legion Hall to continue doing what they do and also consider the steel pan program. Let me ask you, um, Commissioner Oyo, I know you have had um, many challenges in terms of um, staffing, et cetera, and you have been bringing on board um, employees, et cetera. What, if this plan is approved, if this zone is approved, what the time frame in terms of um, building out the, the building and basically having employees start to work from that, that location? Um, Senator, we have a estimate of a two-year build-out, um, so we do have to do some of the environmental demo in the interior, um, which is now what we're looking to do um, the contracting for. Uh, I don't have a, an exact estimate on, on what that time frame is, but um, overall, it would be a uh, two and a half to three years before we're actually inside of the bill. Two and a half to three years? Okay, very well. We have already, but thank you again. I, I will say this, we've already started the actual, um, the we've already in contracted for the architectural and engineering and for the, the construction document specifications to be done. That contract was executed earlier this summer and is well underway. Um, we are actually in the first phase of our floor plans um, that were submitted to us earlier um, in, in November and, and a second rollout coming up shortly. And, and will this assist in terms of your operation? Absolutely. Okay, very well. Thank well. I'm in support of this and thank you so much for your testimony. And again, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much, Senator Blyden. Senator Barnes, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to the testifiers. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Commissioner. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Okay, good. So, you know what, This I'm okay with this idea, and I'm more so inclined to support it. Um, I think it's a creative way to settle a long-standing debt. But my concern, Commissioner, is have we really cost this project out? Have we looked at all of the costs that would be associated with what I would call rehabilitating 
um, this particular historic building. And I think it's a very good idea, the whole concept of reuse. Um, it is a historic building, and I think it would, it, it would be a good model project. But my concern is, have we truly cost this out? Have we looked at whether we're going to have to do improvements to the HVAC system? Have we considered whether we're going to have to do mold remediation because of the age of the building? Whether we have lead-based paint? You know, my concern is do we have an overall project plan for this initiative, a schedule, and an estimated cost? I know I hear you say that you have funding from various sources, but in the absence of knowing what it is we're going to be confronted with once we start the rehabilitation, I don't know if $2 million versus $200,000 is appropriate. So sure. wh where are you with truly developing a project plan for this rehabilitation project? So th thank you for the question, Senator. So. Yes, we do have an estimated cost. Um, so when we were first evaluating what the, the long-term possibilities were, um, we started to put all the elements of what that would be in place. And, and at the end of the day, the, the, the deciding factor for this location ended up being where would we be able to fit the majority of the department and still have adequate parking spaces and everything. Um, in, in March of 2018, we did a preliminary walkthrough with some engineers in terms of what the costing would be um, and started to get that $3 million number is where we were at. Um, three, when we put three out million? the project for... Three, three, three million, million? Three million, Commissioner? What? You said three yes. billion. Yeah. Three million M with an M. Sorry, but no, you know no, what? No at the here. rate of the rate we go, sometimes it may be. But okay, this is the concern that I have. Not meaning to uh, interrupt your response. This mm -hmm. is a very good idea. The location is ideal. When I worked at the Water and Power Authority in 1989, on the third floor, my heel went through the floor. So I'm trying right. to understand: Have we truly looked at the structural? I know you're going to gut the interior. Have seconds. you done any preliminary surveys as to the structural integrity so that yes. three or four years from now you don't come back to this body and basically state that, oh, you thought it was a good choice, but now based on site conditions, it, it isn't. So have we done the preliminary surveys to really make this a worthwhile endeavor? And I do believe we, my we, time has been called, Mr. Chairman, so I would allow the uh, commissioner to respond on your time. A Merry Christmas to you and family, JP. Same to you. Thank you, Senator. So um, we have actually had, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if I may. You, you recognize. Go ahead, Commissioner. You recognize. So we have had the preliminaries done. Uh, as part of the contract, the engineering services of Paul Ferreras uh, were used by Springline Architects to come in, and they did do a preliminary assessment. The, the more detailed assessment, which I mentioned is as to where we are now, is because we have done the environmental study and realized that there are um, some asbestos and things that you find with the older buildings, particularly with lead-based paint and such. And so in order for the next set of the engineering to be done, we have to complete some of the. Uh, we have to complete some of that interior demo, um, and we have a cost for that. We have a cost of broken down into what's necessary for the engineering versus what's going to be necessary for the overall cleanup uh, of that project, and it's still factoring to be um, within that 3.3 is the estimated cost that the um, the the program and the estimates came out when we went out to bid for this. Uh, and lastly, we also um, have, in fact, even set aside the monies that it's going to take for even furnishing 
um, the there uh, you know that portion of, of payments and such is already available to DPNR. Um, we just you know we're not ready to use that right now, but as part of our settlement um, from public assistance for all that was lost at the uh, the Sierra Lee King. So we are moving on this in a very uh, linear you know checking of certain things um, that we want to make sure is done and costed out. And we are still progressing around that 3.3 million, which was first estimated to us by the engineers that did the walkthroughs of the facility and such. Thank you very much, uh, um, Commissioner Oreo. Senator Bonds, you recognize for a point of inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just as a follow up, have you factored in what your annual maintenance costs will be on um, once you occupy the building? We so we're we're currently actually we we started looking at that um, because one of the things that um, we have not had the overall liberty to do in the St. Thomas district because certain things were included with our lease at the airport is what some of those operating and maintenance costs are. So we're using our um, our costs for rental at. Uh, Rainbow Plaza and St. Croix to come up with what that budget is. Um, and we've started working those numbers so that we now know when we're getting closer to moving in, what to include as our federal grants portion, what to include as our matching portions uh, so that we have all of that together by the time we're, we're moving into the facility. Very well. At this time, the chair will recognize Senator Jackson. You recognize for your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, and season's greetings to the testifiers. And uh, good afternoon, sir. I would be remiss if I did not say amen to the relocation of the Department of Planning and Natural Resources from the Charles W. Turnbull Regional Library, which continues to be a contention for many in this island district that the department continues to be housed at that location and library services have been minimized and that likewise we have not been able to advance our library science archives uh, at that location due to the occupation. So I want to commend you on your efforts. Do I believe that this is the best location for DPNR? No, I do not. However, I do believe in readaptable use, and it is the decision of this administration that that is going to be the location for another 25, 50 years of the department, and so be it. Uh, I do not believe it has the sufficient parking. Uh, however, you may explain to me that the, if additional parking will be accommodated across the street on the hill, and I see that the department is moving back into the sub-base area. Uh, my colleague uh, from St. Thomas, uh, from uh, on St. Croix, spoke about uh, her sentiments, and I have to agree with her that I don't necessarily believe that how this is being approached is the proper way to do so. And it says here, um, to eliminate the growing debt to DPNR for the submerged land fees at the same time, monies owed by DPNR to Viper also seem to be a bill due that needs to be collected. One government uh, taking government money and paying the other one, another government entity. However, the complexities and the legal aspect, do you have a legal counsel with you? Or uh, any of the testifiers there, uh, our attorneys uh, on the line? Commissioner, do you have legal counsel with you today? Not with me today, no, Senator. Okay, and property and procurement. So, you know, these properties were transferred after the war to the central government. There were barracks, and I, I do trust that, Commissioner, that you would use the uh, wisdom and the expertise of the Historic Preservation Office and bring value to the historic nature of the sub-base area. 
and that uh, plaques will go up that speak to the uses of these buildings as a military base and the role the Virgin Islands played uh, during World War II in a submarine base. And also, 30 seconds. Um, Water Island and its relationship, which is so grossly uh, missing. Now, the question whether deep uh, property and procurement are the rightful owners of this property is still in question. When I say that, meaning it's yes, it's the government, but I do believe these properties are uh, uh, rightfully under the jurisdiction of property and procurement. The property and procurement basically were not using the buildings prior to the hurricanes. We know that there was water and power authority and the condition to which they have allowed the property to be maintained after the hurricanes is deplorable, especially in light of the Port Authority's port, seaport uh, in that area. Are you responsible for the damages that are, uh, and the cleanup of those damages, Commissioner Oreo? A cleanup of, responsible for which damages and cleanup, Senator? I'm sorry? I, I didn't I didn't understand the question. It was a little muffled. Said, the damages and cleanup of uh, which which damages and cleanup are you referring to? I'm referring to the subbase uh, WAPA former WAPA offices complex. Uh, are you the one responsible for the cleanup of the hurricane related damages in preparation for your renovations? Is that all part of the scope of work? We, yes, we were planning on, as part of the demo, that we would, in fact, be taking away that portion, uh, any of the interior, and then also the exterior portion that was damaged uh, okay. uh, along and, the uh, third floor. Very well. Thank you. Are you also going to achieve this if this is approved prior to the hurricane season 2021? No, Senator. I would strongly suggest that you meet with your colleagues and try your best to secure and to clean up the debris, the hanging debris that may in fact uh, hopefully not kill someone if it falls off or end up being flying debris in the next upcoming hurricane season. But thank you very much and best wishes to you and the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Jackson. This concludes uh, this particular round. At this time, uh, I'll go to um, both Mr. Cartwright and and uh, Commissioner Oreo for a 30-second closing, um, closing statement. Mr. Cartwright, we'll go with you first, and I will close off with uh, Commissioner Oreo. All right. Um, I would like to thank the 33rd Legislature. Um, Senate President uh, Francis and the listening and viewing audience for this opportunity to present um, in support of this uh, transfer. Um, we at the Port Authority feels like this is a mutually beneficial agreement and it will also assist greatly and assist the agency in the government. And we try our best definitely to work with our sister agencies. But given the revitalization plans for Crown Bay, um, I think this will mesh and complement and basically create Crown Bay into a sustainable development, uh, not only when cruise ship traffic is in, but also when cruise ship traffic is not there because we would have that local participation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Director Cartwright. Uh, next we'll go to Commissioner Rio for 30 seconds closing. All right, and, and thank you, Senator Francis and other members of the 33rd uh, Committee of the whole. Uh, I want to reiterate um, uh, what Mr. Cartwright stated, that this is, in fact, a mutually beneficial uh, agreement here. Um, you know, I have watched and witnessed a number of budget hearings where we have spoken about the amount of rents that the government uh, pays on an annual basis and that we need to fix up our properties that are within government and use them more beneficially towards the operations and reduce our overall costs. Um, 
given the, the, the size of our particular department, uh, there are a number, although there are a number of vacant uh, unused buildings within the government sphere, um, a number of those will not accommodate something the size of our department, nor provide for the accessibility for the public. Um, we saw this as an opportunity to be able to revitalize, uh, 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 you know, what we feel is a fascinating building. Um, we see the use that its sister structure just across the way gets uh, housing three or four different entities within it. Um, and we feel that DPNR can can make this a proper home, uh, reduce our overall costs, and continue to serve the public if given the opportunity to do so. So again, we want to thank you for your consideration of this measure, and and we hope for your favorable vote uh, at the conclusion uh, of the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, right. and I think it's a step in the right direction. And yes, we may be concerned about the mechanism by which we're able to achieve this, but nonetheless, I believe being rent-free is a step in the right direction for your department as well as the government of the Virgin Islands. At this time, Madam Clerk, I'll ask you to call up the last item on today's agenda. Uh, Commissioner, um, you're free to be dismissed. And at this time, uh, Madam Clerk, you're recognized for the last items on today's agenda. Proposed University of the Virgin Islands Research and Technology Park Tech Village Project and Associated Land Conveyance. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, Mr. Peter Chapman, Executive Director of the University Research and Technology Park. Mic check. Yes. Good afternoon, Senator Francis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. And um, I'll allow you to introduce uh, those individuals that you have brought on to support you, and then um, you'll be recognized for your testimony. Great. Thank you, Senator. Good day, Honorable Senator Francis, members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Peter Chapman, and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the UVI Research and Technology Park. I'm honored to be here today to offer testimony to support our request to have Virgin Islands government-owned land in the federally designated Opportunity Zone conveyed to the RT Park for the purpose of undertaking the Tech Village redevelopment on St. Croix. I'm joined here today by Ms. Sydney Paul, RT Park Senior Manager of Business Intelligence and Marketing and a principal member of the Tech Village Project team. She'll be presenting to you in a few minutes. Uh, she has been critical in shaping uh, the overall scope of the project and also leading our community education efforts. I'm also joined by Ms. Alina, uh, Amina Salim, who is the RT Park Chief of Staff and a member of the project team. She's been co-leading uh, community education efforts and also working on plans for our solar infrastructure for the project. Uh, I'm also joined by Ms. Yian uh, Wang, uh, RT Park Manager of Sustainable Development and Foreign Direct Investment. And uh, she is another member of the project team, and she's been leading tenant acquisition, solar infrastructure development, and also uh, technical assistance for farmers, which we'll talk about later. We also have um, uh, with us today Mr. Robert Jenkins, managing partner of Renaissance Equity Partners which administers the HBCU Opportunity Fund. Earlier this year, the fund was featured in Forbes magazine as one of the top Opportunity Zone funds in the nation. This entity is one of our main private sector funders of Tech Village, and we're glad to have their leader, Mr. Jenkins, with us today. We also have in attendance uh, Dr. Richard Warburg from St. Thomas. Uh, he is the founder of Impact Traits, an important locally grown, innovative, sustainable enterprise that will be our anchor ag agricultural business uh, on the Tech Village site. This is a most timely discussion because we are close to the U.S. Treasury Department's December 31st deadline for investors to place capital into an Opportunity Zone fund like the entity that will be investing money into Tech Village. It is therefore critical that we demonstrate progress in moving this project forward by receiving this body's approval for the conveyance of the subject 26-acre property, which is located on Centerline Road between the Educational Complex and the Department of Agriculture Fairgrounds. The RT Park recognizes that we will have to return to this body, hopefully in early 2021, 
for rezoning of that portion of the site that includes eight acres worth of non-agricultural uses, specifically workforce housing and a teaching hotel that will benefit uh, the UVI hospitality management program. We further recognize that at that time, it will be necessary for the legislature to amend section 11 of act 6836 of the Virgin Islands code, which governs the uses of agriculturally zoned land. The RT Park Tech Village redevelopment is one of the most important sustainable agriculture projects introduced to the territory in many years and could become a national model for sustainable development and economic empowerment of local stakeholders, especially existing and emerging farmers. The project is designed to promote economic diversification through the attraction and growth of businesses engaged in, engaged in large-scale food production for Virgin Islands residents and communities beyond our borders. Recent experiences with the 2017 hurricanes, our current economic crisis precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the fact that we are in the midst of a global recession have reminded us that our over-reliance on tourism creates a significant level of vulnerability that takes a heavy toll on our tax revenue base, on our families, and on the community as a whole. Therefore, we believe that the territory must stop paying lip service to economic diversification and instead take thoughtful, strategic, and aggressive steps toward creating real opportunities for Virgin Islanders now. It is in this spirit that we are pursuing Tech Village. Before getting into the details, let me first explain the RT Park's link to sustainable agriculture. The RT Park was established in 2002 through a partnership among the private sector, the University of the Virgin Islands, and the Virgin Islands government to help strengthen and diversify the economy through the attraction and incubation of technology and knowledge-based enterprises. Not only did our enabling statute, Title 17 of the Virgin Islands Code, emphasize the tech sector, but it also keenly highlighted sustainable agriculture as a core focus for the RT Park. Thus, we will fulfill a vital mandated role prescribed for the RT Park in the visionary Title 17 legislation passed by the Virgin Islands Senate in the 24th legislature by undertaking the Tech Village project. Sustainable agriculture was viewed by the RT Park's founders and apparently also by the 24th legislature back in 2002 as a sector with great potential to help create new jobs while also enhancing the territory's quality of life. But the RT Park unfortunately never took up the mantle of sustainable agriculture until now. We've come a long way since our founding in 2002 and are moving along a very positive trajectory in contributing to the territory's economic stabilization and growth. Our selection as the International Economic Development Council's 2020 Economic Development Organization of the Year underscores our progress. And this award cements the RT Park's position as best in class among economic development organizations in North America. I am also incredibly proud that our accomplishments are inextricably linked to the efforts of our senior and core team, most of whom are Virgin Islanders, and spouses of Virgin Islanders. I deeply believe in strengthening local capacity to plan and execute economic development projects and initiatives, and that the RT Park is setting a high standard in this regard. It is this local team, not real estate developers from the mainland US or any other region that has conceptualized and is driving progress on Tech Village. The Tech Village project seeks to harness opportunities in the agricultural sector to help expand food production and grow and diversify our economy. Recognizing that 97% of VI food production comes from exports and that we have pressing economic conditions, including an 8.8% unemployment rate, we believe that the need for Tech Village is urgent. Tech Village will support the territory's agricultural sector by providing office and research and development facilities for sustainable agriculture businesses and farmland for the enterprises that will occupy the site. In fact, 18 of the 26 acres or 70% of the total land will be dedicated to sustainable agriculture related activities. 
The anchor business will be an innovative local entity, Impact Traits, which is led by an experienced St. Thomas entrepreneur, Dr. Warburg. Impact Traits will apply its patented technology for growing toxin-free crops to the commercial production of selected vegetables. One critical feature of Impact Traits is that it will be owned by a local consortium of farmers that will share in the business's profits. This particular venture's ultimate goal is to produce a substantial volume of products that could be consumed locally and sold to communities throughout the Caribbean, Latin America, and possibly even Africa. By tapping into the demand for select agricultural products, both locally and globally, impact traits will generate revenue that benefits local farmers and Virgin Islanders employed by the business. Moreover, it places the territory in a position to be a leader in the world of agricultural agriculture innovation. Impact Traits will be accompanied by other sustainable development enterprises specializing in food production technologies that will create jobs for Virgin Islanders. Job creation in our territory is always critically important, but has become especially urgent in light of our ongoing economic challenges. Collectively, these businesses will create approximately 300 permanent jobs plus another 140 jobs during the construction phase. That will be, these jobs will be heavily marketed to farmers, graduates of UVI's agricultural programs, and other Virgin Islanders seeking gainful employment in a growth sector. However, because the project will be mixed use, Tech Village will also consist of other revenue generating components that will benefit Virgin Islanders. These include 60 units of new workforce housing, which will help address our severe housing shortage in St. Croix, and a teaching hotel geared toward business travelers. Not only will the hotel create permanent jobs in addition to the 300 projected sustainable agriculture jobs, but it will also enhance the educational offerings of UVI's hospitality management program by providing on-the-job training and quality experiential learning opportunities. It also bears emphasis that the RT Park plans to partner with selected area high schools, especially the educational complex near the, uh, near the UVI St. Croix campus. Local high school students in vocational education programs will have full access to the internships and permanent jobs emanating from Tech Village and the affiliated businesses. Another critical feature of the Tech Village plan is revenue sharing and financial support for St. Croix farmers. As a public purpose economic development organization, the RT Park is committed to using a portion of the revenue generated by Tech Village to support investments in other projects and initiatives and activities that make it easier for local farmers to participate in sustainable agriculture ventures. Additionally, we will use our platform with social investors and philanthropists to help capitalize a new fund, the Fund for Agricultural Progress, to provide direct grants and micro loans to individual farmers. The funding can be used for equipment, technical assistance, and other resources to help local farmers become competitive in the broader marketplace. The mixed use sustainable agriculture project is targeted to be constructed on a roughly 26 acre parcel between the educational complex and the agricultural fairgrounds on the opposite side of Center Line Road from the UVI St. Croix campus. The RT Park was guided to this site by personnel of the VI Department of Agriculture. This government agency manages the land because there are no active uh, manages the land because there are no active farming leases on the property. This parcel, which by some accounts has not been farmed since 1972, is the perfect location for Tech Village for the following reasons. Number one, the dominant commercial characteristic characteristic of the Tech Village concept is sustainable agriculture. Therefore. Utilizing the center line road site, which is zoned for agricultural uses, makes sense. Number two, the proposed site is located within the federally designated opportunity zone, which incentivizes private entities to invest in local projects by providing a federal capital gains tax exemption or reduction. The St. Croix opportunity zone boundaries encompass downtown Christiansted, downtown Frederickstead, and a vast swath of farmland mid-island moving west. The USVI's 
opportunity zone areas were established in 2018 by the previous governor's administration to spur investment into these areas of the island. <clears throat> Number three, the parcel is across the street from UVI. One of our key funders of Tech Village, the HBCU Opportunity Fund, is a, is a qualified opportunity zone fund created to make investments that would facilitate redevelopment of areas around minority serving educational institutions like UVI. The HBCU Opportunity Fund's investments must be located within opportunity zones to support mixed use ventures, which tend to carry the most significant potential for economic impact. The RT Park is leveraging the federally designated opportunity zone to attract the financial resources to make it feasible to pursue this project, to pursue this comprehensive project. We anticipate the Tech Village will cost more than $40 million across all phases. The vast majority of this funding, except for $7 million in federal block grant monies to cover a construction gap, will come from private sources. We are not looking to the Virgin Islands taxpayers to cover any of the project's costs. Thus far, we have received term sheets from investors slash funders for the first phase, office and operating space for agribusinesses, as well as the residential units, and expect to be able to break ground in the first half of 2021. We have been conduct conducting information sessions with farmers and other local stakeholders and have made a number of improvements to the site plan based on this valuable input. As we approach the deadlines for closing on our financing and commencing construction, we look forward to continuing to have informed and constructive dialogue with all segments of the community. The vital importance of attracting and retaining jobs in growth industries is underscored by the fact that the territory lost over 12% of our jobs following the 2017 hurricanes. We have still not fully recovered. This cruel reality, along with the ongoing economic fallout from COVID, necessitate that the Virgin Islands assumes a more intentional approach to economic development. Tech Village represents a significant step in the right direction, and we look forward to working with the legislature to advance this important job-creating sustainable agriculture initiative for Virgin Islanders. I would like, uh, I would now like to have Ms. Sydney Paul, our Senior Manager of Business Intelligence and Marketing, show you the revised detail, uh, pro detailed project plan and renderings. We've made a number of material modifications to the plan, uh, and we believe that uh, these represent significant improvements to the plan since we initially presented it to the legislature back in uh, August. So with that said, I'm going to turn the floor over to Sydney, and then after that, uh, Dr. Warburg is going to say a few words. Sydney, you have the floor. Thank you, Peter. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Sydney Paul, and I'm the Senior Manager of Business Intelligence and Marketing at the RT Park. Um, just give me one moment. I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see the presentation. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. You might proceed, uh, Ms. Paul. Thank you. So um, this, just to give some um, everyone some background, this is a presentation that's very similar to the presentation that we have been giving to stakeholders across the community for the past several months. Um, it's just been updated a little bit for um, our presentation today um, with um, the committee. So we start off, of course, with what Peter mentioned, which is the RT Park's legislative mandate. Um, many people know the RT Park to focus particularly on tech and knowledge-based economic development um, and business attraction. However, many people don't know that um, our mandate also requires us to look at sustainable development, um, economic development and business attraction. So this project, the Tech Village project, um, definitely falls within um, that mission of what the RT Park was created to do, um, which is very exciting considering St. Croix um, and the Virgin Islands being a really great location to, to think about um, agriculture, agriculture business and innovation. Um, the next thing that I wanted to show um, is just some important definitions that we'll probably talk about later on in questioning as well. Um, and this is what a qualified opportunity zone is. 
as well as what the Renaissance HBCU Fund Opportun um, op Opportunity Fund is. Um, these are definitions that I took from the websites, um, the first one being the IRS website, the second being um, uh, the fund's actual website. And like Peter mentioned, um, the Renaissance HBCU Fund uh, was recognized as a Forbes Top 20 QOZ Fund this year. Um, and it's, we're really proud to be working with them, particularly because they focus on minority-serving institutions or historically black colleges and universities to improve areas around um, those communities. Another thing that I wanted to bring up front was um, what our Opportunity Zone map looks like. So um, for St. Croix, and just to give some background, I think Peter mentioned this as well, uh, the, opportunity f the Opportunity Zones for the Virgin Islands were designated in 2018 and early 2018, I believe, by the, the, the former administration. Um, and this is what the St. Croix map looks like. So all of Christianstead, all of Frederickstead, and basically everything from Mid-Island going west. Um, and then I zoom in a little bit, the red dot that you see on the map is generally basically where the, the Tech Village um, project would be located across from the university. So it falls within um, that blue space, which is where the opportunity zones are. And then there's also some references to where these maps are located. So Peter also mentioned this, which is the overview of the project. Um, it's 26 acres of a mixed-use development. Uh, there's a housing component. There's a teaching hotel that will be affiliated with the university. 12,000 square feet of commercial space that will be dedicated um, to RT Park tenants or clients um, that are working in agriculture, innovation, research, or development and or development. Um, the hotel will also have a 300-person capacity conference space, um, which is very much needed on the island. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but most elements of the Tech Village project touch sustainability in as many ways as we, as we, as we could make them. Um, one of those being a solar microgrid that would support the energy needs of um, the, the footprint, as well as in the event of emergencies, support other areas like the St. Croix Educational Complex in, in, in the event of disasters um, and um, uh, sort of things like that. And then there are other elements that I'll talk about, but this just gives um, programmatic elements that I'll get into, but this just gives basically an overview. And the other really big part of the overview that we um, mention a lot when we're doing our community uh, presentations is the job creation come out of this project. Um, and the majority of these jobs are going to uh, those working in agriculture-related uh, businesses in the agriculture industry. So 300 of those are permanent agriculture-related jobs, and then there's another 125 or so um, construction jobs um, for the construction phase. When um, looking at this project in the beginning, we thought about where are all of the opportunities that we could um, support solutions to a lot of the challenges that we talk about as a community that we've had. Some of these being, um, you know, economic dependency, lack of diversification, housing, um, the limited housing options, especially after the hurricanes, workforce training and training for jobs of the future, um, diverse, di diversifying the job opportunities that there are here um, for those who may not want to work in the, you know, handful of industries that we have. Um, and of course, needed investment. Um, here I have not just, I have in the agriculture industry, but not just in the agriculture industry, but just investment in the territory overall. So, um, you know, we think that this project hits a lot of um, those challenges and finds solutions for those that I've mentioned before. Um, the next couple of slides are examples of projects that are very similar to this, um, that are being built or are, are already exist in the United States and abroad. The first one that you see here is the Woodland Research and Technology Park at UC Davis. And I'm gonna take a step back because most of these, if not all of the examples that I'm going to show, um, hit a lot of really similar comparables to um, what this project is going to be, um, what this project is going to be. So all of these projects are affiliated with a university um, all of these projects are mixed use, meaning that they have different uses like commercial space, housing, et cetera. Um, and all of these projects are 
a um, research and technology park or something related to that. So this first one um, is, hits really close to home with what our project looks like um, at UC Davis. It's um, an agriculture and innovation center that the UC Davis um, wanted to create a research and technology park that focuses on agriculture innovation. So this um, project not only has space for that research and development, but it also has housing, um, single and multifamily homes. There's parks and open space. Um, there's, um, you know, retail. They have retail space and other things like that. But um, the point is that many of the the concept of these research and technology parks include mixed use development because it supports keeping the talent close to the research, keeping the talent, meaning the individuals, close to the university, so it's easy for them to work um, and create the solutions for tomorrow. So um, I wanted to put this one up front because it's a project that, you know, in terms of agriculture innovation um, is very similar to what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve with Tech Village. Another one um, that is, you know, pretty interesting is in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, they're creating an innovation and technology park. Um, this is huge and compared to compared to what we um, are creating, but again, it follows the concept of mixed use um, and creating spaces close to universities for there to be um, innovation work going on. Another really great one that um, I use as a standard when I talk about what the research and technology park here in the territory can be is the Research Triangle, Triangle Park in North Carolina. Um, I really like this concept because, um, first of all, their marketing is really great, but it also includes a lot of the concepts that Tech Village has. So, for instance, you see here in the screenshots, they have a brain space, which is basically where their research happens, a green space for parks and in encouraging sustainable um, living spaces. They have a fun space, which is restaurant and retail, which we don't necessarily have. But they also have a stay space, which is a hotel to accommodate guests, scientists, researchers, those working with the with the businesses operating in the Triangle Park. Um, and then finally, they have sleep space, which is um, residential housing for those working at the university, those working in the um, technology businesses close to campus um, to keep all of the talent in the area improve and also improve the, the neighborhoods um, around the technology park. And then the last one that I'll mention very quickly is um, the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. There are many others like this in Virginia, but I wanted to mention this one again because it's a mixed-use concept associated with Virginia Tech. Um, they have single and multi-tenant buildings on site to support the, the talent working um, in the research center. And again, all of these are technology-related, um, trying to keep their talent close to home to figure out what innovative solutions that they can bring to their university um, and have come out of their university. So this is an aerial shot just to give everyone, um, to orient everyone on where we're talking about. Um, this to your to the east or the right of your screen, the red roofs is complex, it's Sinclair Educational Complex. And then in the middle there is the rendering of Tech Village. Um, and then west or to the left of your screen, you'll see portions of um, the agricultural fairgrounds and the Department of Agriculture. In this shot, you do not see the university, which is south or below the screen, but the university, um, St. Croix campus, is there, as well as just across the street where you see the S um, for south is where the RT Park building is a little down from here, but you can't see it on this, um, this aerial shot. This shot gives you a better um, picture, and this is, um, I know that we were before the body earlier this summer in the, um, com the finance committee, and we had given some renderings, but these are updated renderings that we received from our architect that overlay the project onto actual aerial footage um, of the site. Um, so again, you're seeing complex with the red roofs, you're seeing the Department of Agriculture on the left side, um, but really getting a better idea of the footprint and where it lays um, in relation to these, um, the, the other um, structures nearby. Uh, one, of the, one of the many feedback that we got from stakeholders during the, um, the time that we've been talking and doing our community engagement events is, um, you know, of course, seeing all of these new structures can be very intimidating. 
So we realize that this angle of the rendering actually doesn't show how much of the land is dedicated to actual farmland. So we got a different angle, which actually shows you um, the university to the far um, upper right-hand corner. You can see portion of the RT Park building and the mill and um, the university just behind that. But also you're seeing, you know, that 18 acres of the 26 acres here is dedicated to actual farmland um, to support the businesses that will be occupying the commercial space, like impact traits, which Peter mentioned. Um, so a lot of people appreciated seeing this angle because they could, you know, get a better idea of how much, you know, farmland is being preserved um, for actual farming. And I'll get into talking about, you know, the percentages of what's being used for agriculture and whatnot in a little bit. So the first thing that I want to break down in terms of the elements of the project is the teaching hotel, which is a, um, a really important piece, um, particularly because it benefits the university and the students at the university in a really big way, particularly on St. Croix, because we don't have much hotel um, rooms. We don't have many keys right now, especially after the storms and getting, you know, the recovery, um, you know, still ongoing. This would be um, more additional rooms to add to St. Croix's inventory. Um, but also more than that, um, it provides a teaching space, an actual hands-on experience for students at the university on the St. Croix campus who are in the hospitality and hotel management program um, to have hands-on experience working in a hotel, um, which we desperately need if we're going to, um, you know, think about our tourism, our tourism product on St. Croix um, and creating a workforce that supports that. This is a really great way for the university to create a pipeline of new leaders in hospitality um, because they have uh, a space right across the street that makes it super accessible for them to do their work, whether it be internships, working full time, what have you. Um, and, you know, a teaching hotel, this concept is not new. Many universities in the States have this. There are examples, um, you know, for instance, at Cornell University, um, they have hotel management programs that have a hotel nearby for their students to um, get hands-on experience working. So this, pro this, this hotel in particular, um, we're hoping for it to be a brand, uh, or it will be a, a business hotel, a brand name business hotel. You'll see in the rendering, it says Hilton there. Um, it'll be something like a Hilton or a Hyatt um, or a Marriott, something like that in the business level of their um, hotel brands. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, the 300 person capacity um, event space is very much needed, um, can allow St. Croix to host many big conferences. Um, you know, once we are out of the uh, the COVID, the, the pandemic um, situation that we're in right now, um, we're hoping to be able to attract more events. Um, like, for instance, this, the RT Park had a uh, tech summit last October that we hosted at the Buccaneer that went very well. Um, but, you know, considering how well it went and wanting to expand to fit more people, um, having a space like this would be great to be able to... Um, support our business attraction efforts and those for others in the community. The second um, piece that you'll see here, and these are all new renderings that um, weren't available in our previous uh, presentation to the Finance Committee, um, is the commercial space. So these are new renderings that show the courtyard in between the uh, event, the conference center, and the commercial space. So like I mentioned, this is 12,000 square feet and um, can fit up to four tenants, maybe more. Um, depending on how it's laid out. But uh, this is space for the tech companies at the RT Park who are going to be working in agriculture, um, sustainable agriculture or sustainable development. Again, this entire footprint is themed um, to support bringing, um, either attracting or nurturing um, businesses here on the island or from abroad. The housing and apartments component um, is really interesting to look at. Um, Again, like I mentioned, we're, we, we wanted this to touch all, we wanted all of the elements to touch uh, sustainability in some way. So you'll see this big swath of um, uh, a community garden in the middle of the apartments, but um, it's 60 units of one, two, and three bedroom apartments um, that will be targeted to 
um, residents who are in, you know, this is, we describe it as workforce housing or those in the middle class or moderate income housing. Um, we understand that that is a demographic in the community that, you know, especially after the storms is still struggling to find housing. And if this can provide some for some relief for that, we, we're really happy to see that. Um, we have a target of residents here um, that you'll see is, of course, those um, who are working uh, in tech businesses that are in the, the RT park, as well as, you know, those affiliated with the university, whether it be faculty, staff, students, et cetera, um, because it allows them to work, it allows them to live close to the university and just makes it more accessible for them um, to, to work, live, do their research, things like that. However, this does not exclude the greater community. Just because we're mentioning those um, as our target residents, um, um, the apartments will be available to anyone in the community on a first come, first serve basis. And then finally, a big portion that we've been talking about is the sustainable agriculture research and development. So a lot of the design of this project um, we've done in partnership with many individuals, including the Virgin Islands Good Food Coalition, having conversations with people at the university, particularly in the Cooperative Extension Service, to get feedback on where are the needs of our agricultural community, getting us in touch with individuals, them being a liaison to help us understand where, um, you know, where we can provide some support. And that is basically, you know, how this design came about. So things like the Fund for Agricultural Progress that Peter mentioned um, will support capacity building and other technical assistance needs for farmers. Um, you know, we are in conversation about creating um, or helping to create a farmers cooperative, which I know has been attempted before, and we're hoping to find a successful model in collaboration with those at UVI. Um, you know, again, mentioning that this project, because, you know, it's new to hear the RT Park work in the sustainable agriculture space, um, it's a very new concept to hear, but it's something that we should have been doing um, based on our mandate from Title 17. And then again, you know, just focusing on the job creation and the workforce development and, and really helping to create um, an innovative agriculture industry here that we can be leaders in, I think is really important. And then furthermore, um, we wanted to break down again, you know, the portions of this project that touch agriculture in some way. Most of it does. Um, you know, 70% of the, the footprint is used is going to be used for farming. The remaining eight acres, um, which will basically be where all of the building structures are, um, the housing, the hotel, um, are going to be revenue generators for the RT Park. And a portion of that revenue, particularly from the hotel, um, will be going directly to um, that revenue sharing model that Peter mentioned that is still being built out and still being shaped. You know, we talk a lot about the deadlines for um, the construction of this project, but there are a lot of programmatic elements, including the fund, the, the fund for agricultural progress, the revenue sharing. Um, these conversations with the farming community and the agriculture community will be ongoing to, to make sure that these resources that we're talking about make sense for the farmers. But um, you know, overall, basically just getting across the point that um, not just the, you know, 18 acres will be used for farming, but the financial, um, the revenue that we get from portions of the project, the commercial space is all, will be dedicated to supporting farmers in some way. And then um, included in your package, I, we included some, some research that has been done on the importance of looking at, you know, what a sustainable future for the world looks like. And a lot of people, um, a lot of research leans towards figuring out um, how we make agriculture more sustainable because, you know, food is it's really important when it comes to um, sustaining ourselves. And um, that can't happen without looking at digital solutions or incorporating technology in some way to make agriculture, agricultural pra um, practices more sustainable. So I just wanted to highlight that because, you know, it's a, it's, it's a area of agriculture, but also an area of technology that is just being really um, looked into. And I think that we have an opportunity here to be a leading space in that. 
the other thing that I wanted to mention um, is another concept which 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 talk which speaks to um, innovative agricultural practices, and many people call it agriculture 4.0. Um, and basically, this is a, 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 a research that came out of the World Government Summit that speaks to um, all of these challenges that we have um, for us in the in the Caribbean that really touches on climate change, um, you know, natural resources and food waste. Um, on top of the fact that we import a lot of our food, um, that can be solved. Um, by looking at innovative agriculture practices or um, solutions, technologies that make agriculture more sustainable. And the, the research basically concluded that many um, nations and their governments uh, just need to be a little more disruptive in this space and uh, give space to allow for innovative practices to to be experiment, not experimented on, but researched and explored um, so that we can increase productivity, we can become exporters, um, especially for small nations um, and territories like ourselves. This is a rough timeline of what we're looking at right now. Um, and the, the, the copy that you guys have may look a little different than this, so I apologize because this was a last minute change that I realized there was an error. But um, basically, this is where we are. Um, early December, um, you know, completing the site plan and the development of our programs. The pro programmatic elements, like I mentioned, will be ongoing discussions with our community to figure out what those look like. Um, but we're also, you know, in terms of the, the opportunity zone deadline is the end of this month. Um, so that's basically where we are looking at the conveyance process, which we're doing right now. Um, early 2021, we're looking at hopefully getting the parcel rezone or a portion of the parcel rezoned, excuse me, because um, the vast majority of, of the footprint is, is going to be used for farming. Um, so there's only a portion, not the entire parcel, that we would be requesting to be rezoned. Um, and then, like Peter mentioned, breaking ground in the first part of 2021 um, and completing construction on the first phase um, sorry, breaking ground on the first phase, which is the housing and office component, the beginning of 2021, and then completing the first phase, the housing and office component, um, in the beginning of 2023. Uh, like Peter mentioned, the site plan, um, basically how we got to this uh, particular parcel is through conversations with the Department of Agriculture, um, who, you know, gave us several options of um, agriculture managed land that didn't have any leases on it. Um, and we, you know, came to this one because of many of the reasons that Peter talked about. It's right across from the university, which supports the HBCU fund. It's right across from the RT Park, which supports our business attraction, retention and expansion efforts. Um, but it also is close by to the Department of Agriculture and the high school, which, you know, we want to be able to give the students at the high school and um, the university opportunities to interact with this site, um, you know, whether it be the School of Agriculture, the Hospitality Management Program, all of these students, um, it would be a disservice for it to be right across the street and not have any ways for them to engage with it and find opportunities or create a pipeline for these students to, to find job opportunities. So um, that's why this site made a lot of sense. Um, and we talked about this, so I'll pass that. Um, the partners that are have been involved in this um, have been really crucial to moving a lot of this forward. Again, the RT Park is the lead developer on this project. Um, we have been controlling the design elements, pushing the project forward. All of the community engagement that we've been having is us having conversations with our fellow Virgin Islanders about what this project can be for them and where we can improve the, the, the design and programmatic elements of it. Um, Peter mentioned um, Mr. Jenkins, who's with Renaissance Equity Partners, who's with us today. Um, they're a Black-owned economic development firm, um, and they are the ones that manage the Renaissance HBCU Opportunity Zone Fund. The National Development Council has been working with us for some time now. We are in a contract with them. Um, and they are the oldest and most geographically expansive um, U.S. Treasury Department certified community development financial institution. Um, they support a lot of um, underwriting and making sure that projects like this 
um, you know, are finding uh, opportunities for financing and doing all of the right things that we need to do, checking all of the boxes. Um, they've been crucial in, in getting us this far. And the, the great thing about the, our um, partnership with NDC is that it's not just um, for the RT Park, but it's available um, for other organizations in the community to tap into, whether it be um, other government agencies or uh, nonprofits. Uh, we want that to be available to them. So I just wanted to plug that for a second because NDC has been such a great resource for us. Uh, Dwight Capital is the um, mortgage lender that we're working with. They're a HUD-backed mortgage lender. So um, their work and their due diligence on looking at this project is through the lens, um, through many lenses that include, um, you know, federal agencies like HUD to make sure that this is a sound project that can move forward. So we're appreciative of them. And then, like I mentioned, on the agricultural portion, you know, uh, partners like the Virgin Islands Good Food Coalition, who have been um, just giving us, you know, keeping us in the right direction to where the needs are for the agricultural community, have been really great. And then, uh, you know, other um, partners like the University of the Virgin Islands and working with those in ag, in ag research at UVI um, have been crucial um, to what the design of this project has looked like. And then finally, we have here the Kresge and Rockefeller Foundations who are affiliated with the Renaissance HBCU Fund. Um, so they uh, have supported that fund. And, you know, we mentioned them because this is one of the few opportunities that I think in a very long time that they have been engaged with the Virgin Islands, um, if at all. I know that the Rockefeller Foundation has been involved with the Virgin Islands before, but, um, you know, this project gives the territory an opportunity to to um, tap into, you know, philanthropic uh, organizations like, like, like these um, to support other in capital improvement projects or community development projects. So um, that's their affiliation with the project. And then Peter, um, this is basically what Peter has been talking about, a breakdown of the financing. Um, like he mentioned, this is a $40 million project, 40 plus million dollar project, excuse me, that's broken down into two phases. So the first phase is the apartments and offices, um, which is, uh, is roughly 22 million that's needed for that or um, calculated for that rather. Uh, 13 million is coming from um, Dwight Capital from the mortgage lender that the RT Park is partnered with. Um, and then 2 million is coming from the POZ funding and then seven million from the CDBG DR um, money that the territory received that supports economic development initiatives um, like this one. And then the second phase of the project would be the hotel, uh, which uh, in terms of the financing, you're, we, would, the, the, we are not developing, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. We are not going to be the lead developers on the hotel portion. So we're not managing the hotel. The RT Park is not in the business of managing a hotel, but we will be facilitating um, connecting a developer to the hotel. Um, we will be receiving revenue from the lease on that hotel, from, from I'm sorry, from the hotel developer leasing the land for the hotel. Um, but in terms of uh, building and financing the development of the hotel, they will be tapping into New Market's tax credits, which we have taking the initiative to start the conversations on that. Um, whoever the hotel developer is will be required to put in some to some financing. And then also um, having that developer tap into the EDC benefits um, that exist for them locally um, is also a op uh, financing opportunity for the developer of the hotel. So right now, um, we, we have this slide because um, many people have asked about, um, you know, the use of the land right now. So right now, many people know that it's used for parking for Ag Fair and for the farmer's markets on Saturdays. You also know that if people who drive by there, I live close by there, you see some livestock farmers who are um, getting hay for their um, animals. Um, and then like Peter mentioned, and we've talked to a, a few community um, stakeholders who said that by some accounts that the, the, the parcel hasn't really been farmed since the 70s. Um, and the background images that you see there are some pictures that were taken um, on a Saturday after the farmer's market. I know that many people, you know, remember from Ag Fair this year, this past year it was really rainy and um, muddy and things like that. Um, 
Um, so that's basically the image that we see of, of the, the use of the, the, the parcel right now. Um, but long term, when you think about this project, um, you know, the use of the parcel is bringing 40 plus million dollars of investment to St. Croix. It's creating, you know, over 400 jobs. Um, it's creating an opportunity for St. Croix and the VI to create good examples of clean energy infrastructure, um, you know, improving housing opportunities, office space opportunities, business attraction opportunities. Um, it's creating a new curriculum or a supplemental curriculum for the hospitality management program for their students to have hands-on experiences in a hotel. Of course, increasing hotel rooms, which we desperately need. Um, and then, you know, all of the elements that I talked about in terms of investing in the agriculture community by using technology and in innovation to, um, you know, create other routes for our agriculture industry to move forward. Not necessarily replacing what's there, but just providing other ways for, um, you know, farmers, those who may be interested in farming to enter into um, the farming industry in ways that they may be interested in, you know, whether that be technology and innovation or things like that. And then um, in many ways, which I didn't mention before, um, but, you know, creating a sustainable design that uh, we hope can be an example for other projects moving forward. So like I mentioned, um, all of these, you know, like a lot of elements touch sustainability, not just in programmatic elements, but in design. Um, the parking, the parking spaces are going to be green parking spaces that are porous. You know, the landscaping on the, the property will be edible. Um, there's going to be, you know, a design that encourages walkability so that people aren't necessarily driving. The fact that this is close to the university um, and there's housing nearby um, encourages people to not necessarily use their cars as much. Um, you know, creating opportunities for farm to hotel. Um, or, you know, the event spaces to use local um, produce, um, you know, encouraging the housing uh, residents to, um, to garden by having the community garden there. These are all elements that we talked about and wanted to incorporate into the design. And long term, we're hoping that that encourages more people to look at um, how we live sustainably, um, including, you know, technology and innovation into that. And then finally, uh, we keep this slide in here because it just, you know, with the team that we've had on board for the past two years, we've been trying to think of um, where the RT Park is moving forward, especially in sustainable agriculture um, and sustainable development. And this, pro um, this map just gives like a visual of all of the areas that we wanted to expand and tap into, and the Tech Village project does that. Um, and that's the presentation that we have. So I thank you guys for sticking with, with me through that. And I, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Warburg for, um, for his testimony. So I uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, thank, thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, thank you very much um, Sydney Paul. Excellent presentation. However, we need to take a two minutes recess uh, for rebooting, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from Dr. Warburg. The committee stands in recess for two minutes. Thank you. 
we're out of recess at this time. Uh, we just completed the testimony from Ms. Sydney Paul that did a very good job. Uh, next, we'll go to Dr. Richard Warburg. You're recognized for your testimony at this time. Oh, I appreciate the time to speak with you in support of the request for approval of the conveyance of the Tech Village land to the RT Park. My name is Dr. Richard Warburg, and I've been living in St. Thomas since before 2010. I was the sixth person to be granted an RT Park agreement for my company, Godney Holdings, working with Kelly Moore and Jeff Kaufman on this island. Godney has been a consultant with other fellow islanders, Dr. Moore and Mr. Stephen Evans-Creek and the EDC company, Oven Therapeutics. Dr. Warburg, cases, Dr. Warburg, your testimony is being recorded. Can I ask you to just load on a bit for the recorder, who's also remote? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So sorry. Would you like me to start again? No, you could proceed from where you left off, if you could just load on a bit. Okay. In both cases, we've used our expertise in intellectual property and biology to develop novel drugs and have enjoyed working with the university and supporting the entrepreneurship program and working with university interns and professors. Godney has successfully helped in the development of new drugs and continues to do this presently with other companies and with the uni newly formed private equity or venture capital company, Cienta Ventures. I've long thought about how to create sustainable work on the islands using our skills and recognizing that the island, the people are limited and precious. Based on work we have done for the last 20 years with a company in San Diego, Cebus, we believe that we have a solution. And to this end, we've come up with the concept that we refer to as impact traits. At Impact Traits, we are working to develop the U.S. Virgin Islands as the primary or sole source of unique proprietary plants, including, for example, cassava, cannabis, peanuts, bananas, and oil palm. Recognizing the unique position of the USVI, we believe that as a community, we can once again make it the red basket of the USA in a way that moves the needle on our GDP. <clears throat> The strategy takes advantage of our remote location, diversified workforce, land, and university, all of which will be made accessible and coordinated by the tech village. Sale of such proprietary plants around the world can bring in hundreds of millions and probably billions of dollars to the USVI. The key here is leveraging our limited land with plants that no one else has access to in conjunction with the conjoining of Debus's work the university via the Tech Village. The Tech Village will be the site of impact trade research and development in the USVI, as well as the center for the farming it needs to conduct. The Tech Village site will provide the essential platform from which impact mm -hmm. trade scale and As one example, cassava is the main source of carbohydrate for one tenth of the world's people. With assistance from the University of the Virgin Islands, it can be grown on our land free from infectious organisms, such as viruses, which otherwise might reduce the tuber yield by up to 20-fold. In the USVI, we can produce infection-free plants and provide a secure source to those around the world. This will be the first commercial US-based source of cassava and allow processing of such into gluten-free flour and related products in a factory located in St. Croix. In conjunction with the university, we can also generate new non-PM traits in cassava, such as resistant to herbicides. Other traits include sweet cassava, low in the toxic cyanide generating compounds present in the tuber. Longer term, genetic resistance to viruses and other diseases and specialty starch compositions are contemplated. In order, we will need the dedicated fields proposed in the tech village and farmers to research grow and harvest the plants. This will provide full-time employment for farm workers interested in this e economic activity. In addition, we can make full-time use of other fields not presently being worked. The factory will also provide full-time work opportunities. Those products can then be sold in retail in the islands, and the factory and fields can be developed as a tourist destination, showing our entrepreneurial spirit. Further sales will be made through e-commerce the U.S. mainland and elsewhere. We anticipate that in collaboration with the university through the Tech Village, we will provide education in the cassava production and processing 
for future generations of managers and farmers and be joined by world experts in the area. UVI is, also, is already able to perform the needed research for improvement of the plantings on the island. It can become the center of, for development of a franchise around this concept. The other plants will be developed in similar fashion using UVI resources and assistance and the land provided by the tech village and elsewhere. Given that the royalty on each such plant will average about $25 an acre and that the developed plants will likely command interest in millions of acres around the world, it is evident that the royalty income will be substantial. Caribbean Island can be trained as franchisees to increase our reach and UVI and the Keck Park is central to education of those populations. This concept provides the opportunity for full-time employment at all levels, from farmers to the university, with full benefit packages, pension schemes, profit sharing, and the like. All such is catalyzed by the Tech Village proposal. This is a concept not tried before of taking our precious land and people, giving them full-time employment with full benefits, making them part of the profit sharing, and ultimately having impact rates become part of the fabric of the island, much like rum production. We want this to be the company that all aspire to be part of and to start education at our schools and then our university and to accept others from all over the world to study our methods and continue the work elsewhere to our benefit. This is truly sustainable agriculture that leverages our limited resources and is based upon and dependent upon this tech village land conveyance. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard in support of this proposal and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, to Dr. Warburg. Uh, Mr. Chapman, is that uh, concludes your presentation uh, this afternoon? Yes, uh, Senator Francis, that concludes our formal presentations. We will uh, pause for questions. Very well. Thank you very much. I'd like to go right to uh, my colleagues uh, for questions. I, I wanted you, before I um, open up the floor, door, can you expand on your discussion in regards to the um, tech Park expanding food production and, and um, grow and diversify our economy. Can you expand a little bit on that for me, please? So, Richard, do you want to um, do you want to highlight the last part of what you said about basically the value added product um, opportunities emanating from from impact traits? Certainly, it, we're going to be creating plants that have never been created before and um, helping uh, with help from the university to uh, be able to grow those locally on our islands and then franchise that out to other countries around the Caribbean or around the world. Um, those um, other islands and the uh, other countries will pay a royalty for the use of those plants, usually at about $25 an acre. So you can see that we're talking about for a million acres, it's $25 million. And for 100 million acres, which many of these plants are capable of growing, it's uh, a quarter billion dollars. So it actually truly affects our GDP. It's all non-GM, so we don't um, do any genetic engineering of any sort. Um, and we'll be using uh, sustainable culture techniques, uh, organic farming where possible. Um, does that answer your question, um, uh, Mr. Chairman? Thank you, yes, yes it does. Um, so we'll go to a round of question, a three minute round, and we'll start off with Senator Thomas. You're recognized for your three minutes. Mr. Chair, how many minutes are we allotted? Three minutes, uh, Senator. All right, thank you very much for that. And good evening to all of the professionals testifying before us here today and talk about a comprehensive and uh, let's say this lengthy presentation, lots of information. And then we have three minutes to ask questions, but you know, they, they, not, 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 too, not too many questions here. Um, it, it looks like a great plan, well thought out, lots of investment as far as research on, on how we'll do this. My, my questions are going to be very, very basic. And um, in the testimony, we heard that 
the 70% of the property will be available for agriculture-related activities. Not directly agriculture, but agriculture-related activities. And that's a very broad statement. In, in, in 30 seconds, if somebody could explain agriculture-related activities. Sure. So, Senator, thank you for that uh, question. So, we describe agriculture-related activities as encompassing farming, as well as research and development uh, related to agribusiness development and the operation of agribusinesses. And in this case, going back to Dr. Warburg's uh, testimony, there will be a very close link between research and development and the farming that will take place on the, on the site. Okay, great. Now, you mentioned product goals as far as uh, a certain amount, certain volume, certain ability to provide for the community or, or even the university and, and the park village. Specific products, what do you have in mind? So I'm going to let Dr. Warburg uh, answer those questions because I think they get specifically to the value-added products to be created as a result of the impact traits uh, technology. So okay, thank you, Dr. Warburg. Thirty idea seconds, please. Is to do it with cassava because there is no U.S.-based source of cassava in the, um, and that is desperately needed. It's a gluten-free flour that's being provided, um, but other plants. Anything that we chose, and I, I gave a few examples during my um, my talk, um, can be acted upon, can be made into new types of plants with new traits. So, for example, I gave, uh, the example I gave with cassava was we can make it sweet. So we can take away the cyanide um, products, which make it poisonous to eat unless you cook it, um, and that gives you more flexibility. Did that answer your question, Mr. Chairman? Uh, sorry, um, Senator? Excellent response. And, and part two to that is you also mentioned the sustainable agriculture ventures. This is exactly what you're talking about, like how you plan to focus on cassava. You have other ideas for sustainable agriculture ventures? Yes, we do. Um, cassava is just the first one as a proof of concept. Once we've done that, um, you know, we have the unique island and we have the unique university um, that um, is agriculturally uh, based. And we want to make this the center of the world uh, with that in mind. So um, any plant that we choose to um, manipulate, we can then take forward. Uh, and and, and uh, once we've grown it here, you know, many of the fields in the Tech Park Village will be used as... Seconds. Um, experimental fields to see if we can grow the plant here properly. Once we've grown it, uh, we can then ship it to other countries, and those countries will pay us uh, royalties for that. So not only do we generate our own food supplies as we choose, but we can also help other countries with their own food supplies and, be, uh, and benefit monetarily for it. Okay, and finally, and this is to the group, how closely tied to the, the developing agriculture um, major at the university is the, it, the RT Park. Is this directly tied with the agriculture studies at the university? Uh, I, I, would, I would answer that, Senator, by saying that there, there is not, we are not intimately involved in um, the, uh, in the decision to establish a, uh, a degree program in agriculture at the university. But I believe that uh, our effort to harness sustainable agriculture for greater economic development purposes and the university's, um, you know, really centering of uh, agricultural studies are, they're part of the same vein of making uh, sustainable agriculture uh, a more significant part of the uh, of the economic development and also research and development landscape uh, in the in the territory. So I hope I hope that answers uh, your uh, question. Somewhat, because what, what what I wanted to hear is that yes, RT Park is doing their own thing, and yes, the university is doing their own thing, but in no way that you guys should not be joined at the hip or jointly uh, moving forward in how when this thing develops. It should benefit both. 
it, it absolutely yeah. should benefit both. It, it should be tied to the hip, and we say, well, in conjunction with the university, X, Y, Z. There's no way you could be looking down the road, $40 million plus worth of investment, and there's not a direct tie to the university. And Mr. Chair, as I wrap up, I just have one kind of a weird question, and this one is to Ms. Paul. Ms. Paul, I was looking at the presentation, and in several of the images, what I am seeing, if let's go to the the cover image uh, of your presentation. On the right-hand side of the screen, there's a blue area. Are those solar panels? Correct. Um, that is where the solar microgrid um, would live, on the east side of the hotel, stretching a little farther back to the, the housing apartment. So uh, that, those blue panels, and I apologize for not mentioning that, that would be the solar microgrid. Because my question with those is anything agriculture, uh, first and foremost, for me, I guess in my mind, I want to see how the solar farm benefits agriculture. And for me, this looks like real estate where actually something could be planted. So if you elevate this area six, eight, ten feet, maybe you could grow produce under that. That's just uh, just my mindset. Yeah. And then all of the buildings, to me, look like areas where panels could go as well as all of these buildings, mm -hmm. I'm sure, will try to be green. And I think um, the land should be uh, better used other than just solely solar panels. Um, maybe that could be redistributed. That's, that's just a suggestion. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for the time, for Response. Mr. Chair, and thank you all very much for your answers. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Thomas. Uh, Ms. Paul, you had a response? Yes, I just wanted to agree with the senator. Um, these are all, these are suggestions that we receive from community members um, in relation to the microgrid. We've even gotten um, suggestions of elevating the, the the solar panels so that that can include additional parking. We've also talked about um, green walls, living walls on some mm -hmm. of the um, buildings to you know put more foliage and more greenery in there. Um, like I mentioned, the parking structures will be green, porous parking. Um, the solar infrastructure and many um, infrastructure parts of the footprint, whether it be um, uh, water usage, recycling, gray water, things like that would mm -hmm. support the farmland, um, you know, um, in terms of water needs and things like that. So those elements will touch um, the farming, the farming operations in some way. Mm -hmm. Very well. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Chapman. I think I heard you responded maybe once or twice in regards to not being directly involved in, in, um, in certain project. What is the mechanism by which you intend to ensure uh, deliverables or um, you know, quality assurance, if you will, to ensure that these stakeholders actually comply with whatever they um, intend to or they have signed up on uh, to, to comply with? How, what mechanism are you using to ensure that happens? Sure. So thank you for the question, Senator. So for the first uh, for the first phase, uh, just to be clear, we are the developer. So we're the developer of the housing, uh, the R&D and office facility for agribusinesses, sustainable agriculture enterprises. So we, uh, through our agreements with uh, our, a general contractor, will make sure that those facilities are built to a certain standard. We will also have goals included in those uh, in those in that contract to ensure that there is a certain level of local business participation as subcontractors on the um, on the on the construction phase. With respect to the next phase, which is the teaching hotel, as uh, Cindy uh, Sydney indicated. Uh, while the RT Park is not uh, going to be participating in the ownership structure necessarily of that phase, we will have a role in identifying who that partner is, and we will uh, really memorialize what it is that we want to see, both in terms of the operation of the hotel and in the design elements through the, uh, the RFP or the uh, RFQ uh, document. So that will be the vehicle that we use for engaging a... Uh, uh, a third party to operate the hotel. So I hope that answers your question, Senator. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to 
Senator Graf, you recognize for your three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, testifiers. Uh, l let me get straight to it and say, uh, uh, Director Chapman, I, I do support the project that you have. Uh, the presentation was done before. Um, I think it'd be a great project, and uh, once it comes to fruition, the problem I have with it is it's presently an agriculture land. I is that VI Corp property? It is. It is VI Corp uh, property, and it is a uh, it is a largely agricultural project, and that was one of one of our uh, reasons for wanting the project or believing that the project uh, should be cited in this uh, area. There are other reasons, but that is certainly a factor. And you, you mentioned Act Number 6836, an act yes. repealing and reenacting 7 VIC Chapter 1 to provide for sustainable farming industry, amending 19 VIC Section 2301 to provide for designation of a territorial veterinarian, amending the 30, uh, amending the 30, amending 33 VIC Chapter 111 relating to agriculture, revolving funds making appropriations. You mentioned Section 11, which states all VI core land is prohibited from development and shall be used exclusively for agricultural purposes. Also in it states a legislative purpose. The purpose of this chapter is to promote and to protect the agricultural industry of the Virgin Islands, to include the protection of prime agricultural farmland necessary to promote and to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of the people of the Virgin Islands. Would this be considered prime agricultural land? Uh, so I, I do not uh, believe that it is all prime agricultural land. Let me first answer that question. So if you look at if you look at the current uh, look at the current uses uh, of the site and what is going to be built on certain areas of the site, what you see is that there is uh, there is essentially a parking a parking lot or an area that's used uh, for for parking has reportedly been used for parking for several decades. Uh, when you look at where we are proposing to site the hotel, which is right off seconds. of Center Line Road, I would say uh, not being uh, an expert um, in uh, you know determining the you know the the, the uh, growing potential of soil, but just by virtue of that location with the toxins that come from uh, automobiles and what have you, I would say that that is not prime agricultural land. I do believe that the areas that are slated in the plan for farmland, that is prime agricultural land, but we, we recognize that the area, regardless of how much of it is prime agricultural land, we recognize that it is zoned for agricultural uses. So, so we know that we are gonna have to come back to the legislature to get that statute that you referenced and that I referenced uh, in my testimony, we'll have to get that amended. And so uh, I'm gonna pause Time. there because I know that there are probably gonna be more questions yes. that, uh, yes. that we wanna address regarding the, the I... eight acres that is not gonna be used for, for farming or other uh, agricultural uses. So if I may wrap up, Mr. Chair? Uh, you may, Senator. Yes. and. Uh, uh, Act 6836 was signed by Governor Turnbull in May of 2006. We are in 2020. It has stood, and, and I think, uh, again, for me to amend this, to allow agricultural land to be used for anything other than agriculture, I, I can support. I, I support your endeavor as to what you want to do. I believe St. Croix is big enough and has uh, excellent other properties that you can put this facility and, and make it as prosperous as, as can and contribute to the territory uh, greatly. But to put it on agricultural land, I have a problem and I won't be able to support it based on that. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator DeGraff. Uh, Senator uh, Benta, you recognize for your three minutes. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening to the testifiers. I want to say to Ms. Paul, I've seen you as a little toddler, you your sister, and then your brother eventually with your mom coming into the office. It's been about some years. I must say to the director of the RD Park, you did a very good job in having this young and up and coming talented young lady make this presentation today. It really went far for me to see that you're not only speaking of the product, but also having inclusion of the future being a part of the delivery or dissemination of this growth. I would say though, that I would love to see something in, in our farms as well. I don't know if that's something that you're looking at. Our farms is pretty much tree is growing up, so you get more pound for the acreage as far as growth. It is something that a group by the name of Plenty out of the Silicon Valley uh, in Kent, Washington, uh, that they're doing right now. And I would say that my friend, Mr. Jeff Bezos, has donated a uh, couple hundred million dollars for that project as well, and they've pretty much been able to run out 200 plus million dollars, the first in the history, because it makes sense. And of course, uh, on the technical side, I would love to see, as we realize that on July 30th of, of uh, uh, this year, 2020, uh, we hear of the uh, new and up and coming project that's being produced or uh, provided with copper uh, by Mr. Bezos as well as far as internet satellite. We know we have SpaceX, that's another group out there that has it before, but here comes the FCC granting a permit to uh, the Kupfer group to be able to move, which is Amazon, to put over 3,000 low-hanging satellites into space. I'd love to see the RT Park become a part of that as far as designing some of the part. I see the director smiling. And I, this is one of the things I want to talk to our farmers as well. I've been pretty much all over this world and I've seen so many RT parks. And we're nowhere near the schematics as far as what a lot of our neighbors are doing. When we look at what's going on in Martinique and Guadeloupe, as far as the produce back to France alike and what's going on and how they've uh, pretty much structured themselves to, for survival. But it comes from within the hemisphere that we live in and we have not been able to market it. So I will go now to the director as far as we know lettuce is what the third most used leafy product in the world really. We yes. bring in some 40% some uh, of, uh, uh, of our produce leafy products that is, and then we talk about another 45% uh, of degradable as far as the nutrient that we get out of it because it travels like 2,000 miles before it gets to our table or plate. What is your vision going forward? It's gotta say this. This sometimes becomes a hard sell, but it's not for me, especially for where we want to take our industry. Combining the hotel as, the, as well as the other segment for the housing, because I've seen it in so many countries and what it has done in the capacity as far as moving an industry, you guys are thinking within the right direction as far as moving this territory forward to be self-sufficient. Your meetings with the respective uh, merchants, uh, if you had any or any input, any technology, any data for food, supermarkets, what are some of the discussions you're having with them or through the agriculture department to know what is moving on the shelves so that then we can now be a part of it? And I will do two questions in, in one because I know the time is short. And then the techn technological part of it, you're looking at what's going on with, with uh, the likes of uh, Mr. Bezos, who's out there, and mm -hmm. really seeking or looking for entities to work along and, and be part of the manufacturing side of it. How are we tapping into right. those resources? Sure. So, so Senator, I was I was smiling because uh, I appreciate and share. I think uh, your 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 boldness boldness of vision as it relates to the RT Park and also sustainable agriculture. And let me and it was very. It was a very comprehensive question, so I'm going to do my best to try to, to try to answer it. So in terms of incorporating some of those best practices centered technologies into, into the project, let me highlight one. I know that we focused a lot on impact traits because that is the, uh, that's going to be the dominant commercial element of the project. But there is another uh, element of the project that I haven't been able to name by name. I can de describe what it is, and we can talk in executive session. But because of uh, some NDAs that we're under, we're not able to actually uh, name the company. 
But in terms of those new technologies that you're talking about, one of the other employers on the site will be uh, an indoor farm, and I'm oversimplifying it. Um, it's an indoor vertical farm that will operate uh, on the site. They will uh, employ lots of Virgin Islanders. They will work collaboratively with other, with other farmers. And uh, this is a technology that is being employed in a number of different markets uh, in uh, the United States, mainland the United States, in uh, the Caribbean, other parts of the Caribbean, and in uh, various other parts of Latin America. And again, this is a best practice that will be present uh, on the Tech Village uh, on the Tech Village site. Um, and then just fast forwarding to answering uh, some of your uh, some of the latter uh, parts of your question, I think the piece of data that motivates us um, most uh, most aggressively and what we feel the greatest sense of urgency uh, around is the fact that 97, 98% of our food product is imported. And whether you are the Virgin Islands, whether you're Hawaii or any other jurisdiction, that can't be a good thing. That can't be a good thing in terms of meeting the needs, the basic needs of our of our population in terms of uh, sustainable agriculture um, and a good balanced diet. And it also is not a good thing from an economic development standpoint. So when we scope out, when we scoped out Tech Village, one of the things that we looked at is what are the opportunities to, uh, to really harness innovative uh, technologies in the food production space, like impact traits, like the indoor vertical farm that I mentioned. And again, those projects in and of themselves, Senator, are not going to provide the panacea for our myriad problems, but they collectively will represent a step in the, uh, in the right direction and help to fulfill my vision and also the RT Park's vision on the whole um, in this area, which is making us a best practice, making us a destination for sustainable agriculture enterprises. And what I always say to my team um, when they're willing to, like, you know, entertain me in, in these moments is imagine that we are the, uh, we are the community that other sustainable agriculture uh, technologists visit, you know, to get ideas for best practices rather than us having to play catch up as a territory, as a community. I think that is a very powerful motivation. Uh, for me. And let me say one last uh, thing. So when we talk about stepping outside the box, that's exactly what we did. We know that not 100% of the site is going to be used for farming, but most of it is. And so the question is, how are we harnessing that remaining eight acres that Sydney mentioned, okay, in a way that will inert to the benefit of sustainable agriculture and for farmers? And it is on that eight acres, okay, that we will create the short and long-term uh, revenue that will then be reinvested into our farmers and reinvested into sustainable agriculture uh, infrastructure. And those things are also critical toward moving us to the next level. And this doesn't mean that there won't remain a place for subsistence agriculture in the, in the territory, but it does mean that we will take, um, if executed effectively, and I believe it will be, that we will take our sustainable agriculture game to the next level, thereby addressing um, our food production challenges and addressing our urgent need to diversify and strengthen our economy. Yeah, thank you for your answers, respectively, and my time has been called, but we could have a, I definitely pay your visit, and I think you'll be happy with a visit when I do sit with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Look forward to it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Benta, um, for that. Uh, before we go to Senator James, um, Mr. Director Trapman, can you speak to your engagement with Commissioner of Agriculture, Positive Nelson, in respect to this project? Um, what is the collaboration level? How, how I know that in your testimony you mentioned the fact that um, he helped to direct you to the property. 
under consideration. Can you just speak to your uh, continued engagement with the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture and his team? Yes, so I'm I'm going to defer to uh, our chief of staff, Amina Saleem, who has had the most more substantive engagement with the Department of Agriculture recently. Good evening, everyone. This is Amina Saleem. Um, I spoke to the commissioner approximately two weeks ago, and we talked about the project. He, we have had meetings with him before, and he understands the project, and he's in support of it. He does say that it is agricultural land, but he does understand the concept. He's familiar with the um, Triangle Park in North Carolina, and he knows what we're trying to do. And so he is in support of it. We plan to have a meeting with him in January to talk more about it and what we're doing. And we've also met with the uh, director of the new school of the agriculture at UVI, and they also understand and like the project. We've talked with Dr. Lewis um, Peterson also. And so the concept is what people have to understand that it, we went to agriculture because it is, we need to start looking in a different way of doing agriculture yeah. so that we can, we can progress. And the first time I heard Dr. Warburg's presentation and he said we can really move our G, you know, GMP as far as bringing agriculture that we can export this is what we are supposed to do. And so when we talk to people about it and, and the c commissioner, we plan to work with them. They are going to be our neighbors. Uh, we will be looking at our microgrid and seeing what type of electricity we can share with them. We are looking at creating a fund that could actually help agriculture and the farmers, and he understands all of that. Oh, very well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salim, um, for, for that input. Um, Senator James, you recognize for your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Greetings once again to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think with this project, there was made mention that it will create about 300 um, employment or job opportunities for farmers. Yes. So. We would we ex we expect that through the private uh, entities that will will be operating on the site, um, there will be 300 permanent jobs created. Not all of that; those jobs will go to farmers, or, or at least not registered farmers, um, but they will be available to uh, existing and emerging farmers. So we know that through UVI. Uh, UVI and their degree program, for example, they will be creating a new pipeline of, of farmers or people in sustainable agriculture. And so those individuals, in addition to those uh, 88 registered farmers on St. Croix, will have access to those job opportunities. But we, uh, we project that the number of jobs that will be created will exceed the number of registered farmers on, on St. Croix. Uh, and then another 100, we've said 125 to 140 jobs um, will be created during the construction phase. But yes, 300 permanent uh, jobs is what we are projecting in the sustainable agriculture space. Okay, so let's just stick to the 80 farmers that you made mention of. What's your plans as far as being able to retain and, and train these 80 farmers that you speak of? And if there's any plans in place to even recruit farmers in the near future once this project is sure. up and running? Sure. So thank you for the question, Senator. So there are, there are several critical ways in which the project will support existing and emergent farmers, including um, those 88 registered uh, uh, farmers. Uh, so one is through revenue sharing. So the project will generate revenue from the various uh, elements. And we are going to utilize a portion of that revenue, and we're calling it uh, what the Fund for Agricultural Progress, or at least that's one of the one of the funds that we'll establish. And that fund will support the direct and immediate needs of of farmers, particularly farmers who are looking to make the transition from uh, from subsistence farming to sustainable. Uh, agriculture, sustainable agriculture-related uh, farming. So providing that financial support to them will help them purchase equipment, 
it will help them engage in uh, commercialization of their of their businesses and uh, other myriad needs that they have. So we question. are also going to be. So question, yeah. what will become of the University of the Virgin Islands Cooperative Extension and the Virgin Islands Experiment Station and the USDA Farm Service Agency currently on a campus now that we'll be move forward, moving forward with this project? What will become of those? Uh, I don't know that I answer, uh, understand the question, Senator. Anybody on this, in this conversation can speak to that? Ms. Salim? I'll, I'll, I can respond. Okay. Sure, please. You can uh, Say sure, Senator. Um, those those programs will still exist. What what I've you know the conversation that I have with people is that this is not something to replace what's already there, but to supplement and add an additional resource that farmers can use for technical assistance needs, capacity building. We're not trying to be a, 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 a end all be all solution to the needs here. We're just offering an additional resource that the agricultural community can tap into. So those will still exist. Those programs, I'm sure, will go on. Um, and the ways that we can partner with them, we are absolutely welcome to, to um, exploring those. But this is just an additional resource. Yes. And I just want to say something. This is Amina Saloon. This is, as Sydney says, it's an additional program. We're concentrating on the economic development. Those programs concentrate on the real technical assistance that farmers need. They help them in how to farm. They, they add all kinds of on irrigation and different things. We would never replace that. It would just be a complement to that. Thank you, Ms. Salim. And the governor always make mention of this digitizing of government. Can you speak to how this project will move towards farmers being able to get into the advancement with technology and the digitizing of government? Yeah, I can speak to that question. Um, hi, Senator, this is Yihan Wang. I'm uh, also, uh, I'm the manager for sustainability at RT Park. And in terms of how to help farmers to use technology and move agriculture to digitalization, we're planning to um, attract companies, te agriculture technology companies that will train and provide the platform and the tools for farmers to do record keeping, uh, man manage their finance, uh, purchase um, insurance, uh, and also use those like uh, value chain and blockchain technology to detect corp disease and uh, use data and evidence to do precision farming, which is um, more effective and will significantly increase, increase the production level of the farming um, and the, the agriculture in the territory. So um, we are, this is in line with our goal of incorporating technology and providing technical assistance to uh, move the agriculture industry towards commercialization and digitalization. And uh, the way we do that is by attracting companies that will provide the technology uh, to do that and provide trainings for farmers to um, use e-commerce and the blockchain or the phone mobile application uh, to move into that direction. Thank you for that answer. And it was made mention that they would have toxin-free crops. Can you just, someone please list some examples of these toxin-free crops that the village project plans to produce? Sure, I'm going to defer to uh, Dr. Uh, Warburg because that's a critical part of the impact traits model. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Peter. Um, in uh, cassava, it has um, cyanide inside it so that when you harvest it, you have to treat it in oven to remove that cyanide before it's edible. So that would be one example. We, we call it making a sweet crop as, a as opposed to a poisonous crop. Um, I would also add that, uh, uh, you know, I look uh, at a, maybe a broader definition than is being discussed here, which is people who just till the land and plant crops and then harvest them. Farming starts sooner than that. It starts with the intellectual development of a new plant um, along the lines that I was just talking about. And that will involve, and I've been in discussions with um, uh, David Hall at the university and uh, several of the professors there, um, the development of those new plants. And that's done in the laboratory, um, much as the RT Park is planning to develop here. 
um, and right next to the university. And it, each plant then has to be tested um, by what I would call farmers who may be wearing white lab coats um, as they do it, but um, it's farmers all the same, where they plant one or two acres of the new plant to see how it grows and if it grows well enough um, before it gets shipped out to the more general um, idea of farming, uh, such as when you want to make um, new peanuts, uh, which are grown in uh, the bulk of the south of um, southern part of, um, of the USA. Um, they often are susceptible to fungus, um, and you can lose 90% of a crop uh, in certain lands. We can make it so that they are resistant to those uh, fungi as well. Uh, and this is all starts off at the university, starts off in the, in the laboratories, goes to the RT Park um, land that we're talking about, and then to the rest of the world. I hope that helped. Thank you for that, that explanation. And can someone please tell me what led to the RT Park wanting to adventure into agriculture? So it, uh, it's part of Title 17, uh, Senator. So the, uh, the statute that um, was enacted by uh, the legislature in 2002 that created us. So Title 17 focuses on two broad uh, uh, industry clusters. One uh, was tech, particularly information technology. Of course, this was uh, 18 years ago. Um, and the second big cluster uh, was sustainable agriculture. So again, to, to Ms. Paul's uh, original point, we have, we have a, le a legislative mandate to focus on sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. I understand the mandate. So based on what I'm getting from you is that someone within the camp said, okay, we have not been following this mandate. Let's follow the mandate. Is what you're basically saying or is what it came as a, as a result of a conversation? It came as a result of an investor wanted to come into the territory. What sparked this idea to make you guys want to move forward into implementing this mandate or enforcing the mandate is what I'm getting at. Sure, understood. So it it was a, it was a few things. So it was it, the mandate was certainly one one thing. We take Title 17 very seriously. We uh, have also done a lot of uh, uh, research and a lot of homework on what industries and what sectors lend themselves to helping the territory become more economically diverse beyond you know beyond hospitality beyond. Uh, oil refining and things like that. So that was another uh, critical motivation. And then the third big area of motivation was around being able to take advantage of the opportunity zone, which uh, substantially encompasses um, that uh, that that agricultural zone, if you will, mid uh, mid island going going west. And then from there, you know, we you know we had a conversation with. Uh, Renaissance Equity Partners and others about, you know, harnessing sustainable agriculture to create this larger job-creating economic development project. So it was a confluence of all those factors. And, and lastly, I, I am hearing the conversations surrounding the 2040 vision plan. I'm assuming that you guys are a part of that conversation to make sure that within the next 20 years, this conversation that we're having here today is being... Um, implemented and we are sticking to the script and that it doesn't go to the site. So administrations after administrations, we are staying focused or like the good Senate President says, focus forward. Can you speak to the 2040 vision and how you're being a part of that discussion? Uh, I, I cannot, uh, Senator, thanks for that question. I cannot speak to the 2040 uh, initiative. I know that uh, it is taking place. I know that the consultants leading the effort are in the process of scheduling uh, a discussion uh, with us to get our to get our input. So we, at that point, we will certainly give meaningful input into into the process. But that meeting has not occurred yet. Well, hopefully, we can get you guys a, a part of that conversation because this body has put a lot of things in place to make sure that there is the proper funding for agriculture and to make sure that agriculture get the resources that they need. And if you really want to speak about moving agriculture industry forward, it should be implemented in the 2040 vision. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Agreed. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator James. Before I go to the next senator, um, Mr. Chapman, have you taken a look at the new South Shore Enterprise uh, Trade Zone designation? Uh, 
Uh, we we have, and uh, and I, I testified in support of that uh, of that ordinance uh, or that law uh, several several months ago in front of this uh, in front of this body. Yes, I've seen it, Very and well. I'm familiar with I'm familiar with the area. And is there an opportunity um, to even place any consideration that this particular project could be a part of that that designation? Uh, no, uh, no, Senator. It is not within the federally designated opportunity zone, um, and most of the most of the land, most of the viable land, if it lent itself to any part of this project, it's privately owned land. And so, even if we could do it, even if it were in the opportunity zone, it would really kill our pro forma. Not to get too technical. But um, but the the project uh, being done in the Opportunity Zone is very very strategic for a number of reasons, including the fact that we can get capital to do it, and being able to do it on publicly owned land as a public purpose uh, or public corporation means we don't have to incur costs for acquisition, which means that the project is more financially feasible. So so to be clear, uh, doing this project in the South Shore uh, area. Would not be would not be feasible. Oh, very well. Just one correction, though. It's not all private owned land. We have the industrial park. We have um, you know right. all the way down to Manning's Bay and all those areas that's actually public um, land as well. That's part of the uh, South Shore Enterprise Zone. Um, just just for um, your edification and, and that it's not all private. As a matter of fact, um, most of it is actually government owned property. Uh, Senator Vele, you recognize for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, congratulations to the group that have put this project together. You, it's clear and evident that you have put a lot of work into it. So I'm happy um, to see that it is moving forward. I think we just need to now uh, connect the dots as to how we're going to make it a reality. In, in your timeline, you said establish for 2021, establish a new legal entity. Exactly what do you mean by that? So thank you for the question, Senator. So it would simply be either an LLC or a, a triple LP, an LLLP, that would provide uh, uh, a measure of protection between the project itself and, uh, and the RT Park. And this, you know, for the viewing audience, uh, this, this is customary when you do larger uh, projects of this of this nature, the uh, the financing uh, the core financing for the project uh, presents limited risk to the RT Park, but to ensure that we can have that additional layer of of of, uh, of protection, uh, which is very important to my board, we wanted to have our attorney establish a new legal entity just to create that firewall. So that is something we're in the process of doing right now. That new legal entity would fall under the RT Park? Yes, it would be owned by the RT Park. Okay. Hence owned by the people of the Virgin Islands? Yes. Okay. Um, in reference to some of the comments that were made before the answer, the land is not owned by Vicorp. The land is named Vicorp, and it's, it's owned by the government of the Virgin Islands and the Department of Agriculture. There was land that was traditionally used for um, cane um, years ago that uh, Wang Louis, in his wisdom, Havland property was the name of the transaction, bought um, thousands of acres for the people of the Virgin Islands, and we're still benefiting from that up to now. Now, in reference to the rezoning, how many acres are you seeking to rezone? The total project is 28, but the bulk is for agriculture. So there's, what is it, eight acres you're going to seek to rezone? It, it, it would be eight acres, Senator. So the, the rest of the land will remain as agriculture? Correct. Okay. Now, when you had your initial uh, conversation with the University of the Virgin Islands, they opted not to use any of the acreage, the many, 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 many acreage that they have across the street, correct? Uh, yes, there were there are two. If if I recall correctly, there are two uh, groups of parcels that they own. So one was on campus, and I believe that those parcels 
are encumbered by other plans. And so the university has a master plan. Okay. Uh, and then there is another group of, of acreage that is not in the, uh, in the uh, opportunity zone. So, okay, so it was not okay. feasible for us at the time to use the university's land or the university's assets. That's but correct. The next parcel that is owned by the university is presently subleased to local farmers. Is that correct? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure which which parcel you're referring to, Senator. The next parcel that they own is is from the territorial court, traveling west. Are you familiar with that one, Sydney? Which one? Yeah, okay. so I think, so, Senator, um, you're talking about all of that land on East Airport Road? Yes. Yeah, so that they manage that land, and Amina, um, correct me if I'm wrong, and I know that there are farmers using using that land. There's livestock farmers on that land. Yeah, I, right. I think they have, uh, Ms. Uh, Salim, they have a quit claim deed for that particular land, but the land is under the purview of the Department of Agriculture, correct? That's what I understand. So it is quite possible that the University of the Virgin Islands can deed uh, exchange of the land that they presently own that have local livestock farmers on it for the land that we're going to transfer to the university up here. Uh, 2828, I think they own some 200 acres from the yes. territorial court down to the corner by Castle Burke back to the highway. They're all small livestock farmers that we don't want to displace. So I think that this yes. is a great opportunity for us to work out an agreement where we don't have to displace those individuals in exchange um, for the transfer of this particular 28 acres. Right. I think that could be feasible, Senator. That's a good point. Okay, so we go, uh, and you are very progressive, so I expect you to, <laughs> to move on it. Uh, you are very, your <laughs> team is very progressive, so I expect you to move on it. Um, you are going to be, the, the legal entity will be the housing developer and owner of, of this um, tech village that will directly fall under the RT Park. That's correct. And in terms of revenues, what, what do you have, a re revenue sharing with the university? How is that structured? No. No, no revenue sharing with the re university, Senator. Uh, the only entity that we would share uh, 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 revenue with are the farmers. So we want this to benefit the farmers in terms of their direct needs. And we uh, are also going to use some of our resources and the resources of third parties, such as foundations, uh, to create another fund that supports what we call the programmatic infrastructure for sustainable agriculture. Just wanted to be clear about what we're going to be doing in the area of revenue sharing and financial support. Okay, now in reference to Renaissance Equity Partners, which is a group that is going to be utilizing the HBCU Opportunity Fund. Um, the utilization of the fund, is that a grant or is that a loan? No, that is that is equity, and I, I will let, uh, I will let uh, Mr. Jenkins uh, speak to how his money works. Mr. Jenkins, let me know how your money works at the Virgin Islands. I hope this Thank is a you. good answer. Thank you, Senator. The Opportunity Fund will make an equity investment into the project. And equity, as you know, is nothing but a fancy word for down payment. So if the project is $18 million, the fund will make an equity investment of $2 million, and the sixteen million uh, is uh, debt from the HUD program. So the Opportunity Fund would make an investment, an equity investment into the project. The, therefore, the Opportunity Fund would have an equity interest in the project for 10 years, which is the compliance period for the Opportunity Zone Fund. Well, what, is, the the, what, what is, what is the, that interest, the equity interest, how much? Approximately two million dollars for the first phase. Yes, I'm only. Uh, okay, to, wait. To hold, 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 up, only... hold up a minute, sir. We're, we're talking two things. One was the investment portion. You said the investment, um, the equity investment is going to be how much? Two million. Two million. 
And for a that problem. equity investment, what is your interest in the project? How much? You're, you're literally going to be a part owner of the project? The, the, all right, the fund would make an equity investment into the project. Therefore, for a period of 10 years, the, the project would have two owners. The fund would be an owner, and the and the uh, the park would also be an owner. And break they, that they would, break that down. How much each? We don't know yet. That's part of the negotiation. Well, what numbers are we looking at? That's very important in terms of the government moving so, forward because it is government land, right. and um, it is going to have one owner that falls under the government of the Virgin Islands and the next owner that is a partner because of their investment. So what 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 is the ratio we're looking at, the range? So so let me let me speak to the capital stack. I can speak to some of those details. So the RT Park is gonna be the majority owner of that of that entity that is going to be created to create a firewall between the RT Park and uh, and the project it it itself. And so the RT Park is going to be putting the majority of skin in the game overall on the project, into the project. The land is not going to be used as, uh, and this has come up during a number of community uh, conversations, the land is not going to be collateral for any, for any of, uh, of, the, of the financing. Okay. We still have some very specific things to work out with Bob's group, but at the end of the day, the RT Park has the most skin in the game, and the land won't be uh, won't be used as collateral for the for the project. Okay, but but that's not the exact question I'm asking. I'm asking, after the project is completed, the project will have two owners. One would be the legal entity, the LLC that is formed by the RT Park, and the next would be right. the equity partner. Will right. the 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 entity that is formed by the government of the Virgin Islands be the majority owner? Uh, we will be the majority owner, absolutely. So for sure, we'll have more than 51%. A absolutely, absolutely. Okay. We have more skin in the game than anyone okay. in the project. Uh, and, I, and I ask that question because I go back to the original formation of the RT Park, where we still paying somebody from year one who did not necessarily do the greatest job in the world. He got it going. But the way that he negotiated his contract is that he remains, uh, what word right. should I use? He's being paid by the RT Park. He has an interest forever. So he, he gets what? Forever. So it, it is, uh, we're very familiar with that deal and we've spoken about this and I've shared my concerns about, uh, about that deal. It's not a deal we cut. So right, right. now we're incurring annually, what is it? Uh, $250,000 uh, a year, and that doesn't burn off for another for another several uh, several years. This, and I want to be clear uh, with uh, with the senators. I want to be clear with the viewing public. This is that is not a deal that this team right, and would. This, and would let me cut. put it let, let me put it there. Cause I'm the one that brought it up. It was right. when the park was park was originally formed. It is not a deal that you went to. It is a deal that you met no. and that you now have to pay. Would this new legal entity, would he also receive some of the funding from that, or would the separate legal entity prohibit him from getting any royalties or any of the monies generated by the park? Yeah, I mean, uh, Bob's fund is not going to get any royalties on anything <laughs> generated by the park, I okay. will say unequivocally. Good. No, I, 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 I needed to make that, make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, you submitted an application to the Community Development Black Grant DR program, correct? Correct. What is the status of that particular application? Do you have buy-in by um, the public, uh, sorry, Housing Finance Authority? We, we do, Senator. So we, are, we expect to receive what we call a conditional approval uh, from them. As you know, it's been a, it's been a long uh, process, but we're in a good place. And so there are gonna be caveats in that, uh, in that letter, as is customary for, uh, for those sort of commitment letters. And one of the conditions is that we must demonstrate site control before they can uh, deploy uh, their capital into the project. But I think we're in a very good place. 
So the project cost is $40 million. You're seeking $7 million in CBD, CDBGDR funding, correct? Yes. So I, do, I want to be clear about how this breaks down. So in the first in the first phase, okay, wait, be, uh, be, project be, cost. Before you break it down, because I'm going to let you break it down. But I, I need the, the CBDG DR funding that is going to be made available to the Virgin Islands is contained in what in what tranche? In which tranche? Tranche it one. It is contained two or three. in the uh, in the DR uh, tr tranche, or in what there are, if I recall correctly, three tranches totaling about $1.1 billion from that first big allocation of federal money to the to the territory. Mm -hmm. So that is where we would draw the $7 million in gap uh, funding for the first phase. So you are more than likely contained in tranche two. Uh, I, I don't. I don't remember specifically which tranche. I just know that it's part of the DR uh, allocation, which is separate from the forthcoming mitigation uh, uh, allocation. But I can't okay. remember specifically which because which tranche. Tranche one is two hundred and something million, and tranche two is seven hundred. I think and seventy. Which yeah. So um, I, I think it might be tranche two. But I just want to make sure that that is not going to be an impediment to you making progress. So go ahead and break down the funding. $7 million CBDG? Yes, how much, $7 how much million in, mm -hmm. uh, in CDBG, and that's the gap, uh, gap funding. Uh, $2 million in the first phase uh, through the HBCU Opportunity Fund. Uh, and for the viewing public, you need, you need equity, in, equity in a deal. You can't do a deal like this without equity. And then, of course, uh, there is 13 million that we are uh, that we uh, expect to receive um, in uh, in a mortgage, uh, essentially, and that will come through Dwight Capital, and that is a HUD-backed uh, mortgage. It will specifically be backed by the HUD 221D3 uh, program, which is a mortgage guarantee program. Okay, so that comes up to 22. Go ahead with the next 18. Correct. Correct. 18 right. more. 18 million I'm sorry? more. 18 million more, that's 22. It's a $40 million project. Right. So the next phase will be the hotel phase. And what we're projecting is that the hotel will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 18, 18 to $19 uh, million. So that's a different, that's a different phase with all of the, you know, the firewalls between this phase and that and that phase. And what is the funding source for that phase? So we are still working on the uh, on the plan for that phase, but we know that uh, we will get some amount of equity from uh, from a hotel development partner. Um, we are also aggressively pursuing uh, new markets uh, tax credits, working through a couple of different financial uh, institutions in the region. Okay, and the Renaissance Group is a facilitator for the Dwight. Capital thirteen million, correct? Uh, not not a legal facilitator, um, but but certainly uh, uh, we have been able to leverage uh, uh, the HBCU Opportunity Fund and Renaissance Equity Partners and their you know their their prestige and their heft. So they've brought a lot of credibility to the project mm -hmm. that has enabled us to get the attention of Dwight Capital. Okay, and the HBCU is a grant or a loan? No, HBCU Opportunity Fund, that is the equity that, uh, that uh, Mr. Jenkins talked about uh, earlier. So that is the equity that goes into, into the project for a period of 10 years under the Federal Opportunity Zone uh, statute. This is an Opportunity Zone okay. uh, project. It's been designated as such by the Treasury Department. So, uh, so his equity and the project overall will comply with those federal uh, rules for a period of ten years. Okay, so I'm I'm looking, and with your indulgence, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, uh, I'm looking at um, seven million CBDG, two million HBCU. That's nine million. So their equity, if you're looking at the monies under HFE and the HBCU, the equity is less than twenty five percent. Right for the for the first phase. For the That's first correct. Phase. And yeah. And uh, Dwight Capital are they offering us a good interest rate? It's a 10, 20, 30 yes. year mortgage. Yes. So this is a 40 year 
40-year uh, mortgage uh, interest rates. Since we began the process with them, interest rates have come down. So we think at the end of the day, the interest rate, Senator, will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.75 percent. And uh, the important thing and the biggest uh, feature of this, uh, of this product, if you will, uh, investment product or loan product, is that it's non-recourse. And for the viewing audience, what that means in this case is that the only security required for that, uh, for that financing uh, are the units that, be, that are being constructed themselves. So we don't have to put up any personal guarantees, no corporate guarantees, nothing like, uh, nothing like that. And Mr. Jenkins, you assuring us that you have the capacity to get this thirteen million. No, the thir thirteen million is being borne by the RT Park. But we have a facilitator. Or are you going directly to Dwight Capital? We we've already we're already there with Dwight Capital. So we have uh, we have a draft term sheet as we as we speak. Um, we we're. We're ready, almost ready to close. Okay. We just need, we just need the land. So, so we are, they, we're very far along. So you were able to fulfill that transaction without using a middleman. Oh, absolutely. We don't, we don't have any middleman. So the the RT Park, as Sydney, as Miss Paul pointed out in her presentation, we are the developer. Okay. Um, I had one more question and I forgot, <laughs> forgot the question now. I, I, I think it's. I think it's a good project. I honestly think it's a good project, and I know that you have a lot more that you're working on that is going to require the assistance of utilization of some of those CBDG funding and also um, the utilization of the government of the Virgin Islands. I think that it, with the indulgence of the chair, if you can give a brief breakdown as to um, the work that you have been doing with um, Kirk Chewin and, and Dave Johnson in reference to trying to get economic development to the island of the Virgin Islands as a whole and uh, some specific pro um, programs or development for St. Croix that deals with manufacturing. And I yes. am asking you to put that on the record because we, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had about $20 million that is still in the possession of the government of the Virgin Islands under the office of the governor and the Senate president, myself, um, Senator Saru, and Senator Fred Gregory, did try to pass an economic measure to give small business some relief, and it was rejected because. But the project that he's going to describe is a wonderful opportunity for the government to take 6 or $7 million of the monies we presently have to deal with the unemployment that is plaguing the islands and to generate some manufacturing and some new business jobs immediately because they have been able to um, have dialogue with companies that are very interested in coming in. And um, we yes. just need to, uh, to work it out. And I have asked Mr. Chapman um, to facil facilitate a meeting. Um, as soon as we convene in, in the 34th legislature, we'll have a, a meeting with the entity so he can explain in detail. But I think that... Um, in his presentation, everything is time-oriented. So if we're not able to put entities together to coordinate all of these permitting and everything else, we're going to lose out on opportunities because other jurisdictions are waiting to grab them up. So, Mr. Chapman, if you could just uh, give an explanation, please. Yes, so thank you, Senator. Uh, so we, as Senator VLA knows, we have been working, the RT Park team has been working for the better part of this year on... Um, uh, sector-focused economic development uh, strategy designed to attract larger employers, meaning employers that employ, you know, a uh, hundred uh, plus uh, people. So, uh, so that effort has resulted in uh, identification of uh, companies. We have vetted seven of the companies uh, thus far. They are all in the areas of uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable agriculture, uh, film technology and creative enterprise development, uh, clean energy, including um, uh, battery, electric be uh, vehicle, electric battery uh, production. And uh, these companies, just like other larger uh, relocating or expanding companies, 
uh, will will have a need for gap uh, funding, roughly amounting to uh, about 20 percent. So they are bringing uh, roughly 85, 80 percent of total debt and equity required for the for these projects to the table, but they are going to require some local participation in order to get across the finish line. So what the RT Park uh, would would like to do with the support of the legislative branch, also the support of the executive branch, is we would like to use uh, about $5 million, uh, maybe a little bit more. I think uh, Senator said, you know, 5 to $6 million. Uh, so use some of that money to address the immediate pre-development needs of these companies. And if we do that, that will ensure that we don't lose any of these any of these businesses. And then later on, meaning third quarter of next year, once uh, the projects have uh, have moved through the pre-development process, and once the territorial government receives uh, its allocation of of HUD CDBG mitigation dollars, we would then tap that pool to provide uh, larger sums of gap financing to these projects. And you notice that I didn't say funding, I said financing, because what we would want to do is structure these investments, not as grants, but structure them as investments that get repaid and recycled into other, into other projects. So we have put the infrastructure in place uh, to do this. We have uh, the partner, uh, NDC, uh, and another gentleman who currently uh, works on contract for us, who is an alum of uh, Shore Bank uh, in Chicago. So we have the infrastructure in place to do the underwriting, the deal uh, evaluation, the risk, risk mitigation to ensure that we don't lose these companies. And right now, the companies that we have on our plate collectively at full build out, um, we estimate they will create about 2,800, actually, specifically 2,810. Uh, jobs. So that's at full build out. So again, this is about uh, medium uh, term economic viability for the territory and job creation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chapman. Uh, so, you know, obviously, um, you know, this is a great project as you have uh, presented. Uh, I wanted to ask you what do you believe to be the biggest hindrance? What is it that seems to be a challenge uh, that needs to be overcome at this point? Um, I, I, I think I, I don't want to present these as challenges. Uh, I want to present them as opportunities. You know, I think whenever you take on a project of some scale, and this is a larger project, and a project of some complexity, um, it's always time consuming, not necessarily because of the technical stuff. I mean, some of us have been immersed in economic development for a long time. We can easily navigate the technical issues. It's really um, the, the community education piece and helping folks understand at the end of the day um, who we are as a local uh, public purpose, public economic development organization, and understanding how the project will benefit the community. So again, I, I want to present it as not uh, an, a hindrance, but as an opportunity. And I, and I do think, not to embarrass her, uh, Sydney Paul has just done amazing work, not only shaping the project as an emerging young uh, developer, economic developer, but really as someone who has done yeoman's duty in terms of educating the community on the various ways that this project can benefit them and can be transformational, so. Uh, thank you, we have uh, Senator Jackson. Uh, the chair will recognize Senator Jackson for his three minutes at this time. One, two, three, how many minutes you said? Three minutes? Three minutes you recognize for Senator Jackson. Thank you. Uh, after the finance chair took a deep dive that was necessary and gave perspective, uh, I want to commend the University of the Virgin Islands for their project. And uh, the only problem I am having, as I stated before, and a couple of my colleagues have stated, is how the decision for land use has been determined. And it appears from your presentation this evening 
that you have determined that the best land used for agricultural lands for the built structures, not for the agricultural use, is uh, justifiable and its location for that built environment of this project is also justifiable in its location across from the Department of Agriculture. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is, for all of the reasons that we've enumerated, including um, the importance of having the capital that we need, and also because the, the eight acres worth of non-agricultural features will be the revenue generators that will make it possible for us to invest in or reinvest in farmers and in sustainable agriculture uh, infrastructure. So, so yes. Okay. So, in that regards, the um, the land that is a, a directly behind the University of the Virgin Islands uh, cafeteria uh, that is owned by the University of the Virgin Islands, correct? And I uh, think correct. the chairman. Right, and that is used for grazing of cattle. That is used by the extension services as well, correct? Uh, correct, that is my understanding, sir. All right, so on that footprint and the last conversation you had with the finance chair regarding a possible swap of real estate, what is being proposed to sit on that real estate? Uh, so he, this, so this is my takeaway from uh, the finance uh, committee chair's uh, recommendation, and certainly, you know, uh, Senator Villa can correct me if this is not an accurate, um, uh, if I'm not accurately capturing what he is suggesting. So, in order to, I think what I heard was, in order to make the the agricultural community whole, if you will, for that for those eight acres that will be used for non-agricultural elements, but nonetheless elements that will benefit agriculture, we should talk to the university about perhaps using some of the land that they own and dedicate and, you know, maybe dedicating that, you know, for, uh, for use for, uh, for farmers so that there is no net loss. I, I think that was my big takeaway. Maybe I didn't understand it correctly, but that is a conversation okay. that we're, we're right. very willing very, to take right. back my, to the university. My, my, thank you. Thank you. My three minutes is, is ticking. So thank you for your response. So in that regards, the footprint of what was presented today, and I want to commend uh, the presenter. Uh, I know I, I call her Miss James, but I know she's not Miss James. Uh, but she, she's a bloodline James. Uh, was excellent. And you decided that the footprint of the built environment needed to be on that agricultural ground across from agriculture. Why couldn't that Correct. footprint be on the grazing land behind or adjacent to the cafeteria at the university? Thank Why you for the question, Senator. It's not in the opportunity zone. In. And so if we don't do a project in the opportunity zone, we lose we lose the opportunity for much needed funding that makes this project feasible. And how is the opportunity zone established? Uh, the opportunity zone was established uh, by the previous uh, administration. It was by the uh, MAP administration in 20 uh, in 2018. And if if you like, we can reshow well, those uh, those boundaries just no, so that no, you can no. see the. No, the boundaries. no, it's not necessary. Just bear with me, please. I'm trying to get my questions in in my time. The, the, so in that regards, why can't it be expanded to the, include that area? Uh, sir, I, that is a question that would have to be posed to the, uh, to someone at the federal, at the federal level. Um, uh, I know from experience that that process is a very, very lengthy and bureaucratic uh, uh, process. And if we were okay. to wait for that to happen, I, if it weren't I, even I feasible, it. I, I, everything that director, we're talking about it. goes away. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, so in that regards, the percentage, and you, I'm sure you gave the percentage, is it like uh, 75 or 80 percent being used for agriculture and um, uses, and then the balance is being used for the 
physical buildings. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Yeah, so set. So right now it is exactly 70, 70 percent uh, agriculture. And, and, and that is overwhelmingly farming. So I think we have, what, 18 acres of, of farming. We, uh, we expect that proportion of farming to non-farming uh, to increase as we make additional modifications to the, to, the site, uh, to the site plan. Okay, so in that regard, uh, given the scarcity and, you know, Sinclair is referred to as the Big Island, so it comes up that we have endless agricultural land, so this is not a loss to agriculture. Uh, do you anticipate that the built environment would be destructive to that agricultural land in the future that it can be reverted to agricultural land? Uh, no, sir, that's a good question. And we, we, do not, we do not believe that where, where these structures will be, will be cited. And, and I want to take a step back and emphasize something that Ms. Paul highlighted in her presentation. So by many accounts, there has been no farming on, on this site in about 50 years. But we don't believe but, that citing, let's say, the that, hotel, uh, where we are proposing to site it, would uh, would kill the potential for any uh, agriculture um, uh, in the in the future. And we are also in the midst of an environmental study. Actually, Amy Dempsey, who you spoke with earlier, who appeared before you earlier, is completing that uh, environmental study. And we expect that environmental study uh, to conclude exactly what we're what we're saying. And in fact, okay, you have so in your package, the surveys that support the first phase of her of her work. Thank you, thank you, Director. So in that regards, and I heard you mention that 50 years, like, you know, we haven't used it for 50 years, so it's justifiable that we could use it for building. I, and I don't, I don't share that premise or share that view with you that because it's been sitting for 50 years, that means it's, it's buildable for structures, I really do believe because we do have not had a re uh, aggressive agricultural program in this territory for food security, and especially in these times to justify to our farming community and in support of agriculture that that is a concern and that you have to justify uh, that this investment that we're ma making in this project is justifiable to take agricultural land for uh, the built environment necessary for the plant. So in, in that regards, in terms of long-range planning, have you had that discussion with um, all stakeholders on St. Croix in particular regarding uh, taking this, fifth, this acreage out of production, right. of potential production? Right. Right. So, uh, and Senator, thank you for that question again. I just want to just want to clarify uh, what what I was suggesting was that there could be some reason that the site has not been farmed for about 50 years, and I think it probably comes down to the location. So, you know, so the site or this portion of the site would be directly adjacent to center line, you know, road. Is that the most viable area for farming? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Um, but I think that the fact that it hasn't been farmed for 50 years, you know, probably has something to do with the with the location uh, of it. And and for the, the the last part of your question, we have uh, been very aggressive about getting out into the community and talking to both existing and emerging uh, farmers to get their perspectives. And a lot of the uh, modifications and improvements to the uh, to the farmland, I'm sorry, uh, to the to the site plan that you see, are based on input from those agricultural uh, uh, stakeholders. And and I must okay, say so that the reactions that we've gotten from most folks in the uh, in the community meetings, it's been very positive. But I'll let Miss Paul speak to that in more detail, if she needs to. Um, I, I can speak to that. Um, 
you know, we entered into the design of this project, understanding the sensitivities that the ag community has here. Growing up here, I'm, you know, somebody who cares really deeply about our environment and the land and um, being an advocate for that. So, yeah, entering into the conversations, we knew that that was, you know, one of the challenging conversations, like Senator Francis was alluding to um, when he asked about challenges that we faced. But like Peter said, it was an opportunity for us to have that education and conversation with community members, particularly farmers. Um, and with those concerns that, that you mentioned, Senator Jackson, um, you know, we found areas of um, middle ground where explaining the, 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 the benefits and opportunities in sustainable agriculture and, and agriculture innovation can provide them, um, you know, uh, address a lot of their concerns on long-term viability of an agriculture industry here. So those structures provide for opportunities for that long-term viability of mm -hmm. what we like to see as an ag industry here. Absolutely. Thank you, and thank you, thank you very much for, for your response. And then finally, uh, in that regards, the environmental uh, character of your plant, uh, of this built environment, do you think that you have adequately uh, looked at green technology and the best practices of 21st century or uh, construction and methods and new mm -hmm. technologies into this project? Yes, I think that's a great question. And the, the, answer is, the answer is yes. And we, as we evolve the site plan, because as you, as you know, with a project of this scope, you evolve the site plan until you break, you break ground. So we, we have included best practices, both into the programming of the site in terms of the type of businesses we uh, we uh, we are going to be attracting, and in terms of uh, the materials that we want to use, and and some of these are reflected, you know, in the site plan. Uh, we are most definitely drawing from best practices. So, so the answer is an unequivocal yes. And I appreciate okay, thank the question. You. And I, I I just want to thank the investors that are online for. Are uh, they um, investing into this territory, more specifically on the island of St. Croix, on this project? And I look forward to the success. And then, finally, the... the Senator the, Jackson, that's your third, finally. Okay, well, I'll come in. <laughs> All right, this is the last one. Uh, the, the agriculture across the street and this development, do you think that we send... A, a strong message of one of commitment to agriculture with this built environment across the street from agriculture that's been designated as our agricultural station. And thank you very much for your responses. And Mr. P uh, Chair, thank you for the extra time. Thank you very much, Senator Jackson. Um, Mr. Chapman, you're free to respond to the Senator my time. Yes, again, I, I believe that because of the, the comprehensiveness of the scope uh, that, we've, that we've laid out, um, uh, we are, are paying very important homage to our agricultural tradition on St. Croix, which is where, which is where I live. Um, and, and moreover, we are creating uh, a sustainable resource, a financial resource and technical assistance resource for farmers um, that uh, perhaps does not exist uh, currently in the in the ecosystem. So we think that uh, while we're always looking for ways to improve uh, this this project, uh, which is important to us, we do believe that uh, this is a uh, this is a very important project uh, for agriculture and sustainable agriculture and, and all of its stakeholders. And we think it will be a credit to the to the territory. Absolutely. Uh, very well. I again, thank you very much uh, for your presentation today. I'll allow you uh, a one-minute wrap-up at this point, uh, Mr. Chapman, and um, you know, then we'll take it from there. Great. Thank you, uh, Senator. And I want to uh, thank Senator <coughs> Francis uh, in particular for uh, for accommodating us and bending over backwards to uh, to allow us this time and to uh, and to the committee. 
So uh, Ms. Paul laid out in her uh, presentation very, very ably uh, the myriad ways that uh, Tech Village will be transformational. And I want to highlight uh, three ways in particular that we think uh, Tech Village will be a game changer, changer for the Virgin Islands and for Virgin Islanders. Uh, number one is uh, through economic diversification. Uh, so no one project uh, can provide the panacea for economic diversification, but, uh, but Tech Village, because of the caliber of companies, starting with impact traits that we uh, are going to be attracting to the site, um, it will do, uh, I think, very important things uh, in terms of uh, helping to diversify our economy. Second is through job creation, and I want to uh, really underscore the importance of job creation. We are talking about 300 permanent jobs, mostly through sustainable agriculture. We'll have, you know, maybe five or seven jobs that are property management jobs, which is which is pretty standard. But through permanent job creation and through additional jobs during the construction phase, we're looking at 400 some odd jobs, which is not insignificant given the immediate needs that we have in the territory uh, in terms of unemployment and the need for quality jobs quality jobs. And then the the third most uh, the third significant area uh, we believe is through financial support for existing and emerging uh, farmers. Uh, I am not aware um, of a project uh, like this that has been Time. intentional about harnessing um, its revenue in a way that will support uh, farmers. And so those are the three ways that uh, we think this project will be an absolute game changer for us. And so the, uh, the legislature was uh, critical in terms of shaping the, uh, the strategic focus of the RT Park. And at this juncture, we are optimistic. Uh, we are hopeful that the legislature will work uh, closely with us to help take this very important model to the next level. So I thank you, Senator. Uh, Francis and members of uh, the Committee of the Whole for giving us this forum uh, to speak with you and your constituents. Thank, uh, th you. thank you very much, Executive Director Chapman, and thank you to your team. The presentation here today on the RT Park Tech Village has been rather um, impressive and certainly will continue to deliberate uh, the information that has been presented here uh, to us today. Um, I want to thank everyone that have stayed in the paint. Um, for the last nine hours and media, thank you very much. Uh, we have had a consistent um, hearing for the last nine hours to make sure that we're doing the work of the people, um, very important measures that speak to economic development, speaks to jobs. And I thank you for all that contributed to today's um, event. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, certainly security, media, and um, archive, everyone that participated today, colleagues. Again, thank you for staying in the paint uh, for all, all of today. Uh, we do have a busy week ahead. Tomorrow we'll be in the it'll be Atley uh, Legislative Hall for the purpose of hearing um, a special session that the governor has been called regarding refinancing. And then certainly on Wednesday we'll wrap up with a regular session. So the Committee of the Whole of December 28, 2020 is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you.